Good morning. Quick sound check, um, especially for the uh, co-host. Can you hear me and can I hear you? Good morning, Carrie. This is Karen Brady, Oregon, or uh, State of Oregon. Hi, Karen. Good morning, Hello. Carrie. It's Rick Yard from Boom. Hi, Rick. Great. Sound good. Hi, Carrie. This is Nessie Smite with Boom. Nessie. Robin Elke's here. Hi, Robin. Good morning. Good Don. morning, Carrie Mike. Oh. Good morning. Hey, Carrie. Jennifer here. Hey, Jennifer. Yeah, but thank you. We don't need to go through everyone. I just wanted to generally make sure um, that it's working. I haven't been in the office for so long, so I had this fear that um, you know that my computer audio wouldn't be working right. We'll get going in just another minute here. Carrie, this is Frank. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Hi, Frank. Yep, coming in loud and clear. All right, thank you. This is Donna Schrader from Boehm. Can you hear me? Hi, Donna. Yep. Thank you. Okay, well, it's 9.01, so why don't we uh, kick this meeting off. Um, thanks everyone for joining us this morning, the first day of two days of um, discuss discussions on um, offshore wind energy off the Pacific Coast. My name is Kerry Griffin. I'm a staff officer with the Pacific Council, um, and I have uh, co-hosting and helping me on the technical side, um, Robin Elke and Kit Dahl. So today they will be um, paying attention to uh, the chat, the raised hands, and um, helping to run the meeting. We also have um, several um, co-hosts from the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We have uh, Nessie Sumite um, and Doug Boren and Frank Pendleton and Rick Yard and Ben Ruttenberg with us. Um, and um, sorry if I missed any of the um, anyone else who's a co-host with us. Uh, there's several of us um, that are going to basically be jointly running this meeting. Um, the couple other things um, I wanted to mention is that uh, many of you know that the Pacific Council has established a new 
Marine Planning Committee and uh, many, if not all, of those um, um, potential members are joining us today. It has not been formalized yet, so um, it, it's brand new. It's sort of hot off the presses, and um, the uh, council chair needs to um, um, approve all the nominees. So uh, some people have thought that this is a marine planning committee meeting. It's not. It's a meeting between BOEM and the Pacific Council. Um, but of course, our, our new MPC is uh, uh, in attendance, and uh, um, and, it's, and they will be having their first meeting after they become formalized and uh, nominees are approved and all that business. So um, I would like to go over um, a couple other round rules um, first, and then. Bear with me here. Here we go. And then I will I'll turn it over to um, Bohm uh, and Chuck Tracy, who is our executive director uh, for some opening remarks. Um, so can you guys see this um, Word document with, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, should be seen. Sorry about that. Okay, do you see a PowerPoint slide with ground rules and information? Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so this meeting is being recorded. I'm going to confirm that in a moment. Yes, it is. Um, it will be available for viewing in the future. Many people have asked about that. Um, there have been a couple of minor agenda changes. And when I put the agenda up uh, in a minute, you will see those. The only real substantive thing is that we flip flop the um, highly migratory species and the coastal pelagic species overviews uh, this afternoon. Um, so HMS is now at 2.30 and CPS is at uh, 3.30. Um, Please use the chat function for technical help and to post helpful links. Um, don't use it to carry on sidebar conversations that are of substance um, because we, uh, I don't want to miss any substantive conversation. Um, and it, um, it just kind of tends to cause a little more distraction um, than is helpful. So um, please use that just for technical help and, and providing information. Um, as I mentioned, this is a meeting between BOEM and members of the Pacific Council and its advisory bodies. It's open to the public and we will take public comment as time allows, but the priority will be given to council members, Pacific Council members and members of the advisory bodies. Uh, and then, then as time allow, allows, we'll go to public comment. Um, uh, written public comment will also be taken if you want it as part of this meeting record then you should email it to me and to Nessie Stumike at bohm.gov by the end of tomorrow. Um, but of course, BOEM will always take written comment um, and uh, the council will also, especially in relation to our council meeting. Um, but if you want it for some reason as part of this meeting record um, submitted by tomorrow night, keep yourself muted at all times. Um, my assistants will be muting people if we hear dishes clanking or um, side conversations, we will be on the lookout and mute people um, as needed, but try to keep yourself muted. Um, advisory body members for the council, or, or really anyone, if you could uh, rename yourself, um, uh, you know, go to the participants list and rename yourself by, um, or your, add your affiliation by just in parentheses, write the uh, acronym for your affiliation if you would, that will help everyone identify who's who. Um, and then if you want to um, now or at some point get a little more background, then you should look at our June briefing book materials. Um, agenda item C4 uh, contains a lot of um, uh, helpful information and links to uh, for other previous meetings and um, uh, publications, for example, the February 24th 
habitat committee meeting that um, that well, was similar to this meeting, a um, uh, little different format though, um, but uh, contains a lot of good information and that also was recorded and you can uh, view it. So. Okay, now I think um, let's turn to, oops, sorry, hold on, bear with me. Now I'd like to turn to, um, uh, Chuck Tracy, because I think he has some opening remarks for us. Thanks, Gary. Thanks uh, for the good overview. Uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody uh, to this meeting, uh, two-day meeting. Um, uh, I want to thank Bohm um, for their willingness to uh, engage in with the council, and uh, uh, it, this is a very important issue. Uh, offshore wind energy is a very important issue for the fishing industry and for the council. Uh, they've certainly um, uh, elevated the, this in terms of their uh, priority issues to, to track and to uh, be aware of and, and to make sure that the communication lines are open. And, and um, so uh, we very much appreciate Bohm's willingness to do this. I think it demonstrates on their uh, behalf, you know, a sincere interest to make sure that they've got the best information they can get to uh, to make good decisions on their uh, uh, the ocean development uh, process. And um, so, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the outreach that the, that they've engaged in and and, uh, and working with us to um, to get uh, opportunities like this to. Uh, Really dig deep into uh, into what um, effects these are having uh, these developments are having on the fishing industry, and um, so uh, with that, I, I will uh, turn it over, uh, turn it back to our host, and um, just wanted to say again, thanks very much, and, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that we've got a very great, uh, very good participation here today uh, from a lot of interest. So thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, Karen Braby, do you have uh, some opening remarks you'd like to share? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the great introduction. I, I um, uh, appreciate everything that you shared and Chuck has. Uh, I'm a, a council member for Oregon um, from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I uh, just wanted to add that, um, you know, one of the great benefits I see of this webinar today and tomorrow is that the design of the agenda is really going to allow for a lot of input. And I uh, really appreciate the, the work that BOEM has put into uh, providing input about uh, their mapping exercises and the, the process that they're uh, going through to consider offshore wind. Uh, and those meetings haven't allowed for as much time for the two-way communication that we will have today. And so both Bohm and the PFMC family felt it was important to have that two-way dialogue. And so that is what we're hoping to facilitate today. And I'm really looking forward to that discussion. So uh, fisheries voices um, really are, are the focus uh, today and uh, thanks and uh, appreciate the chance to say hello to everybody. Thank you, Karen, appreciate that. And um, now we'll turn to Nessie for some opening remarks. Great, thanks, Gary. Good morning. Um, I hope everyone is ready to roll up their sleeves and dig into some data and have meaning, meaningful conversations on offshore wind and fisheries for the next two days. Um, my name is Nessie Sumaid, and I am the Chief of the Renewable Energy Section in the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM specific office. Um, I want to first thank Chuck Tracy and Carrie Griffin and our state task force representatives and council members, um, Karen Braby and Eric Wilkins, just for continuing to work with BOEM to improve the coordination with the PFMC community. Um, and I want to thank the PFMC for hosting this event. Um, Carrie and, and Karen have been wonderful in working with us on the plans and logistics for this webinar. And we truly appreciate their time and the thoughtfulness um, to make this happen. 
So we're asking a lot of time from all of you for these two days, but our hope is that we can come closer to a mutual understanding of our plans and concerns with regards to offshore wind and fishing. Um, today, I'm joined by BOEM colleagues and other partners. You'll hear a lot from Frank Pendleton, our GIS analyst, uh, and Donna Schroeder, our marine ecologist, who is BOEM subject matter expert um, for fisheries and fishing. We also have on our call our regional supervisors, Doug Boren from the Office of Strategic Resources and Rick Yard from the Office of Environment. We're also supported by Susan Zaleski, also a marine ecologist, um, who will be shepherding the environmental analysis for our California projects. Bianca Valdez of Kearns and West is um, nice enough to help with note taking for us today. Um, I'll let Frank introduce Ben and Kaylee, who will join him in his presentation um, in a few minutes. Um, I have a slide or two in our slide presentation on what we plan to present, so I won't take the time to do that now. Um, and we'll turn it back to Carrie. Thank you, um, Nessie, I appreciate that. Um, I will put the agenda up here in just a moment, um, just to make sure that um, everyone sort of understands where we're at. Um, I went through the ground rules already. Um, so let me... Pardon me. Thank you. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties here. For some reason, my agenda is not wanting to make itself available. Okay, I'll give it one more try here. Okay, you should see the updated uh, agenda now. Um, and this is also posted to the meeting website, um, which I know a lot of you have visited. Um, uh, what we'll do, um, just as a very quick overview, we'll turn to a, um, a broad overview, a summary of BOEM's planning process, data acquisition and analysis. Uh, we'll do that next. Um, and then we're going to have uh, summaries, overviews for each of our fishery management plans, starting with Pacific Salmon at 1045. Um, and then we'll take a one hour lunch break. It's a little bit early, it's at 1145. So pay attention to that. And then we'll come back and we'll uh, do an, an overview. Uh, well, back to Salmon, we'll do the overview and then we'll have a, um, a data uh, studies and analysis presentation from BOEM on that, on the salmon fishery. And this is the same format we'll follow for each of our FMPs. Uh, so then with ground fish, we'll have the overview of the ground fish fishery. Um, that'll be from a Pacific Council member. And then we'll uh, have BOEM give uh, a presentation on the data studies and analysis related to the ground fish fishery and then open it up for discussion. And then we follow the same format for the highly migratory species and the CPS, coastal pelagic species um, fisheries. Uh, and these are highlighted in yellow because these are the changes to the agenda. We adjusted the, the, um, the timing of the ground fish fishery a little bit, um, very minor. And then we flip flop the HMS and the CPS agenda items. And then we'll wrap up um, today and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll provide a very brief summary of each of the um, discussions under each of the, um, the fishery management plans. And uh, those will be followed by uh, discussion and we will provide some um, sort of trigger questions along the way if we need to stimulate the discussion both today and tomorrow. Um, and then near the end of the day, 
we will get to ecosystem, the ecosystem fish management plan, and habitat issues. Um, some might ask why we are waiting until the end of the meeting to get to that. And the, the reason really is, is because, uh, as Karin mentioned, the purpose of this meeting is to focus on fisheries, fishing, fishing communities, uh, fishing access, that sort of thing. That's, that's the information that BOEM is really interested in uh, digging into. And so that's where the focus is. But we also, you know, we don't want to or intend to give short shrift to ecosystem and habitat issues, um, which are of course very important and, um, and you know, germane to any offshore uh, development, wind or otherwise. But we do want to have um, an opportunity to give an overview of uh, how the council is involved um, in terms of um, you know, uh, marine planning uh, related as it relates to ecosystem and habitat and then have a discussion. And then we, um, have this block of time. We um, earmarked an hour for it for uh, just open comment, open public comment. Um, we will also, if we have time during these discussions um, uh, on any of the FMPs, if we are able to get through the uh, council members and council advisory body members' questions and we still have some time, then we'll open it up to the rest of the public. Um, and uh, for everyone, use the raised hand feature, please, um, and we will call on you as needed. And um, Robin is our main um, helper today, and then Kit will be the uh, main guy tomorrow. So I'll be depending on them to watch the chat um, and the raised hands, and because I can't always see that. Um, and um, so we will we'll call on you when you raise your hand. So I think with that, um, why don't we turn it back over to uh, Bohm for your um, overview presentation. Um, and we're a few minutes ahead of schedule. Um, I will check the chat really quick to see if there's any um, technical issues. Am I coming through okay? Someone said that my, uh, uh, my sound is not very good. This is Robin, you sound fine to me. Okay, thank you. Um, so I won't worry too much about that. Uh, there's some information that's been posted in the chat with some helpful links, so thank you very much. Um, okay, then let's move on. I will turn it back over to um, Bohm and I'll stop sharing and let you share screen. Great, and I think, Frank, you're sharing our screen. <laughs> I think you're muted, Frank. I don't know if that's on purpose or not. Too many mutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes. And are you seeing the slide there? Yes, we are. Yes. All right. Well, I'll begin the, the slide presentation on, on the BOEM side and, and, and Frank and others will, will finish. So again, thanks for, for this opportunity. Um, to share some information with the PFMC community. You can advance the slides, Frank. Uh, you might want to share. So I think I introduced uh, the folks that are here. So, um, you know, uh, as, as you need information, um, feel free to, to reach out to, to any one of us. Um, next slide, Frank. So today, um, we plan to provide an overview of the leasing process, um, the status, and the next steps for offshore wind energy planning in California and Oregon. Washington is also within the Pacific region's jurisdiction, but we're not planning for offshore wind leasing there at this time. So during this the introduction section of, of the meeting today, we'll give you a high-level overview of our data acquisition and where data, gap, where data, data is housed, sorry provide preliminary analysis thus far and, and talk about uh, 
the sources of, of data that but we do have. Then during each of the fishing management plan discussions, we'll share the data that we have, the studies that we've completed or ongoing and, and talk a bit about how we will look at uh, potential interactions between offshore wind and fishing um, as we talk through those FMPs. Um, next slide, Frank. I think you can uh, continue to click on this and just show the whole slide. Great, so I think most, oops, can we go back? Yes. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with, uh, with the BOEM, Wind Energy Authorization Process. Um, it is comprised of four distinct phases, the planning and analysis, the issuance of a lease or a grant, the site assessment, and finally construction and operations. Um, some of you may recall that we started this process in California in 2017, and we are just in that first brown box on this timeline. We are in the planning and analysis phase, so there are some questions that, you know, we really can't address at this time because we don't know yet where the lease area is going to be exactly who the lessee or lessees will be and what specific project configuration will be proposed. But we'll do our best to answer questions as, as you have them. Um, I think some of the key takeaways from this slide is that there will be opportunities for public comment throughout the process, either during webinars, meetings, federal register notices, or other events that will happen during the process. Um, if an auction is held and BOEM accepts a bid, the uh, BOEM will send a bidder the lease form and the winning bidder will have about 10 days to execute that lease, to file financial assurance to guarantee compliance with all the terms and conditions of the lease and pay the total bid amount. And also within 45 days after a lessee receives the lease copies, they have to pay the first 12 months rent. Keep in mind that the lease that they will get does not grant them the, the less the, does not grant the lessee the right to construct an offshore wind facility. It only provides the lessee the ability to file plans for additional site characterization and assessment to develop their construction and operations plan for BOEM's review. And it's only after the review of the construction and operations plan and other reports, um, and also of course, the corresponding NEPA review of their plan could a wind facility move forward to the construction phase. And prior to start of any construction, the lessee must provide financial assurance to cover the decommissioning costs. Next slide, please. So in the process, you know, there are areas that we call, and I, I just wanted to kind of call them out, uh, describe what they are. You know, we have call areas. Call areas are areas um, that are that we seek public comments on and also requests for nominations of interest for development. Those are the areas that we have identified right now in, in California. Wind energy areas are areas um, typically within the call area on which environmental review will be conducted um, for lease issuance. And then finally, lease areas are identified in the um, proposed sale notices as the area that BOEM will offer for leasing during a lease sale. Next slide, Frank. So just relative to the leasing timeline, and I think you can click on all this. Um, we show where we are in Oregon and California. Um, oops, I think those, sorry. Um, well, the little bubbles don't quite, uh, didn't quite uh, come through on the end this slide and apologize for that. Um, Oregon is at the very early stage where we have the call for information and no nominations not even issued yet. Um, Morro Bay and, and Humboldt uh, already have call areas and move, we're moving towards area identification for, for Humboldt. Well, so let's go to the next slide, Frank. Advance, I think, more. Keep going there. So um, on the California front, as I said, we have call areas identified in Northern California. That's the Humboldt call area. And in the Central Coast, we had identified the Morro Bay call area in 2018. We held a task force meeting 
July 13th, in which we discussed additional areas. Those are the ones that are um, hatched on either side of the Morabe call area as areas that we are going to issue a new call because we want to um, get more specific information about those areas um, from, from um, the public and, and anyone else that's interested in, in providing if they haven't already provided a nomination for the um, Mora Bay call area in 2018. Um, next slide, please. Just for, for California, the next steps would be to identify um, the wind energy area on the North Coast. Um, and as I said, to publish a call for information on additional areas that are adjacent to the 2018 Mora Bay call area. We're hoping that uh, those two actions will um, be out soon. Um, I can't give you a specific date, um, but rest assured that please be looking out for um, the Federal Register notice for the, for the call, and then the posting of the uh, area identification for Humboldt. Uh, and if you aren't already on our um, lists, um, feel free to um, stay, get information in our website. And you can also sign up for app automatic updates on any of California, or I think even BOEM wide, by going through that link at boom.gov slash California updates. And of course, um, Jean Thurston is our um, California Renewable Energy Task Force um, coordinator, so feel free to, to reach out to her as well. Next slide, please. In Oregon, we're um, a bit earlier in the process. We are um, pursuant to the, the recommendation of the task force. We are gathering data all along the coast of Oregon. Um, and so we're, in, we're doing some engagement activities there um, and any information that um, and data that we are gathered is going into the Aura Wind Map Toolkit. In California, I think as most of you know, we're using databasing. Next slide. We have a few things happening in, in Oregon uh, in the next month or so. So um, as I said, we'll continue the data gathering and engagement process um, to inform um, future decisions. Uh, we have scheduled, I believe the notice notes to stakeholders has just gone out on a couple of data review virtual workshops on August 4th um, and August 11th. We'll do physical, human and biological data sets on, on that first day on the 4th and then move on to more fisheries related data sets um, particularly relevant for Oregon planning on the 11th. And then we're hoping that um, come fall, we would be able to um, call a, uh, a task force meeting, perhaps virtual, to just give everyone an update in terms of uh, where we are in our data gathering and engagement effort. And you know, if the timeline holds, then by winter 2021-22, uh, another task force meeting to look at where potential call areas might be. And as in California, um, we have an Oregon uh, web page that you should, you know, we try to keep that updated um, as we have information. So uh, check there frequently if you want to receive specific updates. Um, go to boom.gov Oregon updates. Um, Whitney Hauer is our Renewable Energy Task Force Coordinator for Oregon, so also reach out to her um, if you have specific um, questions. Next slide, please. So um, just a little overview of the Fish and Community Outreach and, and, and PFC, PFMC coordination. As I said earlier, um, we do appreciate the time and effort that the PFMC MC has provided for BOEM um, opportunities to at least, you know, check in before any big meetings to make sure that there isn't anything that we need to update the council as a whole. We've been doing that since about July 2020. Um, some of you may have participated in the webinar presentation um, that we held on the 24th of February, uh, followed by a quick update on, on the 5th to the council. Um, we had a, a, a couple, a few minutes at the June 29, just for a brief update um, from BOEM. And then today, um, you, the, uh, the two-day webinar to, to ho hopefully home in on more of the, the data on a detailed basis and, uh, you know, have more meaningful conversations going forward. Um, 
In previous presentations with regards to the outreach to the fishing community, in previous presentations, the PFMC community, we've shared specific fishing engagement activities that we've done in California since 2017 and Oregon last year. So a little bit about who we have engaged with. Um, I think for both states, we began with a list as part of our outreach plan that we developed with our state partners. And as we met with the various groups, and also, we also asked them for other groups that we should meet with to grow the list and make sure we engage with them. So today, um, you know, please feel free to suggest others we should meet with. And if we've not already reached out to them, we will do so. So as far as the what of these engagements, these conversations have been about informing on the status of offshore wind and requesting data to inform future decisions. Um, I think more recently, we've started to share how we have characterized some of the data sets that we do have. Um, so we'll continue to do that today and tomorrow on a more deeper level and hope to get feedback on how we can improve our data sets is the goal for these two days. Um, we have heard that there might be data that we are missing. So I'm hoping that today we can get information what other data is available and where that data might be. Finally, the how of engagement. We hope that we can have conversations in person soon, but um, for now we have to rely on virtual meetings. Um, we've also tried to have webinars in the evenings on multiple days, so I'm curious to see if that's, that's workable. Um, we have heard that we have not engaged enough, and so we hope that today we will um, hear how we can do that better. Um, and so I'm just looking forward to um, a good conversation today. Um, you know, some of it will be a little bit informal, which is good, I think, um, to just share what we know, hear about the concerns, um, and then hopefully move forward to, you know, at least reach a mutual understanding of where we both are in terms of offshore wind and, and fishing. And so with that, I believe um, Frank has the next set of slides. Yes, and with this, I just want to make sure I'm off mute and everything. You can hear me, huh? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I just want to make sure that uh, Kaylee, that she is on and she can be heard. So we'll give a second because I know these things can be confusing. But, and I'll, I'll give you a quick little um, intro on what's going to happen here next. You're going to hear from three of us. You're going to hear from um, uh, Kaylee Somers from uh, the Northwest Fishery Science Center. And she's going to talk about the observer program and their spatial data. Then you'll hear, you know, and that we're kind of viewing as this is a, a data set that's been created and vetted, and it's it's out there in the out there in the wild, and people are using it. Then you're going to hear a bit from me about the the VMS, the vessel monitoring system data, that we're 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 getting there. Uh, we've done a lot of the analysis, and now we've got uh, maps that are available. We've been t talking with folks about, and this is kind of a, a living, breathing data set. And uh, we're looking to get some some input if folks have some on that. And then on one that's um, a little earlier in the in the life cycle of creating a data set, you'll hear from uh, Ben Ruttenberg from uh, Cal Poly, who's working with some California landings data and trying to match it with VMS data and he'll tell you a bit about that and then later in the day that's when we'll actually dig in and actually see a bit more of the data sets particularly the VMS as we go through each of the uh, um, fisheries management plants all right and I'm just checking one more time um, can we hear Kaylee has she been brought up to yeah I'm here sorry it... I had excellent some... and if it works for you no worries I had probably similar issues <laughs> so if it works for you, Kaylee, are you all right with me running the slides for you? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. No. All right. Um, yeah, so if you just want to go to the next slide. So yeah, as Frank said, um, this is a pretty um, big overview, but we just wanted to, especially when we're also thinking about um, some of the other data sources. Oh, not that one. Sorry. The previous one. Yeah, um, yeah perfect. Um, uh, we just want to talk about what um, observers in um, the A shop and the WICOP, what spatial data they collect um, and how we typically analyze it when we're looking at spatial fishing patterns. 
Um, so first, this is just a picture of the logbooks that our observers keep um, in terms of the spatial information. And um, the big thing is that they record typically just two points. So where the hall began um, or where the set began and then where it ended um, in Latin long. Typically, especially in the trawl fisheries, this is recorded directly from the captain's logbook. Um, in some of the fixed gear fisheries, um, that logbook might not be available, in which case um, they would either record from the vessel GPS or potentially a handheld um, observer GPS. Uh, and you can go to the next slide now. Yeah, um, so like I said, we have kind of our two points. We draw a line between them. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry Perfect. about that. It's taken off on me. There we go. No worries. Um, and so we we draw a line between them. We know that that is, um, generally speaking, not quite accurate, that toes and sets can go um, and typically do, you know, follow ridge lines um, and other things like that and are not typically a single straight line. Um, that said, that is the best way that we have um, right now to look at effort data and also when we're looking um, at the scales that that we are typically looking at, which are typically um, pretty pretty big picture um, and also looking across a lot of different vessels. Um, this is a really helpful way to just get at the overall patterns um, of effort that we're looking at. Um, so once we draw these lines, we then um, filter out some things that we know are wrong. So if a haul appears to have occur occurred in the middle of Montana, we're guessing that's probably a little off. So we remove that. Um, if there's a way to fix that, we can. Um, you can actually go back to the previous slide. <laughs> it keeps jumping. It seems that there's a timer when we get further. Oh, so no. We'll stay here for now. Weird. That was probably something weird in my thing. Sorry about that. Um, uh, we filter anything that appears to be on land, anything that is um, totally outside of state waters and the EEZ. Um, we also filter out if there is bottom contact gear that's unreasonably deep. Um, and for the shoreside processing fleet, um, anything that is the speed would be greater than five knots. And for the at sea processed fleet, um, anything that is longer than 20 nautical miles. So we identify those if we um, can determine a way to fix them, either by going back and looking at the observer's logbook or the captain's logbook. Um, we fix them, um, but otherwise we remove them. Um, and that's usually a, a pretty minimal amount of effort, um, but that way we're able to focus in on the, the known overall trends. Okay, now please go to the next slide. All right, and if we have troubles here, I'll probably just shut things down and come back. So let's see how okay. it works. Okay, so um, yeah, just to talk uh, for a moment about then what we do with those lines. Yeah, there must be a timer in there. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know how that got in there. It was probably something I did without realizing it. Um, but this is just a figure that I find really helpful um, from ArcGIS talking about the spatial tool that we use, um, which is that we draw a bunch of grid cells, we specify the size, which can de will depend on um, the fishery that we're looking at, the type of gear. We also specify the size of a radius, and basically um, it, the tool looks at how much effort is occurring in that total radius. Um, calculates the average, and then that is the value for that cell. So we repeat that then across all the cells. Um, and we also then remove any cells that are showing effort only from, uh, from less than three vessels. So what this makes, and now you can hit my last slide there, um, is that we have these really nice maps that show us kind of overall where there are hot spots, um, where there's not that much fishing going on, um, and lots of other important information at that big picture scale. And right now, um, the big fisheries data that we have out there are on the fisheries that are under the groundfish biological opinion. So that's the federal trawl and fixed gear fleets. Um, that data is available in our fishing effort report. The newest one just came out in June um, and is up on the council website 
Um, and then the spatial layers, I don't think the newest ones are up just yet, but they will be up on the FRAM data warehouse so that people uh, can download them and look at them and compare them to other things um, and other sources. And that's about all from me for right now. Okay, well, thanks, Kaylee. Appreciate that. Yeah, and so now after you know hearing of um, the uh, Pacific Northwest Fishery Science Center data, now we'll look at the VMS analysis that uh, Bohm and the Cal Poly have been working on together. And again, this will be, we'll be talking more about the um, the, the cookbooks. How is this how is this baked, and how is it how is it coming together? And then later we'll actually look a lot more at the actual maps. So, you know, first thing the whole purpose why we're here today. You know, we're here to ask for your expertise from the variety of fishing experts we have here on the line. So, and things that we really want you to be thinking about as we go through this. Other data sets that could help us see where fishing occurs, like obviously what we just saw was an excellent example. Um, a specific concern you might have that we should try to address with our analysis. And you, you know, you'll see more about our data and that might help get you thinking about, oh wow, maybe you could look at this. Uh, if you looked at it this way. So we're definitely open to hearing that. Something about a fishery we should consider when analyzing the data. So we'll talk a little bit about the fishing speeds, like uh, when is a boat transiting and when is it fishing? You know, we set these limits for when we call it transiting or fishing. Times that boats fish, you know, some fisheries fish just at night, some just at day, you know, and other things like that where we might want to filter out certain times. Or are there big changes by year? Like our data set has a date on it. So anything we have, we know the year it was. So if there's a reason to, let's look at it before this year and after, those are things we can do. We've, we've started that in copying the, the data set that uh, Kaylee was talking about. So yes, yeah, anything like that is, is great. Or folks we could meet with, you know, as Nessie already said. And then you've heard a lot of this already from Nessie. We've had quite a bit of outreach already, we've gotten quite a bit of help from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Oregon. And uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Ben about you know, doing a matching data set with their landings data and uh, VMS. Oregon has done a lot with us for uh, talking about VMS. Yeah, that looks really good. Oh, you might want to consider this. So we've had regular meetings with them and it's it's been great. But we've also been meeting with, you know, with the council, with them, the Science Center, as well as the Pacific States folks, talking with them about what data sets they might have. And we've given some talks to fishing commissions and other fishing groups and whatnot, but always happy to talk to anyone who might help us with our with our data. Now to talk a bit about the, the VMS data, right? It's vessel monitoring system data, and it's basically a GPS for tracking fishing vessels. It's required by the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement for certain types of fishing vessels. and for us, it's we have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Right? This you'll hear the the tale of the three, the rule of three. So there must be at least three vessels in any block that we show. And because of that, I'm going to show examples using a different data set, one that's readily available called AIS. And um, the data we get that you know, again, this gives you a little bit of input, insight into the the data we have and ways we can look at it. So we have a vessel ID. We know the declaration code. We'll see more on that in a second. And then we get the, the date, you know, the, basically the date and time, the where is the boat, the lat long, and how fast is it going in what direction. And so our data set goes from 2010 to 17. Everything you're gonna see today is all of those years combined. But again, we can slice it and dice it in various ways. This gets again into who needs to have VMS. And I, I basically took it straight out of that uh, publication you see on the right, and I just made the dark things that makes it easier for my simple brain to, to envision. Right, so limited entry ground fish fishing, non ground fish trawl vessel for fishing in federal waters, and any vessel that is taking ground fish on a fishing trip you know, from federal waters. So it, it gets us to quite a few fisheries to see we can see quite a bit. There's obviously things we're missing. We're well aware of that, but there's quite a few we can see here. This is the declaration code I mentioned earlier. 
And this is the code that the, the fishers uh, call in beforehand. And you can see ways that we've lumped them. I'll leave this here for just a second, but we won't dwell on this too much. And, and this again gets to ideas. If, if you have thoughts of, on ways to analyze it, we have uh, produced maps based on each different unique uh, declaration code. But then we've also, you can see ways that we've lumped them with these color codes, things that kind of make sense, like the, and they're in the 220s, you know, that it's all midwater trawl. Down here, these are both bottom trawl. And then, you know, open access, non trawl fishing. So we've lumped them in logical ways. Um, you can see a few more down here, like we'll be looking at the, uh, the salmon trawl data further and the highly migratory. And see that we just don't have enough data for the coastal pelagics when we come to that. Now we're going to talk a bit about just the nuts and bolts of actually going from what we get to how do we get to the data set we have. And again, the, the idea here is to get you to understand this is a living, breathing data set that we can go into and get different things out of. But now you'll see how it's created and it'll give you an idea. This is a Hawaii example and it's AIS. This is on purpose. For, so folks know I'm not sharing the data I can't share. Uh, and it gives you the idea, we get sent points. We take those points and based on date and time and vessel number, we can turn them into lines. So we can follow tracks of where did the fishing vessel go. From there, we can take those tracks and overlay it on a grid. You can lay it on a variety of grids. And uh, the cases we're gonna be looking at today are on our aliquots. That's the area of BOEM leases. It's a 1.2 kilometers on a side, three quarters of a mile. So that's the size of the um, boxes we'll be looking at it. But we can lay it over the boxes and say, ask, you know, we're, we're, Kaylee was asking how many came within three kilometers of this, and we're starting to do that analysis. The one we're looking at today is how many ran over this box? You know, how many were seen in this box? And you know, then we can just take the boxes. We have a number of how many vessels went through there, and we can um, visualize it accordingly. And on, on top of that, one thing we have done here is busted out by fishing trip or fishing event. So a trip, simple enough, you leave port, you start a fishing a trip, trip. You're on that same trip till you come back to a port. A fishing event is when uh, we have cutoff speed. So when you, when you go down below the cutoff speed, we say you're going slow enough to be fishing. When you go, tend to go faster than the cutoff speed, we're saying you're probably transiting. And that's where we might get some useful input from you all today as well. And I think that might be, yeah, that's most of what I've got for you. I just want to show you one example. This example has, happens to be all fisheries that are in that AIS data. So we showed you the different uh, codes there. In this case, we took them all and brought them into one data set. And it, you know, it, here we're, we're showing Oregon. And a lot of the maps we show you today are going to look a lot like this. Where on this side, you're going to see the whole Pacific coast. And over here, you're going to see something more detailed. You're going to see Oregon. Or when we get to California, we'll zoom in on California, and then you'll see our call areas. But so this just gives you an idea. You can see the little pixelatedness of there. You know, each one of those is one of our uh, 1.2 kilometer boxes. And where you're just seeing any fishery that got busy in a place is going to start to, to light it up there. So this is just like kind of a first view to get an idea. And then, then we can get way more nuanced by getting into certain fisheries and getting into certain times and things like that. And with that, that's it for me. And we can just uh, check to see if Ben, are you, are you able to be heard? I believe I'm here. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you. All right. Okay. And then, uh, so now it's gonna be Dr. Ben Ruttenberg from, um, from Cal Poly. And he'll tell you about the analysis he's been working on with uh, California landings data and combining it with, uh, with VMS data. All right, thanks, Frank. Um, so we have um, tried to take, we've been working a bunch with the, the VMS data itself, again, as Frank described, trying to determine what fishing is and what fishing isn't based on some cutoff speed for an individual fishery. Um, we also have access to California Department of Fish and Wildlife landings data. And so what we've been trying to do is put these together to give us a little bit more detailed information, not just about where fishing activity is happening, which we can get from the VMS data, but also what 
what is being caught in these different places and you know in terms of amounts or species or value of those of those places um, and so what we've done is uh, you know as Frank described that process of identifying an individual VMS trip you know a boat leaves the port it goes out it does some things and then it comes back um, we're able to track that individual vessel in um, in both of these data sets right and so um, we find the, that trip when it when it when it um, leaves the port it starts the trip when it comes back to the port um, that's the end of that trip and very often fortunately we're able to find a fish ticket essentially a landing receipt um, for that vessel that matches that vessel ID um, for that given port and, and for that given date, right? And so then we are making the assumption then that when a, uh, a landings receipt has a vessel on it and a, and a VMS trip has that, that same vessel appeared to have shown up in that port, we are assuming that that landing receipt um, was from that vessel for that specific trip. Um, so uh, um, so that's, that's how we've been, how we've been uh, uh, putting these data sets together. And for right now, we are starting just with ground fish. Um, as Frank mentioned, uh, the VMS data is required for all of the all ground fish fishing that's happening in federal waters. And so we thought that you know, the VMS coverage would be best. So that's going to give us uh, the best coverage so far. Um, and so um, we have about uh, 100,000 landings receipts over the, the data set that we have that, that overlap. That's 2010 to 2017. Um, and um, after we match this, again, making sure that, that this match based on vessel ID, port, and date, um, we're, we're matching about 24,000 um, uh, of those landing receipts. So essentially, we're catching about 25% of the ground fish landing receipts with the VMS. Um, now, there could be several reasons for this. We think part of this may actually be that, um, that fishing that is happening only in state waters um, is not necessarily required to have VMS. And so, a landings receipt that for fishing activity that's occurring only in state waters is not going to have VMS associated with it. And so right now we're, we're actually in the process of exploring uh, the differences between, you know, what, what we're seeing land in with those, um, those trips that we were able to match versus what was not. And we think that those, um, uh, they actually may be really different types of, uh, types of uh, fishing activity that's occurring in them. If that's the case, and we think that most of that non-matched data is actually occurring in state waters, that's going to mean that 25% that, that of those landing receipts that we're able to match with VMS is probably doing a pretty good job out in federal waters. But again, we don't know that yet. Um, and so um, once we're able to match this, uh, we want to then start to distribute catch in space. And so what we need to do then is, is what we call regularized points. Uh, the VMS usually pings once an hour. Sometimes it pings more often. Sometimes it pings uh, less frequently. And so um, we are essentially interpolating those points um, to uh, essentially create a single point every hour for, for every single every single trip. Um, what that allows us to do then is determine what points are uh, based on the, the, the approach that we've taken that Frank mentioned earlier with what is fishing and what is not. We then distribute the catch for a given, um, a given landings receipt uh, for each point that, that is classified as fishing in this data. Next slide, Frank. Okay, um, and so you know, as part of the the, the CDFW landings data, um, it also comes with self-reported block data. Um, basically, the when when they uh, when vessels land catch, they are required to report a block where that where that catch was uh, uh, where that catch was obtained and where the fishing actually occurred, um, and. We've suspected that there are some potential issues with, with this self-reported block data. Um, you can see these two, these are just two examples. We have this for, uh, for essentially all the fisheries um, in these data sets, but the red lines for ground fish and dungeness crab represent the maximum depth limits for each group. Now, obviously ground fish, there's a whole range of different species, uh, many of which have very different depth ranges. But again, for si the sake of simplicity, this just shows um, the, the maximum depth limit for all ground fish. And what you can see by looking at this, you know, and again, Dungeness crab, uh, that's essentially just one species. And so um, there's uh, essentially a single depth limit for that. And what you can see is that much of the block data, that's the self-reported block data are actually outside these, um, uh, these depth limits for, for each of these different groups. 
So there's a, a substantial amount of the catch that is being reported from blocks that are uh, ostensibly too deep for that fishing to actually be occurring. And again, that ground fish, because there are so many different species, um, that map here is, is almost certainly an underestimate of how much is, is misreported. So there's definitely some issues with just using the block data itself. Um, uh, next slide, Frank. Um, and we were also able to, you know, as we are uh, moving forward with, with our analysis of these, of these matched ground fish trips, um, able to explore uh, how, uh, how they match up. Um, again, we're still in the process of making this rule of three compatible for, for the fishing activity and, and the landings in the CPUE, so we're not able to show that just yet. Um, but you can see the map on the left shows uh, the catches from correct blocks, at least the block where the, the uh, BMS track showed the vessel in that block, and that was the block that catch was reported from. Uh, the map on the right shows catch from blocks that were misreported. And as you can see, um, again, not really that surprising. This is, again, just for, just for ground fish, these data, um, that most of the sort of correctly reported blocks uh, where we have BMS tracks for an individual vessel that reported catch from that block um, track relatively close to shore, um, it generally pretty spatially contained, whereas the misreported block uh, data, that is, that is catch was reported from a block that that BMS track never went into. Um, and that includes both fishing and transit activity. Um, uh, as you can see, there's quite a, quite, quite a, uh, a bit more of, a di of spatial spread on this map on the right. Um, and so again, we, we dove into these data a little bit more. And so of that roughly 24,000 match trips for ground fish, um, less than 10,000 of them um, had uh, at least one point uh, within that reported block. That is only less than 40% of, uh, of those trips actually had even a single point inside the block where they reported, which essentially means that over 60% of, uh, of the trips um, did not have a single point from the entire trip, fishing or transit, in the block where a catch was reported, suggesting that, that, that those, those block data are really inaccurate. And when we looked at it at the individual point level where fishing was actually occurring, um, only, only about 16.5% of those points actually were in the block where that catch was reported. Again, suggesting that the block data um, are probably not that useful for for this sort of, sort of spatial analysis. Um, okay, so we've obviously got a whole bunch of additional work to do. Um, uh, the first of these is making these maps rule of three compliant so that we can, uh, that we can present them publicly. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, starting to explore this, this issue of the matched trips versus unmatched trips for ground fish. Um, we suspect that they're probably targeting different species. And if we see that the unmatched trips are primarily targeting species that are found in shallower waters and more inshore, that's going to suggest that the matched data that we have, that 25% that we're able to match, may actually be doing a really good job of capturing the fishing activity in federal waters, which by law it should, since, um, since all fishing activity for ground fish in federal waters is required to have the impact. Um, and then, you know, once we sort of work out this workflow for ground fish, which has certainly been um, very complicated. Once we get this going, we'll be able to replicate this process for um, for all of the other fisheries. And again, knowing that the covers for those other fisheries may not be as good because those fisheries are not always required to uh, have VMS as they are for ground fish. So that's where we are right now. All right. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Frank. And I, 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 I think with that, I'll stop sharing in a I believe I hand it back to, to you, Kerry. Uh, yes, if that concludes um, the overview of um, you know the process and data and all that, then uh, so I'll just pause to make sure you guys are all done. And yes. Then, okay, great. Um, then the next thing on the agenda is um, discussion. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule. What, if you don't mind, I'd like to interrupt um, very briefly. I want to make sure we get the names captured uh, correctly. So um, if you don't mind, um, 
I'm going to look at the participant list and there's a few people whose names you know are sort of incomplete um, and I'm scrolling down to see um, Albert is that uh, Al Carter yes it is ah thank you okay um i will rename you as al carter or you can if you feel so inclined um, yeah, um, please do and there's a uh, flores or flores sh i don't know who that is um can you tell me who you are please f-l-o-r-e-s-s-h I ask you to unmute. Okay, not hearing anything. There's an iPad 7. Who is iPad 7? Okay, anonymous. Um, keep going on. Melissa, which Melissa is that? Um, I got Melissa Snover. Okay. Are you able here. to re rename yourself, Melissa? I'll give it a shot. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you just hover over your name in the participants list, and there's a button that says more, you should be able to rename yourself. So if you don't mind just adding your last name, it's really, you know, just so we have, uh, so we know who was on the meeting. And, um, um, okay. You know, the okay. Thank you. Um, there's a Pixel 3, <laughs> um, so I don't know who that is. And there's a Sherry's iPad. Pixel 3 is Brian Owens from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Ah, are you able to rename yourself, Brian? Oh, um, this is Chris Potter. I just happened to know that he- Oh, uh, <laughs> that, sorry. That it him because he just sent me a, a message. Got it. It, it, did you say Brian Owens? Correct, Brian Owens, okay. California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Okay, got that. And then there's Sherry's iPad. Are you there, Sherry's iPad? It's not a spelling or record. That, oh. That's actually Tom Hafer. Ah, Tom Hafer? Yes. H A F E R? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we're getting down to some phone numbers. Okay, there's a phone number that is area code 315 and it ends in 051. Who is that? And you unmute yourself by, uh, I think it's star six. Able. Okay. Um, there's a phone number 858 area code and it ends in 159. Who is that? Hey, Carrie, it's Kristen Cook with NIMPS. Oh, hi, Kristen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will rename you. And then there's a 949 and it ends in um, 142. Who is that? And I just unmuted you. Okay, I unmuted you. Oh, I think we're. Okay, I can hear you now. Who's that? Yeah, who's that? 7142 Steve Crook. Oh, hi, Steve. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, that helps. I didn't get all the names, but um, if, um, if you're able to um, fill in uh, or let me know as we go along, that would be very helpful. I appreciate it. Um,
And so now we can move on to the, the discussion section or the discussion portion of this agenda item. Um, and so this is going to be, you know, sort of broad overview of the data sets, focus on what you just heard from our um, BOEM colleagues. Um, and then, you know, we'll have an opportunity to dive a little deeper um, into the data and studies and analyses uh, when we get into each individual fishery management plan. Um, and so what we'll do here is, um, um, well, I, I guess maybe we'll start with some questions. I've been keeping track of the questions that are coming through the chat. So why don't I start with those? Um, and then what we'll do is uh, if you uh, want to initiate discussion or you have questions you want to get to, use the raise hand feature, please. As I mentioned in the overview, we are giving priority to civic council members and advisory body members. And then as time allows, then we will um, turn to the public who is here today. We just um, want to make sure that we're able to stay generally on schedule. We're doing well so far. Um, so the first question is um, from uh, Mike Conroy. It appears that fisheries data is being used, considered as call areas, um, are in the process of being identified off of Oregon. Was there a similar effort to do this before the three call areas off California were identified? Um, this is Nessie. I'll, I will start the, the response and others in, at BOEM can chime in. So in California, at that point, we had basically landings data. We didn't have the VMS data at that point. And so I think, as we said in our call, um, from the data that we have then, it showed that fishing was occurring closer to shore. And so um, that was the reason why, you know, the call areas where is where they are. We tried to avoid um, the fishing that, the information that we have at the time in terms of where fishing was. And so call areas are, I think, about 20 miles offshore um, for the call areas. Okay, thank you, Mike Conroy. Any follow up to that? Okay. All right, Carrie. Now I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: When they establish catch areas through this process, do they look at pounds caught relative to specific areas, TPUEs, which is catch per unit effort, changes to year to year on a seasonal basis? bycatch information such as avoidance areas specific to each fishery? And that uh, question is from Michael Kaneski. So it's, uh, there's several questions in there. Yeah, so this is Ben. I think it's probably, um, I, I think that was geared at the, at the, uh, the process that I was talking about. Um, so yes, we are, we are able to look both at, at terms of landings and value or catch and value per you know, some specific area as, and then obviously we can get CPUE from that as well. Um, we certainly have the ability to look at that at, you know, sort of whatever spatial scale or uh, excuse me, well, spatial and temporal scales are, uh, are appropriate. Um, so we do have the capacity to do both of those things. Um, I don't think that we've got any data on bycatch. Um, so I don't think we're able to incorporate the bycatch because I don't think the landings data come with bycatch information. Um, so I guess yes to most of those questions and no to bycatch. Okay, thank you. Um, and Mike, if you don't have any follow-up, then uh, I'll just go on. If you do, jump in now. Carrie, this is Yvonne Duranier. I had had a question that got rolled up into this chat. Uh, yeah. Your question was next, so since you're on, why don't you go ahead? Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so the BOEMS process differs quite a bit from Fishery Management Council processes, and uh, there are some parts of it that I can't remember, and maybe others are in the same boat. If, uh, Nisi, if you wouldn't mind, would you please talk a bit about the process before the call areas? Um, I'm wondering, did the states are did the states originate the requests for um, 
looking into and designating call areas or do those requests come from private entities and then or does it go in the other direction has Boeing been directed by some law or um, executive order to investigate offshore wind resources and then does Boeing approach the states uh, with their information great thanks for the question Yvonne um, so you know Boeing is charged with facilitating facilitating access on the OCS. And we do that in conjunction, you know, to facilitate the state goals. And we, we do that in conjunction with the state. And so that's why the formation of a task force uh, at the request of the governor uh, is the one of the key mechanisms we use for engagement. For California, we did get unsolicited lease requests, both in the Central Coast and the North Coast. Um, and so, you know, in some regards that kind of directed where, where planning would, would occur. Um, Oregon took a different um, uh, pathway in that um, they wanted to be more proactive. And so we're engaging in a planning process all along the coast. Um, and then from there, you know, that, uh, gather the data and then uh, see where likely call areas would be along the coast of Oregon. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. Yes, thank you. I had another separate question if I might. Well, you have four, go ahead. Okay, so um, we, as you probably have figured out, we have a lot of fisheries that are not covered by the vessel monitoring system. And um, I also, I wanted to mention that we have some um, fisheries that are of short duration and are restrained in their locations. And um, in those fisheries that are not covered by VMS. and. I'm thinking about not just where the uh, turbines will ultimately be located, but also the process for getting stuff out to sea to start building or, you know, to put the Lego pieces together. And, uh, you know, there are some fisheries that are only a few days long and um, you could completely ruin a fisherman's year or have zero effect by um, either by doing the work on or off of those particular days that the fisheries are open. So I just um, wanted to throw that out there. And as we're going along, maybe um, folks could think about not just where the turbines are located, but also the process for, um, for building offshore equipment. Thank you for that. And I guess to the extent that um, and I don't know, throw it to Frank to see if we have any data to inform that kind of thinking. I mean, the short-term duration fishing activities, how do we capture that in our data sets? Because we can certainly see, you know, we, we in the future we'll know where um, land, where you, you, the transit to and from the, the, the turbine location, but I was just wondering if we actually have where fishing occurs data. You might not. Well, okay, and just to, to talk to, and that those are the types of things that, uh, like if we can get specific comments on that, like it's this fishery that we're worried about in this area and it only fish at this time. If it's something that's in our VMS, it's something we can look at. But also if you know of other data sets that, um, that could help us understand that fishery, though that as well is the, the type of stuff we're looking for here. But in, any input you can give us to to start looking for that would be would be great. So Yvonne, just kind of following up on that, is there a like a um and I'm sorry, I'm just like action oriented. Is there a a, a way to then how do we get that data? Do you have that data? Um, it, so we, we, it would require digging in for each of our different fisheries. And I would say that one place to start would be with the federal list of fisheries. So these are all the federal and state managed fisheries that occur in federal waters. They're um, less likely to have full coverage for state waters fisheries, particularly for our large embayments like San Francisco and Bay and Puget Sound. But um, but you could at least start there and know what you're not covering and then sort of work your way through from there. Okay. 
Thank you. We, we may have follow up with you later as we do the digging. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, someone asked if there will be a summary of this meeting. Um, the council is not planning to produce a written summary specifically of this meeting, but um, I think Bohm uh, may have maybe considering that. So, Nessie, do you want to address that? Yeah, I think we will, and um, you know, we'll either post it. We'll we'll figure out between the PFMC and us where to post it. I think we're we're taking some summary notes. So. Thank you. Um, and yeah, um, at the beginning, um, Nessie mentioned Kearns and West, who has, um, is uh, helping at this meeting. They're taking notes and they're going to um, help uh, provide the notes and information um, for our summaries tomorrow. Um, and um, of course, for any meeting uh, outcomes. So, and I think we'll probably touch on this topic you know, as we move through the meeting. Um, since this is an ongoing uh, initiative and we'll be revisiting um, you know, the meetings, the meeting summaries, the uh, data and information. And as I mentioned, you know, we have the new Marine Planning Committee, which uh, has not had its first meeting yet, but uh, their first task will be to review uh, the notes and summary and recording of this meeting and, um, and uh, you know, then report back to the full council um, on what they, you know, their observations and their recommendations, that sort of thing. Um, there's one more question. There may have been some more in the chat, but um, of the ones that I pulled out, um, this one is when they establish catch areas through this process, do they look at pounds caught relative? Oh. Um, yeah, no, you already, we already answered that question. Sorry. Uh, I think it came through twice in the chat, Mike. So we already addressed that one. Let's see. Um, taking a quick look. Uh, there's a question about whether the Council Scientific and Statistical Committee will review Cal Poly's methodology and analysis of VMF data, given the numerous uh, caveats with fishery data. Um, that's uh, above my pay grade, but I think it's uh, something that's you know worth asking and considering. So you know I'd have to follow up with um, you know with other council staff and the SSC um, and my boss Chuck also who's on the call um, to see if that's something that we should or would want to do. We do ask the SSC sometimes to review. Um, data and products, that's pretty much their main function. Um, but you know, I can't say yay or nay at this point. Uh, here is a question from Ken Bates. Um, HFMA, um, which I think is the Humboldt Fisherman Marketing Association, perhaps. Um, someone can correct me. Um, HF HFMA has taken on a mapping project via an OPC grant to generically map Northern California fishing grounds for species and gear types to correct the existing data gap. So that's a comment rather than a question. Thank you, Ken. Hey, Carrie, this is Robin. Uh, you do have a bunch of hands up as well, and I don't know uh, if you want to address those as we are um, approaching to 1030. Yeah, we are. Um, so that finishes the questions that we had in the chat. Um, I wasn't really intended to, um, you know, keep the questions in the chat. So I guess I'd ask, you know, if, if, if just it's better to ask those verbally um, in general. But um, I don't know. We'll have to sort of play it by ear. But we're done with uh, those questions. So yeah, let's go to the hand raised. And um, Robin, do you have a sense of the order in which we should go? Or should we just go top to bottom? Um, I think we can just go top to bottom. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, and we uh, we are scheduled to take um, a break at 1030. We might uh, want to eat into that time a little bit, but uh, not too much. So Mike Conroy, your hand is up. Thanks, Carrie. You can hear me? Yep, I can hear you. 
Perfect. Um, thanks again for everybody for uh, what they've said thus far. There was a question in the chat about posting the slides. I would highly encourage that. There's a lot of detail contained in the slides that didn't come through um, that I think we would all benefit from. Uh, to answer one of the a question that has been kind of danced around quite a bit this morning, you know, the most complete data set that you will have is the knowledge of the fleets. You know, you're, you're not going to find that in AI, NAIS data. You're not going to find that in VMS. You've got to take the time to outreach to the fleets and, and ask them what areas are important to them. I think that's been a missing component thus far. You know, reliance on VMS and AIS paints such an incomplete picture. Uh, as we noted, not every fleet is required to have VMS and AIS is re only required on vessels 65 feet or larger. Uh, my question is, when looking at the potential call areas, are you also looking at the waters adjacent to the call areas where supporting infrastructure will necessarily impact, potentially impact other fisheries? You know, for example, the fixed or floating substations, transmission lines, et cetera. And that's, that's my question, thanks. I think that um, we we ask for in, in our calls for information in and around the call area. So certainly, um, you know, those call the polygons provided there. But um, if there are other information that you think is relevant, I think we we ask for for those information in, in the calls as well. And if I can add to that, this is Rick Yard from uh, the Office of Environment with BOEM. Um, you know, we. We do have, as you've heard several times, the, the phased process. So uh, we have two stages of NEPA review. Um, the, the lease sale NEPA review will be for a lease area. Everything that happens within BOEM's jurisdiction will be within that lease area or, or right-of-way area that will all be studied. And then when we get to the COP stage, when we're actually looking at that infrastructure that you're talking about, Mike, uh, again, everything that's within BOEM's jurisdiction will be within um, those study areas for our NEPA analysis. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, thank you. Next up, Steve Scheiblauer. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a uh, quick question, and maybe it's the million dollar question. How will BOEM use these? reports or data data sets and what have you I mean will they actually cause BOEM to uh, modify lease areas or wind energy areas thank you Rick do you want to start the response yes sorry I for some reason I couldn't get my mute to turn off that time uh, apologies for that um, you know, this, uh, I know this is a point of interest. It's, it's come up in question form a couple times in our meetings and my, my best answer, I, I hope it's helpful is that, um, you know, we, we do have decision makers and that's normally in our department of interior, but some of those are delegated down to the region and all of the information that we gather in addition to helping the public understand what we're doing is to inform that decision maker. And ultimately they make a judgment and it's, there's not going to be a lot of bright lines. Um, it's going to be their best try at reaching the, the standards we have about balancing the many uses of the FCS. So they are going to consider all that information we gather. And um, they're going to have to decide whether or not in each stage, at the least stage, whether the, the lease areas are, you know, how they are modified to accommodate um, uses and, and physical characteristics of the site. And again, at the COP stage about uh, what kind of microsiding and, and so forth needs to happen in response to all the information we provide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's no follow-up. Let's move on to Lynn Mattis. Go ahead, Lynn. Hey, thanks. Um, my comment question was sort of in follow up to what Yvonne had, had spoken about uh, with fisheries that don't have VMS. Um, we also have some fisheries that we're involved in that don't have their own FMPs at the moment, um, thinking specifically the Pacific halibut fishery. Um, 
that that is a small pulse fishery that ha can be a big component of certain people's portfolio for the year. It occurs three days every other week for a couple of weeks. Um, but being able to, and you know, doesn't have really have observer coverage, doesn't have the same VMS coverage. So just need to be cognizant of those types of fisheries and how do we get, make sure that those are incorporated as well. Uh, it was more of a comment than a question. Yeah, um, maybe that's more of a question for um, council or equally. Um, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, Robin, <laughs> usually uh, on the council side, we have the salmon staff officer handle the halibut fishery. Uh, at, um, yeah, uh, but but not necessarily. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that means to. Boom. So, um, you know, maybe Robin and I can sort of talk offline and get our heads around it. But uh, yeah, yeah, Carrie, this is this is Robin. I I hear uh, you know Lynn and Yvonne. I hear their point. I know that they're talking likely about the directed halibut fishery. Um, it is exactly as Lynn described, and I think the point would be, you know, BOEM is looking for information on fisheries, and so certainly those fishermen that are participating in those, in that fishery uh, will want to communicate with BOEM on that, and then we'll just um, make sure that we communicate um, as, you know, council staff with BOEM so that they can uh, understand uh, the structure of that fishery as well. Thanks, and you know, I'll, I'll just add that it may be the, a good time to revisit some of these questions and maybe some have some more discussion as our fishery specific um, talks later today. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, that is a really good point, really good question. And that is ex exactly why we're here today because we do wanna treat this as a deeper dive and figure out where the data gaps are and what we're missing. And so, uh, um, Lenny brought up an excellent point. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's why we're here today. Okay, next, Susan Chambers. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I had two questions for Ben. Um, about the Cal Poly data. <clears throat> I may have missed it, but I was wondering who determined the red line for the maximum depth, depth of the ground fish and crab fisheries. And also when you're merging the VMS and landings, uh, you talked about um, species differentiation, but did you do any looks at ground fish, particularly uh, by gear type? You know, we have trawl, we have longline, we have some pot fisheries that may be more helpful um, rather than species. Yeah, um, good questions. So we, for the depth limits, the, um, our analysis of the landings data, we, we followed, uh, basically followed the procedure that Becky Miller used in a paper that they published in Canadian Journal in 2017, I think, and so we just use the the same the same species groupings and the same depth limits that, that they use for that for that for for that paper. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what those limits were, but we have we have them. So, um, and then the second question was about gear type. Is that right? Sorry. Yes. I'm yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, we obviously have, we have gear type. Um, we have the, the VMS declaration code, which generally maps pretty well on, for, the, for those we're able to match, generally maps pretty well onto the gear type reported in the, um, in the landings receipts. Um, we know that sometimes the landing receipts, that information is not always that accurate. We also know sometimes the VMS isn't that accurate either, but we know that the VMS is generally required. They are required to have the correct declaration, and so we sort of when they when they disagreed, we tended to, to default to um, the gear uh, that was in the declaration code from the VMS. Um, and so again, what, like 
we can we 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 have been able to break this down by declaration code and by gear type, um, and so I guess I'm still not entirely sure what the question is. If it's related to the gear that's unmatched, obviously we don't have VMS with that at all. Um, and so yeah, if that's the question, we can certainly look at the, the, the reported gear type from the landings receipts to see um, see how well that how well that matches up. Does that answer your question? Yep, that did. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. Okay, um, we are uh, three minutes into the break. Carrie Pomeroy, I see your hand up. Um, we're I'm going to ask you to uh, hold your question. Um, where you no problem. End up with extra time um, under this agenda item to get to um, public comment, but um, we should be able to find some time at some point. So I apologize, but um, in the interest of making sure everyone gets a break, let's go ahead and take our 1030 break and then um, plan to be back here. We're going to cut it a little bit short. Uh, it'll be a 12 minute break. So come back at 1045 a.m. And uh, we will start with an overview of the Pacific salmon fishery. So see you at 1045.
One minute warning, folks. We'll give it one more minute. Okay, well, let's get going again here. Um, okay, just checking the chat. So um, it is 1045. So the um, first FMP on the agenda for today is the Pacific Salmon. We have one hour uh, scheduled for this agenda item, and we're going to start with a, an overview of the salmon fishery. This is a very broad brush overview. You know, what gear, where does it happen, uh, who is involved, that kind of thing. And Robin Elke on our staff uh, will be giving that overview. So, Robin, if you're ready, um, why don't you go right ahead? Okay, thanks, Carrie. I will bring up my very brief uh, PowerPoint there. Let me see if I can get full screen. Okay. You all can hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so this is um, just a brief overview, like Carrie said, of the council area ocean salmon fisheries. Uh, we have uh, three different um, types of fisheries, if you will. We do have uh, tribal commercial fisheries, and they also have ceremonial and subsistence fisheries. In addition, we have non-tribal commercial fisheries and recreational fisheries. Uh, the time when those fisheries occur for the most part is May through September. Um, that is not necessarily a 24 seven time frame, but um, usually uh, days or weeks at a time. There are a few fisheries that do occur earlier in the season, um, starting in mid March or um, April. And then we do have some uh, smaller fisheries uh, that do occur um, into October and perhaps uh, the very early part of November. So the salmon fisheries do, um, you know, occur not necessarily year round, but uh, for a good portion of the year um, at different time intervals. Um, the area that these fisheries take place um, pretty much encompass the um, entire Pacific West Coast. Um, we do have uh, major management boundaries uh, for salmon that are commonly known uh, within the industry and have been used for uh, many years. Um, and there's also conservation areas that are um, closures um, either year round or during certain parts of the year to um, protect uh, salmon and other species perhaps. The gear that these fisheries use, um, the commercial fishery is a troll fishery and the recreational is hook and line. So um, essentially hook and line fisheries for uh, the salmon fisheries. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, the st there are multiple stocks of salmon uh, congregating together in the ocean when we fish. A, a lot of them are uh, ESA listed. Uh, we do manage all the natural stocks with uh, conservation goals. Um, for the most part, the fisheries focus on Chinook and Coho. 
Um, there are some pink salmon fisheries that occur uh, mainly in Washington and um, those would occur on the uh, odd years that pink salmon are in abundance. I'll just see if there is a chat. All right, maybe I shouldn't do that in the middle of my presentation, but okay. Um, this is a very detailed map. Um, I know it's kind of hard to see, but just to give you an idea of what the West Coast uh, looks like in, in the sense of the uh, major management areas and conservation goal or areas and um, some area closures, um, I don't think anybody would be surprised um, to see that it is a fairly complicated map, but um, up on the very top section, um, it's designated between uh, Cape Falcon, that is one of our major uh, salmon management boundaries. We typically say north of Falcon or south of Falcon, and it is this line that is uh, in Oregon. It is just um, shy or south of the Oregon and Washington border. Um, just focusing on Washington and moving down, this uh, red box here on the top is detailed here. And these hash mark areas are, are the tribal fishing areas. Uh, there are also some yellow boxes that you'll probably barely see, but they're there. And those are some of our conservation zones where we have uh, closed areas year round or during certain types of the year. Moving south um, in Oregon, from uh, Cape Falcon all the way down to Humbug, there's a um, uh, one uh, conservation area here that's outlined. And in Southern Oregon and Northern California, we have what we call the Klamath Management Zone. Um, it does encompass both sides of the Oregon-California border. Um, we call it the KMZ, but it's essentially from uh, Humbug to um, what was Horse Mountain, but we've moved that boundary uh, just a little bit. It's at 4010 instead of the 4005 line. But this orange area here you'll see uh, for the commercial fisheries, this is a uh, no fishing area for the commercial salmon fisheries. So this zone uh, has been closed um, for quite some time for commercial fishing. fishing. And then just moving south uh, into California, we have three major management areas, Fort Bragg, San Francisco and Monterey areas. So that's again, um, a very detailed map of the commercial and tribal areas that just um, tries to give you a, a general idea of um, the type of management and conservation areas we have as we conduct our fisheries. As part of this conversation, I know that we've been focused on fisheries and the fishing communities. And I just thought it might be helpful to include some information on, I don't know, I guess what the magnitude of the uh, fisheries are. I uh, went to our um, SAFE document uh, that had the, the 2019 review of the fisheries. I, I kind of skipped over um, 2020. Uh, just because of the COVID and our fisheries were shaped a little bit differently and affected by that. So I just grabbed some 2019 statistics and just thought I would share them a bit uh, just so that everyone can have, you know, perhaps a little bit of an understanding of the magnitude of the salmon fisheries and how they um, contribute to those um, fishing communities along the coast. Um, so we do have our tribal uh, fisheries. These are uh, mainly the tribes in Washington state. Uh, they harvested 75,000 uh, salmon in 2019 and the X vessel, X vessel value of that was 1.4 million. For our non-tribal uh, commercial fisheries, these are for vessels that actually had salmon landing. So our successful fishermen, I broke it out by state. Um, 
for Washington, Oregon, and California. But uh, so these were participating vessels that landed salmon. So that can give you an idea of uh, how many fishermen uh, may be out there in a given year. And for the recreational sector, this does include both private and charter fishermen. And um, I broke it out by state and tallied up the individual uh, salmon angler trips. And so there might be one boat, but that boat um, might hold you know, five people or that boat may go out once or twice a day. Um, but nonetheless, you can um, see the popularity of these uh, fisheries and get an understanding of um, how often um, you'll have uh, salmon fishermen out on the ocean. And for the economic impact, you know, again, that is also um, important to the fishing communities and uh, really, you know, the reason the fishermen are here to give their input, this is their um, livelihood. And in our uh, SAFE document, we do report on the economics. And in 2017, uh, the ocean salmon fisheries uh, were estimated to have a $71.7 million economic impact uh, for just the non-Indian fisheries, the commercial and the recreational. And so again, that's just uh, kind of here to um, help you, you know, gauge the magnitude of the ocean salmon fisheries. And my last slide is again, just a map of the West Coast. It is simplified um, from the uh, first map I showed you, but it does um, just outline where some of our boundaries are and where some of the major ports are um, that are important for ocean salmon fishing. And that is um, my overview, Carrie. Thanks, Robin. Um, I appreciate it. Let's do um, any points of clarification on Robin's presentation. Let's not get into, um, you know, the deep dive stuff, but uh, if there's something um, that you didn't quite understand and you need clarification, we could take that right now before we move on. And use the raise hand if you have a clarifying question for Robin. And I'm not seeing any. Okay, thanks a lot, Robin. <clears throat> uh, so next up, we have um, Frank Pendleton and Donna Schrader. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> and Frank, you should be able to share your screen now. Let me know if you have any trouble. Okay, let me give it a shot here. Okay, I can hear you. First step. That's good, and it's looking like it's going to let me share. Okay, there we go. Okay, great. And oh, we went to the beginning. I pressed the wrong button. Excuse me, folks. Sorry for the show here. All right, so I don't have much for you here on salmon. Now I'll just go to, it's because you know, I'm a, it's all about the, the VMS data here. So, but I'm gonna show you throughout the day, a lot of these maps are gonna look similar. I think I mentioned that early, that over on the, the left side, you're gonna see a bigger overview. When it's Oregon, you're gonna see the whole West Coast. When it's California, you're just gonna see California. On this side, you know, in this case, you see the Oregon uh, planning area. And when it's California, you'll see the call area. So I've just got the two for salmon here. And you know, this will be a place when we get into the discussion where it could be useful. If folks know, you know, what you can tell us about uh, how deep you think uh, VMS is into the salmon industry. It's not something they have to have, but it's it's clearly one we get a quite uh, a lot of pings. So we're looking for any info we can get on that. So here is Oregon. And then I'm just going to go to California and we'll come back again and then I'll be done. And in this case, just to uh, mention one thing that's worth um, folks knowing. So each time you're going to see the, uh, the legend here, 
And depending on how busy the fishery is, I've, I've got a few different legends. It tends to be I busted up in 20s or 50s. So this is one of the busier ones. So it gets busted up in 50s. And uh, it'll tell you what it is up here as well here. And then all of these are going to be 2010 through 2017. So I'm going to go back again to Oregon for a second. Then we'll just come back to California. And then I'm going to uh, see the rest of my time to Don here. All right, and just a quick last check in California. And with, with that, um, I'm done with this, and I'll leave it to see if uh, or Donna to give a shot to share her screen, make sure that's working. Okay, Donna, um, oh, I think you just unmuted yourself. Good. All right, I'm trying to share the screen and it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, try again. There we go. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, we can see it. Great. All right. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is Donna Schrader and I work in the Pacific region of BOEM and I am the primary subject matter expert for now and my area of expertise is fishes in general, including essential fish habitat consultations and also for recreational and commercial fisheries. And uh, I have had the pleasure of meeting many of you in the past and I look forward to uh, working with you more into in the future. Okay, so I thought um, I'm going to go through a lot of information each time we discuss a different fishery and a lot of it's going to be the same because I was unclear um, if people might be coming in or out. I think it's worthwhile just to kind of go over what our basic process is um, in how we do impact assessment and how we design studies. So you see here a very simplified slide of something that Nessie had presented earlier, and that is just showing the different life cycle stages that we have for an offshore energy project. Planning, site assessment, construction, operations, and decommissioning or repowering, depending on the situation. And so the point of this slide is that we have different goals and different types of studies according to what phase of the life cycle that we're in. And then also I want to point out that there are three major types of points where we do in, uh, a formal environmental assessment under the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. And the first one that is coming up is for lease issuance and site characterization activities. And so when we issue a lease, that's basically an administrative process where we have a piece of paper um, that we provide to um, a winning um, uh, a bit, a winning bid, one or more. And then also after that, to characterize the site, uh, that basically involves research activities, you know, core grabs, oceanographic sampling, uh, maybe an oceanographic or, or meteorological buoy uh, placed on the lease. And so that's what's coming up. The big assessment point comes under the second part when we analyze a construction and operations plan. Now, a lease does not guarantee that um, any construction or operations will follow. So we have a distinct phase of when that occurs and when we do analysis. And what the point is of doing a lot of outreach is to be able to um, really characterize what potential impacts might occur to fish or fisheries uh, for the COP. And so a lot of the discussion we have now will feed into our future analysis uh, for the COP, but also be useful for um, the lease issuance and site characterization activities. Uh, decommissioning should uh, an operation occur, decommissioning would occur uh, many, many years down the line, and so we're not going to discuss that further today. 
Okay, I just want to point out so, a couple of differences between the East and West Coast in regard to offshore wind. On the West Coast, you know, we have a very narrow continental shelf. And so we have a, a much deeper depths and there's a gradient in offshore activities, not just fishing, uh, that's highly dependent upon depth. I'll discuss that more in a second. Uh, because of this depth, we will we foresee only floating offshore wind turbines um, that will be used. And so a big difference is that we aren't going to have any pile driving noise impacts on the West Coast because they will not be bottom founded um, turbines. So uh, also there's probably going to be uh, many fewer offshore wind leases on the West Coast compared to the East Coast. And for example, uh, I wanted to point out to an existing kind of overview that Frank did back in the day and uh, that's on our website. And in there we have only, we've determined that there's only about 6% of federal waters that are offshore California that are technically feasible. And so um, I think this is important because sometimes we get a lot of stakeholders wondering, are there going to be you know, offshore wind leases everywhere? So uh, technically capable and um, capable for regulations. That is, you know, we don't put wind farms in national marine sanctuaries. Okay, uh, on the East Coast, I mean, on the West Coast, we also have a lot of lessons we can learn from our conventional energy program, which has had a lot of, shore, a lot of offshore uh, infrastructure. We both ha we have wind and wave energy on the West Coast. And uh, we're doing this process with the um, NOAA's offshore aquaculture, aquaculture opportunity areas. And so we envision there's gonna be some synergies uh, between the two processes. Okay, I'm gonna go through a lot of information, but I just wanna say we started looking at and summarizing information back in 2007. And a lot of these reports are on the web, but we've been gathering information for a long time. Uh, and it continues today. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Ruttenberg and his lab and uh, a recent paper that they published uh, that reviews the potential uh, impact factors and effects from offshore wind. Okay, one thing that we did early on that was pretty important is that we had a science conference that looked at both wave and wind, wave and wind energy back in 2012. And that was really important in kind of guiding and identifying what gaps and where should we should direct future um, studies. And I'm going to mention some of these in this presentation. Okay, and we've also had others. We had a, a seminar off California, and uh, it's not just Bone, but a lot of other people have been synthesizing information that's been useful in this process. Okay, so this is about salmon. So I'm gonna skip over, um, this is about groundfish, but we've been doing a lot of work on seafloor mapping um, related to fill in those uh, information gaps. Now I want you to say, uh, uh, point out a difference between what we call effects and impacts. Effects means that something happened. There is a causal um, cause and effect uh, action that happened here. Impacts are what we seek to use when we have a NEPA document, and that is putting, you know, context into the effect. So we really want to describe the intensity of it, give the spatial extent of it, and the duration of short or long time scales. And so our outreach and discussion with you hopes to, we know that there's going to be effects from offshore wind to fishing communities, and we're trying to get as best detail so we can describe the impacts. Okay, so for um, the, we have identified that electrical magnetic fields or EMFs and the artificial reef or fat effect is going to be important um, in this process. So I'm gonna review some of those. We've uh, funded over seven studies specifically on EMF. Uh, one of the early ones was to look at all the species that we have in our waters and to describe their sensitivity um, to electric, electric or magnetic fields. And uh, this will include all the species um, if they are sensitive in each of the fishery management plans as well as invertebrates. Okay, so for the salmon, I want to uh, call out this one. So everyone knows that salmon are sensitive to magnetic fields because that's how they use it to orientate and find their natal streams. So one thing that we did is we looked at this existing cable um, in the San Francisco Bay. It's called the Transbay Cable. It's a 400 megawatt high voltage DC cable. And we were very fortunate that there, were, there was a tracking telemetry data before and after this cable was energized. 
and we found that um, there were negligible impacts to these species uh, for both green sturgeon and Chinook salmon. Um, there were some effects that we detected, that is, salmon appeared to cross the cable fa faster when it was energized, but overall there was no, uh, there's no impact that was detectable. And here are a couple of papers that were published as a result of that study. And uh, people from UC Davis found out that uh, this very powerful cable did not prevent migration of Chinook salmon um, into their natal waters. One surprising thing uh, that was published that came out of the study is that the EMF signature from the cable, fairly powerful cable, 400 megawatts, was minor to the very large cable, um, excuse me, EMF signature that was uh, presented by the bridge. And so neither of these uh, signatures had any effect on migratory behavior that was at an impact level. Okay, so then we had another study that was ground fish, but I'm gonna skip over that at this point. And then I want to talk about artificial reef and fat effects. And basically, for both offshore wind and um, wind energy, there'll be a lot of structure in the water should a project go forward. And that will cause habitat changes. And also, because of the structure, there's probably going to be a lot of de facto marine protected areas um, for the species. That is, that a lot of fishing will be excluded, and that will have indirect effects on uh, habitat. So this is where our experience from offshore oil and gas uh, platforms comes to play. We have funded millions and millions of dollars on looking at the effect of offshore structure on the environment. And a lot of that's is summarized and it's available on our website. And we found uh, a lot of effects on ground fish, but I'm gonna skip those right now because we're gonna talk about um, just salmon. And we found that there's some, uh, we did some work for uh, migratory species. But we didn't find um, that the offshore structure is going to influence specific salmon very much. Okay, so I just want to call out that we've had other studies done on noise on energy absorption that are available. And then as far as monitoring, uh, BOEM has recently established a center for marine acoustics, which will be very important in understanding and mitigating for any noise impacts that any of our permitted uh, activities will, um, will have. Okay, so we talk about fisheries a little bit. So what's really important is to understand what kinds of impacts might happen. Uh, here's a specific list that we've come up with. We're not the only ones that have done that. Uh, here's actually a very nice paper that was recently published that listed all the potential um, factors that might be affected should a offshore wind project go forward. And we use this as a guide to try to understand and describe and collect data so that we can address and understand what these impacts might be. Okay, so I want to show you some analysis of a port landing data that we've had. This is just an example of Morro Bay and how we sort of use this data to guide future activities and how we want to get more information. So this is not the end all, but this is just a guide of what we've done. This is all publicly available information and I've had extensive area um, citations on the right there of where we've collected that information. So we looked at, at the Morro Bay Port Complex. And so this is in relation to the Morro Bay Call area. And we looked at what was important in the last 10 years as far as landing and uh, the value of those species and uh, whether or not a, the potential fishing grounds are overlapped with the Call area. And we see for Morro Bay and Morro Bay Harbor, uh, Chinook salmon is the only species in um, the uh, Pacific Salmon Fishery Management Plan uh, that could potentially be affected and that some of the fishing um, does overlap with the call area. And we see in Port San Luis the same thing. We have Chinook salmon that could be potentially affected. And so how we use this as a guideline is then we look at the type of gear that's used to uh, capture these species. So mainly it's troll. And so one thing that we gather from this is that we need to understand better if trolling could be feasible within an offshore wind farm. And that is something that we can interface and act with the stakeholders and the council to find out if that's feasible. So this is kind of a way that we use this kind of information because ultimately we wanna use this information to inform um, the potential impacts for our construction and operations phase of, of a project. 
Okay, so I'm gonna skip um, over these other species. I'm gonna call out this is like, what do we do if we don't have any good offshore information of where fishing occurs? I just wanna say the alternative that we can do is to use the species distribution models. Where does the targeted species actually occur offshore? And that is not ideal, but it's one way to get information because that would be a potential fishing ground. Even if no fishing occurs there, we would want to know if there was potential. And that's the kind of way that we, we approach if we have no good offshore distribution data on where fishing actually occurs. Okay, so uh, some of the things that we've sort of gathered uh, right now is that uh, the Morro Bay Harbor, for example, has greater potential for impacts than Port San Luis. Dutchess crab fishing grounds do not overlap with the call area because it's so deep. Um, the Morro Bay call area begins over at 800 meters. And so we've avoided a lot of fishing impacts just by the spatial positioning. It seems that the Pacific ground fish fishery um, has the most overlap and uh, it doesn't appear that there's much overlap with the coastal pelagics. Now we do have, we, we have prior needs is just getting better information on the offshore distribution of fishing activities. And we would like to understand better uh, specifically for Pacific salmon on whether or not um, an offshore wind farm would negatively affect the ability for fishers to troll within the wind farm because it's not exactly clear if that uh, complete exclusion of fishing activity would occur. Okay, so uh, there's lots of information that we need and that's why we're coming to you because we specifically would like information to help us clearly elucidate to the decision makers the type and the extent of the impact from a wind farm to the fishing activities. And here's some information that you could help us out with. And also one thing I'd like to call out to this group is we're kind of, we're very interested in trying to understand the use of the call areas by non-local fishers. And we know in the Pacific salmon fisheries that trollers will go up and down the coast quite a lot during the season. And if you could provide us information on how we may determine that, that would be wonderful. Then uh, I haven't mentioned recreational fishing, but I will, um, that's because we haven't determined at this point though that there would be a lot of impact towards fishing and I'm pointing to the um, uh, Block Island Wind Farm that's been in place off Rhode Island. And what they have determined actually is that because fishing has not been specifically excluded, that rec fishing, because hook and line would be possible within a wind farm, that uh, there hasn't been any impact rec fishing, and that in some cases, due to the artificial reef effect, it's been enhanced. And that also they found that uh, it's actually opened up a whole new tourism industry that people will pay. Uh, boats just to go out and see the wind farm. And that might open up a whole new business opportunity for some of the um, uh, wreck fishing vessels that could also double as tourist vessels. And so we don't know if that will happen on the West Coast, but we just want to recognize that that's a potential opportunity. Okay, I'm going to go through some um, other studies that we funded that uh, you can research um, further, or I can talk about further if you want. Some space use conflict studies, uh, identification of potential mitigation measures to these conflicts. We've done some participatory mapping. Uh, we've looked at some socioeconomic impacts that's on the East Coast, but many of those would also be uh, relevant to the West Coast. We've looked at a whole bunch of information from all sorts of our uh, external stakeholders and partners. So I just want to call that out. And then another thing I want to call, we are updating uh, information on the other spatial closures that fisheries have um, experienced for both recreational and commercial fisheries. And we want to do this according to fishing sector and gear, because what is important is to understand what the cumulative impact would be to uh, fisheries exclusion, not just from a potential offshore renewable energy installation, but from all sources. And so um, what I would like to point out, like this would also include, you know, these bycatch areas that many fishermen would avoid, um, which act as a de facto closures. So we are interested in hearing about all this information so we can do a proper analysis. 
The other thing that often doesn't get mentioned is that there's likely going to be impacts on port infrastructure. And so we've produced a couple of studies so far that describes changes to ports that might happen from offshore development, renewable energy development, but we need to do further and in how this may interface with the fisheries uh, communities. And so we would build upon and expand existing information that has been on, uh, done on these uh, fishing communities. And this is where we think the council stakeholders could be um, very useful and provide information and also really a good source of way to mitigate any potential impacts in the future. Okay, just real quickly, where do you find uh, data and maps? There's three basic areas that, uh, that we have. And we also have ability that uh, these brochures that summarize all the existing information that you may, uh, may want. And then also we have a website that uh, you can download and access data and reports that are, um, that are not confidential. Okay, I know I've gone through that a lot of uh, very quickly, but um, I didn't have that much time. So um, I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Donna and um, Frank. That was very informative. Um, let's start with any um, clarify. Well, maybe we don't need to start with that. Um, we only have 30 minutes uh, allotted for um, discussion under this item and um, yeah and we are going to be a little bit under that so let's just move on to discussion uh, use the raise hand feature please um, and again we'll give priority to uh, council members and council advisory body members and if and when we get time to go to the public we will do that and I'm also keeping track of comments uh, and questions and hands raised uh, from the general public because I, I don't want to forget you but we do need to keep moving as we can. So um, go ahead and use the uh, raised hand feature. Okay, let's go with Mike Conroy and then Steve Scheidlauer. Yeah, thanks again, Carrie, and thanks Donna for that. Just a couple of questions. Um, with regard to the EMF impacts, uh, I appreciate highlighting the transmission cable that runs through San Francisco Bay. My question, my first question is the transmission cables transmitting energy from turbines to substations and then substations to shore, will they be AC power, DC power, and you know what megawatt or gigawatts and will be transmitted? And then I guess my second question, which is somewhat completely unrelated, is it assumed that fish landed into a port complex area or harvested near that area? Um, uh, you know, I, I noticed that with the, the data you provided for Morro Bay and Port San Luis, it was landing data, but you didn't link that up with where that catch was actually harvested. Because often that's not the case. Fish that are harvested in one location may be taken to another based upon available port infrastructure, fuel prices at the port and harbor and uh, other factors. So th those are my questions for now, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, I will be happy to answer those the best that I can. So first of all, about the EMF. Um, a lot of those details we get when we receive a construction and operations plan. So it's hard to give specifics at this time. But in general, we expect that there are two different types of cables that will be associated with a offshore installation. The first will be the inter-array cables, and those will be ones that um, hook turbines to each other. And those are most likely going to be 35 uh, uh, kilo, kilovolt cables, or, and those will be AC cables. So that's what we anticipate. It may be different, but we're anticipating that's going to happen. Then usually the transmission cable that, gather, you know, there's a substation that gather, gathers up all electricity and ships it to shore to connect to the grid. And that we anticipate may be either an AC or DC cable. I'm guessing it probably will be a DC cable, but we don't know those details until we get a plan that's submitted by um, a laissez for a wind farm. But that's what, what we anticipate. And we've looked at both AC and DC cables in the initial synthesis of, of information. And I can talk to you further about those details uh, if you'd like. 
So then the second question I have about the landing um, data. So I first want to emphasize those landing data are not the be all end all. Those are what we use as guidelines to investigate further. So we are assuming that a lot of those species that are landed are, are, are uh, collected by local fishers, but not all of it. And that's why I wanted to call out, we know that there is um, long distance traveled by fishers, especially like I said in the, um, the <coughs> trollers, they will go up and down the coast depending upon when that season is. So we are assuming that there's very little like chum and pink salmon fishing off Morro Bay, but that's why we're, uh, we're here to find out what you guys think and what kinds of data you might have to help us describe any potential impacts. And so I just wanna emphasize, this is just a guideline. When we didn't have good information on uh, offshore distribution, we originally had hoped that the landing ticket data that California collected would be, would be useful um, because it's required by law for fishermen to accurately report where they caught their catch. But if that's not useful, then we have to use the best available data that we can. Uh, and that at this point is the landing data. So we welcome and encourage uh, any other kind of information that we could use uh, to establish that. And then um, also barring no other information that we have, we can use the species distribution models to characterize the potential fishing grounds based on basically where the animal lives. And that would be something that we could use if, even if we don't have any spatial information on fishing activity at all. And that's probably an approach that we would take. But as I said, we are certainly open and welcome to hear any kind of feedback that you might have on how, that, on how we could describe the impact better. No, thanks, and I appreciate that, and, and thank you for answering that. The only other one other comment I would offer is, you know, also when you're considering the studies from the transmission cable in San Francisco Bay, remember there's less salinity there because we have the uh, delta that outflows there. So you know that might not be a apples to apples comparison. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mike and Donna. Uh, Steve Scheiblauer, go ahead. Yes, and thank you, Donna, for that presentation. Uh, first a question and then a comment. The question is just simply about your your overlap uh, chart that you showed us. And I'm guessing that that is in relation to the original call area and probably not in relation to the proposed uh, new call area that's both larger and also closer to shore and in shallower water. So is, is that true that it's in reference to the old, uh, the original call area? Yes, that's correct. It's um, in reference to the original call area because that's only the area that we have officially you know, advertised in the federal register. But um, we can update update that uh, as, as needed. And uh, I just wanted to give a sense to the council and anyone who's listening, um, how we approach kind of like winnowing down where areas, um, where there might be overlap areas so that we can gather more information. So for some of them, as we can see that, you know, the near shore fishery, um, uh, fishery for ground fish is really important in this area. A lot of them are near shore. If there are areas that we decide that we would have release that are shallower, we can easily update the, those landing data to account for that. But right now we're assuming that it's going to be in the deeper waters um, that will go forward. And if it isn't, if we, things change, we do have that ability to update it very quickly. Thank you for that. And my comment is just a reminder that there's also the cable routes and in the Morro Bay area, it could be three or more cable routes to shore. And so, uh, you know, that will potentially affect uh, some of the fisheries that are really not impacted so far. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And those are the kind of details that, again, we don't know where the cable route would be. That would come during the construction and operations plan. We do know, and I've interacted with the cable committee uh, in Morro Bay, which has been a very successful mitigation strategy to deal with the telecommunications cables that are very prominent in the area. But we don't know where that cable route would be. And so those kinds of impacts we would want to know, we'd want to prepare for um, when we get to the point of when we're looking at the COP. 
but yes, thank you for mentioning that. And that is on our agenda um, as we move along in the life cycle process. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mike has his hand back up. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. I can, sorry to monopolize this. Uh, this this kind of piggybacks on Donna what you were just saying, and then a comment in the chat from Pete Flournoy. You know, and this is where I know a lot of the folks that I talk to in the fishing industry kind of get wrapped around the axle. Is that this process kind of seemed backwards to us? It, it seems that you know this data, this this types of information, and all that should go into the deciding decision making process rather than at some point well into the future where we're dealing with the construction and operations plan where there's already been so much time, energy and money expended into the process that the likelihood of backing out of that is is really lesser. So, you know, th that's I'm just passing along what I've heard from from folks that I talk to in the fishing industry and kind of trying to bring it around to what Pete had to offer in the uh, in the chat box there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, and thanks for the comments. I, I understand uh, that perspective. Um, that's why in one of the slides, I wanted to kind of make clear that the siting of an offshore wind farm is actually pretty limited, only about 6%. And I think sometimes fishermen, because they've gone through MLPA process and so forth, I, I think it's worthwhile to emphasize that there's actually very limited space out there for uh, an offshore wind farm. And so we have to look at areas that are technically feasible and that's 6% of the federal waters. And so within that, um, you know, we have out, uh, done some outreach with fishermen and, and wanted to get feedback and, and you certainly are able to do that. So far, the feedback that we've had from fishermen have not suggested, I'm, I'm thinking of Morro Bay in particular because that's what I was using as an example we have not received um, information that, you know, there's some tweaking, but there's not a large change. And if there is information and areas the fishermen would like to offer up, I'm sure we would be happy to receive that. But to date, we, we really haven't received an alternative area for us to consider and the reasons why that might be a better alternative. But if you have that, we would love to see what, what that is. Thank you, Donna. Um, next up, we have Chuck Tracy and then Mike Okoneski is on deck. Thanks, Donna. Uh, I just wanted to, and I, I took note of that 6% figure earlier and uh, you, you mentioned it again. So, um, and that's relative to California, um, I believe. And, uh, you know, sort of couched in the terms of such a narrow uh, continental shelf. Um, but, you know, the continental shelf, I think, is quite a bit broader north of the Mendocino Escarpment. Uh, so I was wondering if there's a similar sort of uh, metric, I guess, for, uh, well, for Oregon uh, in particular, uh, but also, you know, um, how, how does that, uh, that bit of Northern California uh, above north of the Mendocino Escarpment sort of play into that 6% figure? Um, you know, is it, is that, I mean, is that five and a half percent of the available uh, area in California or, or what? Um, yes, well, I will say some things and some of my bone colleagues may also uh, chime in. So that 6% was for all of offshore California and that did not include Oregon. And that's why um, Oregon is going on a more thorough process and trying to document where spatial uh, fishing occurs because it is not the same as offshore California. So that 6% does include the Northern California area. And basically what the general trend that we have identified is that the deeper that you go offshore, the fewer fishing conflicts occur. Now there's no area that we can select that will eliminate all conflicts with offshore fishing because there are a lot of different fisheries out there and pretty much all of the technical feasible area has some sort of fishing. So the general trend that we've, we've seen is that the deeper, the fewer conflicts. Um, and that's what we have incorporated into looking at these potential um, call areas, not you know, the actual call areas that were selected. 
And so they're at the, you know, the maximum technical feasibility and where we could go is maybe inshore, but it's already at the maximum offshore um, area. And so if you have information that could help us correct that, that would be good. But in general, we have determined that would be, the, that's the trend. Now, the Pacific ground fish fishery is then also identified as going to be the primary fishery that is going to be impacted. And that's not what this group is here about right now. We're talking about salmon. And so I think for the salmon fishery, what we would like to work with the council and our stakeholders a lot is determine, is there actually going to be an exclusion of the salmon fishery if we have a wind farm? Because it might be that they control in it. They control in that area. So that would be you know, questions that we could hopefully work together in the future to answer. Um, this is Nessie, and maybe just to clarify a little bit where that 6% comes from, and, and Frank can chime in if he wants to. But basically, um, it includes also the limits of feasibility for the technology. Like, where is the wind? And at this point, where is the likely deployment in terms of water depth? Um, and then, of course, the excluding the National Marine Sanctuary. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of factors that went into actually coming up with, with that 6%. Um, and then also, as you know, there's, um, you know, military activities on the central coast as well. So um, but there, there were several factors that went into that 6%. It's not like the whole universe. Obviously, you can go until that 200 nautical miles and there's plenty there, but we were just looking at, um, you know, the, the technical feasibility right now in terms of the, the state of the technology and our authority. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Frank, and I'll just to put in one tiny little bit on that, because the you know, the today you know, and tomorrow it's all about fisheries, and yeah, that's a very important issue for us because that's a, a huge user group. But the planning has to involve everything, and um, particularly uh, the assets on onshore, um, like in the Morro Bay area, where there are large uh, substations and wires already on shore that are stranded. So it's just uh, in the, the planning, you know, considering everything, that's a, something we have to consider that gets us to our, our areas. Okay, thanks, Frank. Thanks, Nessie. Um, next up is Mike Okaneski and then Karen Brady. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the presentations. Uh, it's been real informative. Some good uh, questions. Uh, my question is, it, wave energy has been just kind of brushed on a little bit, but is there any actual knowledge or where they're going to take that or how much they're looking at, or is there any planning, or is it all experimental at this stage? Or I, I guess... Or can these wave energy platforms actually be in the midst of a, uh, a wind farm, for example? Uh, but how you, you talk about six percent, but you know if there's a follow-up move to put a large amount of wave energy into place, that might be something con to consider in all of this. The other part is is that the oceans right now are off limits in a lot of areas for different fishing. And so 6% may not seem like much, but it, it might be a much higher percent as you look at the overall amount of land, or excuse me, water we have to fish with the restrictions that are out there now, including marine sanctuaries. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is Donna. I, I wanna jump in real quick and then maybe Nessie would wanna talk about the wave energy portion of the question. Um, absolutely, I mean, we are well aware of um, fishermen's concerns about what we'll call the cumulative effects of closures to fishing. And that's why we're in the process of updating according to the fishing sector, what the extents of the closures might be. So we could understand that cumulative effect. Um, and we can um, then add on, say that there was a big change in wave of energy, which we aren't seeing um, at this point but we would be able to tell what the potential is for cumulative impacts. And then we can look at the extent at both the entire West Coast and by state and by region and by port complex 
of the available fishing grounds that each sector has and uh, what might be closed. And that's how we're going to approach those kinds of questions. Um, and that's the analysis approach for that kind of impact. And Nessie, do you wanna say anything about wave energy? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think Mike, you're, you're right. It, the technology is not yet um, at the same level as offshore wind. Um, although we um, recently issued a research lease to Oregon State University and they're going to install a wave test facility uh, offshore uh, Newport, Oregon. And so, you know, I'm sure there'll be some data that we can learn from there. But, you know, at this point, um, we don't have anyone who's proposing any kind of wave energy um, deployments on um, other than just that research facility. Thank you both. Uh, let's go to Karen Brady. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks for the presentations. I'm I'm going to drill into the uh, six percent also, um, and so uh, uh, just kind of looking at a, a different perspective, which is that uh, many of our fisheries could claim a similarly small or even smaller portion of federal waters as the place where it can happen. And so as a decision maker for the PFMC, something that I would want to have in hand is an apples to apples number. Uh, so what is the percentage of federal waters that is actually viable for salmon fishing? What is the percentage of federal waters that is actually viable for a ground fish fishery or as Lynn and Yvonne brought up earlier for the halibut fishery? You know, those kinds of questions. And so I'm, I'm wondering um, whether that kind of uh, table matrix apples to apples comparison is in development because I think that's where it really gets to the point where you can get your head around what those impacts are and it's not just comparing six percent for offshore wind you know let's say six percent seven percent for the salmon fishery of viable grounds but it's the areas of overlap and, and where you get into um, conflict between users, so to speak, that, that you start to understand what some of those trade-offs are. So um, I guess the questions are, is, is that kind of really nitty gritty uh, apples to apples comparison and development? And if not, uh, I would recommend that you get there. I think that would be really, really valuable. Thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Karen. Um, this is John again. Um, absolutely, I, I completely agree with that approach, and that is what we're aiming for. And so, like as I kind of called out before, you know, like the broadest area is the um, distribution of the the species itself, right? So that would be the what we call like the potential fishing grounds. Um, that would be the broadest area. And then after that, we do like a winnowing down. The next would be uh, of that species distribution, where is fishing actually occurring? And that is, you know, some challenging, uh, fairly challenging to do, right? And then, um, uh, and you can do that by gear because sometimes species occur much deeper and they're not fished because it's just economically un unviable. Like for instance, Dungeness crab, excuse me, can occur uh, much deeper than where it's fished, but it's just not economically viable. So then you, you have an, another further winnowing. Then you have the areas that are already excluded from fishermen, either essential fish habitat closures or other MPAs or de facto closures, say there's a military closure and so forth. And then that would be the comparison. And we're working on that, as I mentioned, and um, we want to document all those other closure areas. And so that would be another further winnowing. And then what would a wind farm add to that existing um, closures to a fishing ground? And for Pacific salmon, it, we're still unclear whether a, a wind farm would actually add to the closures to the fishing ground. And that's something that we are working on. But that kind of stepwise analysis, I think, gives um, the clearest picture to decision makers on what the consequences would be to an installation. So we're in agreement on that. 
um, the challenge is accurately describing where fishing is actually occurring. And that's why we're here today, because we want to try to get that as best that we can. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Kaylee Summer, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, I put this in the chat. Um, I think a few times we've said in the, I forget which area, but in one of the areas that you think ground fish fisheries might be the most impacted. Um, and I'm still definitely understanding how the different um, fisheries, where the different data is coming from. And I am much more familiar with the ground fish fishery. So it might just be that I'm coming from knowing that data more, but I was curious if you had a sense um, of the degree to which perhaps the the data that that are available could be impacting the feeling that like ground fish fisheries um, are the most likely to be impacted. I feel like they're one of the more data rich fisheries on the West Coast. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering if you had uh, thought about that night, I could be totally off base. Like I said, it might just be that I live in the ground fish world. Uh, actually, I, I think we could definitely have a productive discussion on ground fish when we're going to talk about ground fish <laughs> and further information. And yes, there's certainly a lot more information that we'd like to discuss to incorporate. Um, this is the Pacific salmon uh, FMP discussion. So, and we don't have that much longer. So, yeah. Um, Sorry to deferring, yeah, deferring yeah no to, to clarify fish. though my question was not about ground fish it was to what degree is there data available in the salmon fishery um, compared to the amount of data oh, available compared to, uh, yeah yes, yeah we don't we have very little data um, and that's why basically for the offshore distribution we we had uh, space use conflicts and. Fishermen said that they fish up to, I think it was 46 kilometers offshore. And then we have the VMS data that Frank just showed and that the trolling generally occurred inshore. And at, at this point in time, that's what we have handy, but we would like to have more, um, including to determine, like I said, one of the impacts might be um, whether or not fishing can occur within a wind farm for trolling. Because remember, a wind farm does not specifically exclude fishing. They may act as de facto MPAs, but we don't exclude fishing in particular, at least not uh, BOEM, um, does not have that authority. And so those are the kinds of things that we think are particularly focused for the Pacific Salmon Fishery Management Plan to try to get a better sense of that. Okay, thank you, Donna. Good question, Kaylee. So we are at 11.47. Um, we're two minutes into our hour lunch break. So uh, I'm gonna suggest that we go ahead and take our lunch break now. Um, uh, I will turn to Nessie and Chuck to see if you have anything you wanted to mention uh, or any of the other principles before we take our break. Nothing from our end. Thanks, Karen. Nothing from me. Thank you. Okay, great. Then let's take our uh, lunch break. Uh, we'll start again at 1245 p.m. with Pacific ground fish. Thanks, everybody. Have a good lunch.
Okay, I have 12.45, so let's get going with our afternoon session. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that um, I'm doing the best I can to collect um, comments and questions and links that people are posting in the chat. And if we don't get to them, um, I'm putting them in a parking lot, um, as I told some of you, and when we can get to those, uh, we will. So um, feel free to continue doing that, um, or you can email questions to me if they're, um, you know, if you're not sure which agenda item they would be belong under or something like that. Um, but I am uh, doing that. And um, yeah, so I think we're ready to start with our next fishery, which is ground fish. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a bit more time allotted to this, although I'm sure it'll go quickly because there's a lot here. Um, and we just have one ground fish uh, agenda item. Uh, John DeVore is going to start off. He's on council staff here. He's going to give us an overview of the ground fish fishery, uh, both the um, whiting fishery and uh, and the uh, um, rest of the ground fish fishery. Um, and they, there, there are distinct differences between the two in uh, location and gear type and species, obviously, and things like that. But um, we thought it would work best just to combine them at least at, at least at this point, and then um, uh, you know do the when we get into discussion today and then tomorrow we can delve into um, some of the nuances and the um, unique um, um, you know characters or um, impacts um, to the various segments of the fishery. So uh, John DeVore, if you're ready, why don't you go ahead? Oh, I'm going to let you share your screen. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. So why don't you uh, fire away? Okay, thank you, Carrie, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Is it in presentation mode? No. Okay, how about now? Now it's uh, it's in the mode where it shows that now this there that's what you want. Okay, very good. Okay, well, uh, as the title of this uh, short presentation um, shows, this is a brief discourse on the distribution of gear types in the West Coast groundfish fishery. Uh, let me give you a very uh, a 50,000 foot <coughs> overview of the uh, uh, groundfish fishery. We have over 100 species managed in the uh, FMP. Um, all of the endemic rockfish species, which are uh, greater than 64 species of Sebastes, are in the plan. Uh, there are 12 flatfish species, uh, seven roundfish species, uh, including um, Pacific whiting, lynx and sablefish, which are important targets in the uh, groundfish fishery. Um, all the endemic skates that are on the coast and other assorted elasmobranchs like uh, leopard shark are um, in the FMP. All the endemic grenadiers and then um, a few other assorted bottom dwelling marine species. So it's a it's an FMP um, that uh, has a, a wide variety of diverse taxa. And I think, um, I believe this is perhaps the most complicated FMP found in the world. Um, I don't know if that's hyperbole or not, but from my uh, investigations, I, I think that's true. Uh, there are a number of different little gear types that are deployed in the West Coast ground fish fishery. Uh, we, our, our biggest sector in the fishery is the, uh, is the trawl fishery in terms of, in terms of uh, the volume of catch. And uh, one part of that fishery are uh, bottom trawls. Um, they're deployed on low relief habitats and they target a wide array of these ground fish species. Um, and then we have midwater trawls. Uh, these are, are large midwater nets that um, are deployed off of uh, the largest vessels we have uh, in the ground fish fishery. And they're uh, deployed in the water column. Uh, they're targeting uh, some species of pelagic rockfish and then Pacific whiting, which is a um, uh, a very large fishery. I might add that both uh, 
both of these gear trawl gear types are managed under a limited entry IFQ system. And, uh, and then for the at sea whiting sectors, uh, they're harvesting cooperatives. Um, and so it's a, it's a rationalized fishery and, and bycatch and, and other aspects of the fishery are, are well controlled in that system. Uh, then we have uh, long lines uh, deployed in various configurations. Uh, we have horizontal uh, ground lines that uh, target bottom, uh, on the bottom that target uh, benthic rock fish, lingcod, sable fish, among other species. And then there is some deployment of um, long lines in a vertical configuration to uh, also target um, some pelagic rockfish and, and, and uh, species off the bottom. Uh, we also have pots and traps uh, that are deployed uh, on the bottom. Uh, we have a, a large segment of that fishery that targets sable fish, but then there's, there's some individuals that uh, also target link hide and, and perhaps some other species in, in pots and traps. Uh, there's hook and line gear, uh, both commercial and recreational, uh, you know, rod and reel or um, jig lines that are deployed to target a variety of species, um, rockfish and link cod and others. And then there's some uh, minor gear types uh, that are still used, uh, a, a dingle bar, which is um, a bar with an array of, of lines that are trolled over the bottom to uh, catch other uh, species. Some trolled long lines or uh, fly gear um, that are used to target pelagic uh, rockfish primarily. And then a few other assorted uh, gear configurations. Um, in the, uh, the long lines, pots and traps and hook and line gear are all generally referred to as fixed gears. Um, and uh, part of the trawl fishery allows gear switching. So uh, there is some ability uh, for members of that limited entry sector to uh, use long lines or pots and traps to uh, target their quota species in the uh, trawl fishery. So the distribution of bottom trawling is, is coastwide. Um, uh, on the shelf and on, on the slope uh, within 700 fathoms. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, there was an effort, uh, oh, I don't know, some 12 years ago that to protect uh, essential fish habitat, which limited the uh, historic footprint of, of trawling on the uh, West Coast uh, to within 700 fathoms and that's maintained today. Uh, we also have uh, area prohibitions for um, bottom trawl gears. Um, uh, areas uh, less than 100 fathoms off, off of Washington uh, are uh, prohibited from trawling, um, largely uh, due to uh, um, the state of Washington prohibiting um, inshore uh, trawl efforts. Uh, we have some EFH conservation areas that are off limits to uh, bottom trawls, marine reserves, marine protected areas. Uh, two cow cod conservation areas in the Southern California Bight, uh, which uh, where bottom trawls are prohibited. Uh, those two areas in combination are about 4,700 square miles of area. Um, and then most nearshore areas in state waters uh, as I mentioned, Washington doesn't allow um, any uh, nearshore commercial fisheries in their state waters, uh, ground fish fisheries. And then um, uh, there's uh, prohibitions in California and uh, in parts of Oregon as well, where they just don't allow trawling in, in state waters. And then a lot of the distribution of trawl efforts are um, sort of maintained by gear restrictions, uh, small foot rows and, and chafing gear limits, which effectively keep bottom trawls out of high relief rocky habitats. With those gear restrictions, if they did try to go into a high relief habitat, they would destroy their nets. So it's, it's um, was primarily a, uh, at, at first when this was implemented, these gear restrictions, it was primarily to protect uh, uh, shelf rockfish that were overfished uh, that 
have most of which have uh, been rebuilt by now, but then these gear restrictions are maintained to protect these high relief habitats as well. Uh, the distribution of midwater trawling, it's, it's uh, primarily in the north. Uh, the biggest part of the uh, midwater trawling efforts are associated with targeting Pacific whiting. Um, and uh, these efforts occur uh, off Oregon and Washington on the shelf in some areas on the slope. And it's wherever they can find uh, large aggregations of the right size of Pacific whiting um, that you'll find uh, uh, these whiting fishery. And um, oftentimes it's right on the shelf slope break, but due to state rule in California, uh, the whiting fishery does not occur off of California. Uh, there's also a, a segment of the fishery that targets uh, pelagic rockfish like yellowtail rockfish and widow rockfish um, that aggregate in large numbers up in the water column. And uh, uh, again, that, that fishery is primarily on the shelf off of Oregon and Washington. There is some midwater trawling um, in areas uh, offshore in California, but it's, it's somewhat limited. And there are currently no rockfish conservation area restrictions for midwater trawling, although they <clears throat> they do have some uh, pretty tight limits on on uh, what they can catch. So, and uh, with the IFQ system, we we um, have an effective bycatch control mechanism, which is largely what the rockfish conservation areas were uh, at least originally designed to do. And now, uh, so anyway. Moving on, uh, the, the distribution of commercial fixed, fixed gears, as I mean, these uh, gear types are long lines, pots and traps, hook and line. Uh, we have some near shore, near shore areas off of California and Oregon that are primarily targeting rockfish and with some uh, targeting of lingcod in these near shore areas. Um, uh, again, that's not allowed at, off of Washington. Uh, but is allowed off of California and Oregon. And then off of Oregon, that's primarily occurring uh, south of Cape Blanco, where you have a good nearshore habitat for uh, rockfish. Um, we also have some tribal usual and accustomed areas off of Washington, north of Ledbetter Point, where, um, where there's some uh, commercial fixed gear uh, or tribal fixed gear uh, fisheries that occur. Um, and then areas greater than 150 fathoms south of uh, 40 degrees, 10 minutes north latitude and greater than 100 fathoms uh, to the north of uh, that point, which is uh, near Cape Mendocino, um, that are primarily targeting sable fish, although there is some rockfish targeting in those deeper areas. Um, those, those depth limits, uh, 150 fathoms to the south and 100 fathoms to the north, um, describe the uh, seaward boundary of the uh, um, fixed gear uh, rockfish conservation area. Uh, other area prohibitions uh, for fixed gears include uh, some of the FH conservation areas, marine reserves, marine protected areas, and those cow cod conservation areas in the Southern California Bight. Um, just to mention that there is a, a, an ongoing council initiative now to reduce the rockfish conservation for fixed gears to allow more shell fishing. There's been some um, exempted fishing permit operations that have occurred to um, identify those areas where uh, we have um, higher densities of healthy species and, uh, and lower densities of uh, species of concern, like yellow eye rockfish, which are uh, currently uh, managed under rebuilding plan. So um, it remains to be seen how much effort may be redistributed uh, offshore from the nearshore areas where some of that fishery occurs, or inshore of that, uh, those offshore areas where um, the fixed gear fishery primarily targets sable fish. And then uh, the distribution of uh, the recreational fishery, which also uses uh, hook and line gear. Um, we have nearshore areas that are open uh, coastwide with variable 
death restrictions to reduce pressure on yellow eye rockfish and other species of concern. Um, for instance, in the Southern California Bight, we have uh, a deeper um, depth restriction there because of the um, lack of yellow eye um, in the Southern California Bight, up to some pretty conservative depth restrictions that are um, becoming, uh, that are seasonal like off of Washington where uh, right now in the middle of summer, um, the fishery in, in parts of Washington are limited to within 20 fathoms. And again, this is largely driven by the um, distribution of uh, yellow eye rockfish and a few other species. But a lot of the same area prohibitions for the commercial gears that are in place now, including the EFH conservation areas, marine reserves, marine protected areas, uh, and then some discrete yellow eye rockfish conservation areas. We have some off of Washington that even when um, you're allowed to fish at deeper depths, uh, these areas are off limits because they uh, hold high densities of yellow eye rockfish. And then of course, those two cow cod conservation areas in the Southern California Bight. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I guess I should, this is a pretty general statement, other area prohibitions for recreational gears. I'm really talking about recreational ground fish uh, fishing. Um, in some of these areas, uh, especially down south, there's a allowance to, to or high, highly migratory species and whatnot, since they're not uh, fishing off the bottom, where we have uh, concerns for um, uh, some of the benthic species that are there. Uh, but there's also a, a council initiative to uh, gradually reduce these uh, depth respect, uh, restrictions as species rebuild and to reduce uh, pressure on vulnerable nearshore stocks. And um, you know that we we've seen some redistribution of effort here in recent years uh, as, as, um, as we're trying to redistribute effort uh, to um, allow more access to healthy shellfish, uh, shellfish species, uh, not shelf, <laughs> not shellfish species, but species that live on the shelf, um, and to uh, reduce pressure on some vulnerable nearshore stocks. Um, the last uh, 20 plus years of fishing with rockfish conservation areas is really uh, redistributed um, historic effort in recreational and commercial fisheries, frankly, uh, to um, quite a few of these nearshore areas. So there's been a lot of pressure on some of these stocks. And we'll see in the coming years that um, we'll probably see a little bit more redistribution of effort offshore as, as uh, we can allow. And uh, that that really is uh, my brief discourse there. So I'm happy to take any questions on um, on that overview of the ground fish fishery. Thank you, John. Um, why don't we do any clarifying or technical type questions about John's presentation, um, but not get into the weeds on this. Um, happy to take those, just raise your hand. And, okay, Steve Scheiblauer, go ahead. Yeah, John, I'm not sure if uh, it's a question for you or for the BOEM people who are listening, but are there any of those commercial groundfish gears that can operate in a offshore mooring type structure, in your opinion? Hmm. Um. So I, I'm kind of reading between the lines here. So if if you had some uh, array of let's say wind energy um, uh, devices out offshore, um, would there be an ability to moor off of those and, and fish for ground fish? Is is theoretically is that the, is that the question? Uh, well, given that the, it's my understanding that the uh, the moored deep deep water uh, turbines will have something like a, a four or five to one scope on their on their cabling. Um, I'm just wondering whether you can uh, forecast whether any commercial gears could operate within a mooring uh, such a mooring field. Well, um, obviously, some some gears would probably not be able to. Um, safely you know uh, navigate or fish around some arrays depending on how densely they're packed 
um, I'm not really an expert on this, but you know, there are some, some of these uh, commercial and recreational fisheries, especially like when you're using hook and line gear or, um, or short strands of long line, you know, conceivably you could, you could fish around, you know, offshore structures, I suppose. Um, but as far as, I mean, I, I would really defer to the, uh, the, the fishermen and on, on their ability to fish discrete areas and, and do that safely. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands up. So why don't we move on to Bone, who's going to go over the data studies and analysis related to the ground fish fishery. So um, we have a triad of Frank Pendleton and Donna Schrader and Haley Summers. So uh, why don't you guys go ahead? Okay, I'll get things up here, and uh, Kaylee, you, you will be first. Um, when you're there and can be heard, I am here and hopefully can be heard. Yes, you, you are can be heard. heard. Both of you are heard. And look, can you see my screen there? Indeed. All right, and hopefully it's going to work. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was just going to give a little bit of a broader context of the, yeah, I don't know what's up with the timer, <laughs> a broader <laughs> context um, of the program. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking about observer data and I'm really going to just be talking for a second. Um, so I just wanted to remind people I find this really helpful. So there's a lot of different fisheries um, out here on the West Coast and the WICOP and the ASHOP um, focus in on fisheries that target or incidentally impact ground fish. Um, so this figure kind of gets at the wide array of um, fisheries and this is, um, there are millions of different ways to kind of cut and chop and think about these fisheries. This is how we as an observer program often think of them in terms of how we're uh, deploying observers into different fleets. Um, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. A really similar figure is available in the annual groundfish mortality report. But um, basically, I just wanted to highlight that we have um, coverage for a lot of fisheries um, that are within the groundfish fishery, um, but also that, as many of the folks on the line will know, only the ones in the box there have 100% um, observer coverage or electronic monitoring. So that means um, all those other sectors we have some information on, uh, but it can really range widely from one to 50% of landings being observed in a given year. Um, and that is reported every year in our coverage reports. Uh, so those are ones where spatial analysis can be a lot more difficult because while we certainly um, design our sampling to ensure that we are getting a good random sampling um, across the entire coast. It uh, is still difficult to use that. Um, you don't, you don't want to use that as if it's a census of everywhere that's being fished because we know that's just not true. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. And then um, just connecting to some of the things that were brought up earlier today, there are some future data possibilities. Um, so the FRAM survey data um, is available already on our data warehouse. Um, so we have a number of surveys that are run out of our division. We have our acoustic and hake survey. We have a bottom trawl survey and we have a hook and line survey. Um, so while those are fishery independent, they can definitely tell us more about the species um, composition and abundance uh, occurring along the coast. Um, we also, um, as was discussed earlier in terms of, you know, what's available in terms of catch and bycatch, the, our observers are, are really focused on sampling um, the discard especially. So we have that data for the hauls that were observed. So that could be something else um, to potentially explore in the future. Uh, and finally, in terms of additional spatial data, we have been getting our electronic back deck um, software up and running um, and, and one 
possibility with that is that we could add some spatial components so we could have a lot more points per hall and um, be able to use those instead of making the um, assumption that there's just a straight line between the two points. And that is it for me, very quick. And thank you, Gretchen, for spelling out my many acronyms. My apologies, all. All right. Thank you. It started and I was muted. So start again. So I'm just going to show you several of the maps like I showed you for salmon. But now we're going to look through various ground fish uh, fisheries. And Again, I want to get you thinking of this is a, a data set we're putting together that you can slice and dice this a lot of ways to get to a lot of different questions. And in these cases, we'll be lumping them together as we saw in that um, the declaration code uh, slide back there. So we'll put two or three or even four declaration codes together because they get out of a, a fishery in general. But just realize we can, uh, take it out by individual fishery. We can do it by individual year and various things like that. So here's the limited entry ground fish in Oregon. I'll just let you get a look at that and then I'll move on to the Cal Limits, California next. And here it is, same fishery, just down in California and how it lines up with the call areas. This is Ben. Just to, to clarify, this is ground fish. Uh, Declaration code 210 and 211 are fixed. All the fixed gear fisheries. Thanks, Ben. And then moving on to the midwater trawl. And this one will take a peek at a couple of different ways because, as we you know, we just heard about the whiting and how important that is. Obviously, it falls in the midwater trawl, but there's four codes in the midwater trawl. You can see up there, we're doing 220 through 223. This has all of them. So another way, we'll just take it and remove the, um, the whiting, and just you'll see, it doesn't change things much. It's gonna look, I mean, we'll remove the non-whiting fisheries. Doesn't change things much. You'll just see some of these little edge things where there's a bit of fishing, but you know, clearly not as much as here. Those will kind of remove, and. Things will lighten up just a bit, so none of that. So here's just the whiting. I'll, I'll go back and forward just so they can get a good idea. Here are all of them again. And then just the whiting. So obviously very similar. The whiting's a, a big, big part of that fishery. But, and getting to the idea of uh, you know, how you can use this data set to get insights into, you know, different bits about the fishery. In this case, we're starting with, you know, there had been 11 events in a place, 11 fishing events in a place. Now we're going to cut it to just the, the busier places, so over 50 events. So again, just gives you more insight into, I'll go back and forward once. Um, so you can see it's just, just taken away basically that dark blue and kind of giving you an eye for, okay, here are the, the busier places. And yeah, just a lot of ways to look at this data. Here's the midwater trawl down in California. We'll just look at this the one way. All right. And now the, the bottom trawl up in Oregon. I'll just leave that for a sec for folks to check things out. Now I'll move on to California. And here we'll take a peek at it again in you know doing that, that similar type of thing. Because you can see there's obviously bottom trawl fishing taking place in the Humboldt call area. If we you know we do the same thing. We can see it's clearly fishing there, 
the busiest areas are just outside, you know, right on the corner there, obviously. So that's all the fishing. Just, you know, just a way to get a, another insight into it. So this is the over 100 fishing events. So there you have it on the bottom trawl. Now the, the, the ground fish with the long line trap and pots. So we've you know, put these three together here to give you a view of them. Obviously a few hot spots. And then down to California. And I'll, I'll finish with that, but just again, to get that idea out there that there's, uh, we can, there's, I'm, I assure you, we will be looking at them actually, you know, many different ways. We will divide them up by each, um, each code, each declaration code, but also, you know, it's something we're looking to do soon is bust them out by year, just to, to see some of the variation by year and uh, other things such as that. But that, is, uh, is what I've got for you today for our ground fish and VMS. And with that, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Donna. Thanks, Frank. Um, while we're getting ready, I'm wondering, are there many people that are new in this part of the presentation that were not here for the earlier Pacific salmon um, uh, presentation? Because if there's no one new that I can go over my presentation much more quickly. If there are new people, if you could say so in the chat, that would be useful. Yeah, um, thanks Donna, that's a good idea. Just put a chat in if you're new. I've been going through the list and renaming people. I've been putting the one in front of all of our advisory body members. Um, most everyone was here in the morning, a couple of new ones. Uh, Melissa Mahoney, thank you for saying that. But uh, most of us uh, have all been here. Okay, so just confirm everyone can see my, uh, my slides, right? We can see it. It's not in presentation mode, but we see it. Yeah, there we go. All right, so um, in order to not to be redundant, I'm going to go over uh, very quickly um, some of the things I talked more in detail in the previous uh, Pacific Salmon uh, talk, but for the new people, I would encourage, uh, if you have any other questions and want more information, just feel free to contact me. And so in the beginning, I, I wanted to mention again that um, this is a whole process and we uh, link our process to the, the project life cycle according to what studies we do and, and how we do our analysis. And just a reminder, um, when we do our impact assessment as part of the NEPA, uh, National Enviro Environmental Policy Act, we're gonna begin with lease issuance, which is basically an administrative act of a piece of paper and site characterization activities, which is basically, you know, cores, um, some buoys and things like that. The big uh, potential impacting um, time would be when we analyze the construction and operations plan, which is in the future. And that's where most of the impacts that uh, would occur. And so uh, this is why we want to come to you and receive all the uh, feedback that we can to accurately describe any potential impacts. Okay, just as a reminder, some of the differences between East and West Coast, it's a lot deeper out here. And so there's a pretty big gradient in offshore activities related to depth. There'll be floating turbines, there's no pile driving noise impacts. Uh, and there's going to be likely fewer wind leases. And something that got a lot of discussion at the last um, uh, presentation was that you know, for offshore California, only 6% of federal waters are technically feasible for offshore wind. And I put a link down there. Um, you know, there's a very good presentation as a PDF that Frank did um, a number of years ago that kind of explains how we got to that number. The other advantage that we, and this is actually uh, pretty important for ground fish, <clears throat> we have a lot of lessons that we learn from our conventional energy program that we can apply to offshore wind. 
Here we have both wind and wave energy on the coast. Uh, so there's two different kinds of technology, although we're, we're mainly gonna talk about wind today. And then also there is an ongoing offshore aquaculture opportunity areas process. And I think that um, it's great that we're discussing these at the same time so we can have a comprehensive planning approach. Okay, this is just to show that we began synthesis of the information back in 2002. And the studies that we found are continuing on in this. And so here's just um, a lot of like, kind of like background inv information I already went over that you can um, discuss or refer later on and we can discuss today. So I've just highlighted some of the things that I want to mention, especially now that we're talking about groundfish, about our seafloor characterization efforts. But before that, we have done more synthesis of information in California, and we're not the only people, a lot of other people. This is just a small sampling of a lot of the information that's available out there. Okay, uh, to seafloor mapping. So we actually do quite a lot of seafloor mapping uh, with, in conjunction with partners. This particular example was offshore Oregon when we had a prospective wind float um, a project. And we looked, uh, we partnered with USGS and did some pretty detailed mapping of the potential lease area and, and surrounding areas. And uh, this is important uh, for ground fish, obviously, because a lot of essential fish habitat um, and the habitat areas of particular concern, an important subset of EF, EFH, as many of you know, uh, we use this to determine that. And this is really important in our. Um, consultation process and interfacing not only to, to predict the species distributions, but also to minimize any impacts to, you know, biological hotspots and so forth. On the right, you can see um, some of the uh, map of the potential area. And we, we, when we begin, we're like, oh, it's probably going to be very boring, just a lot of mud on the slope. But we actually found um, quite a few interesting things. We found um, a previously unknown rock outcrop. Uh, which would be, you know, uh, a habitat of concern that we would want avoidance. We found a slump um, in the area, which of course would make it less feasible for from a technical aspect. Then also just outside, we found a series of uh, methane seeps, which under Amendment 28 is uh, more protected. And so we always find a lot of stuff with seafloor characterization, and we um, are doing that. And we also have ongoing efforts. Uh, pairing again with GS, but also NOAA and uh, the Marine, Monterey Bay, Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And so uh, we are committed to doing a lot of the seafloor mapping approach. And so, um, and also that information that we collect is available to the general public once it's analyzed. Okay, I want to uh, remind everyone again that there's a difference between what we call effects um, from it. Uh, from a factor that's uh, affecting the fishery. So that means just something happened. But an impact is what we use when we describe something in a NEPA process to aid decision makers. And that's an effect, but you really have to provide more information so that the decision maker can understand the context of that impact. So, you know, how, how, what's the intensity of it? You know, what's the spatial extent? Is it just local or is it a regional? Uh, what's the duration? Is it short term or is it in a long term time scale? And this is why we're um, talking to as many people as possible uh, to help us inform our impact analyses, especially for uh, our upcoming analysis on a construction and operations plan. Okay, so in a previous summary, we have uh, we had a conference identified that electromagnetic fields or EMFs and the artificial reef and fat effect are uh, information needs that we need in particular for ground fishes. So I'm going to re review uh, some of that information. So we've had over seven BOEM funded studies regarding uh, EMFs, and one of the most important ones early on was to describe. Um, what the cables, mainly the EMF uh, emanates from cables associated with the wind farm. There's AC and DC, and there was a lot of discussion of what intensity of impact that would be. Then also all the species out there, uh, we reviewed to determine which one might have a sensitivity to either an electric or a magnetic field. 
and uh, and that's available um, for download on our website. So I already talked about the salmon um, and the studies. We also, this is one of the areas where we actually benefited from our conventional energy program and that in the Santa Barbara channel, there are uh, 35 kilovolt AC cables, which we expect to be very similar to the cables that are used within an offshore wind array. And we have an example of uh, cables that were energized that were uh, that are in use. That is, they have an EMF and one that was decommissioned and unenergized. And so we looked at the distribution and abundance of species associated with the cable so that we could detect what the impact might be. And since we had um, basically a kind of a control of an unenergized cable, we could separate out the habitat effects from the EMF effects on species. And uh, we found that there were no significant differences between the cable type. And so there was a negligible impact. And this is important groundfish because as you know, there are a lot of uh, species that are associated with the bottom, the benthos, and they would be most likely to, inter inter um, to encounter and interact with the EMF from a, a, a cable on the bottom. Okay, let's move on to artificial reef effects. And so uh, with any kind of offshore installation, whether wind or wave, there's probably gonna be a lot of new novel marine infrastructure habitat introduced in the upper water column, usually about 30 meters or less. And this will have direct habitat effects on the environment. And also because there's a lot of a structure, that means that a lot of fishing will be um, unintentionally prohibited within a wind farm. And so it becomes a de facto MPA for many types of fisheries, not all, but pro probably most of them. And so that would have an indirect effect on the um, distribution and abundance of species. So this is another area where we have benefited quite a lot from our conventional energy program and that we've done a lot of study. We've spent millions of dollars researching the potential impact from offshore oil and gas platforms on ground fish, particularly rockfish. And that's can, uh, summarized in a brochure that you can find on our website. And a lot of this research was funded because some stakeholders want to consider the option of a reef to reef option when decommissioning occurs. So in general, we find that uh, the structures quite beneficial to many ground fishes, especially the rockfish. We see a picture on the right, those are all short belly rockfishes and we can find situations where there's just you know, hundreds of thousands of fish on a rig. And uh, Jeremy Clace and his co-authors have determined that they looked at the productivity and that these platforms have some of the highest fish production of any unit per seafloor in any marine habitat that has ever been studied. So this is obviously not a wind farm, but we think that we would expect a very similar function for offshore structure for juvenile rockfishes. They might, it might become a very important um, recruitment habitat or, or affect the dis distribution of rockfish um, in the offshore water. What else, uh, one other thing that we have found is that we get a lot of biofiling on the offshore structure. Um, and these can become dislodged and fall to the seabed or intentionally removed as part of a structure cleaning process to reduce the fatigue on the structure. And this will transform the bottom from something that's kind of fine silt or mud to something a little bit more complex. And we have documented that that does attract and recruit a number of different species. And so we would expect that this is also going to be happening um, with any offshore wind farm. Okay, I'm gonna talk about species. Then we have quite a, a number of other studies, which I'm not really gonna mention, but we've trying to characterize the, all the sources of noise, um, marine noise that are on the, uh, on the outer continental shelf. And we've also looked at uh, what are the consequences of energy absorption, particularly from wave energy on uh, the marine environment. And you can find those on our website. As far as monitoring, that was a, something that was identified by our uh, stakeholder group and panel of marine experts as something that would be important to monitor. And so BOEM has recently established to assist with renewable energy and some of our other programs 
the Center for Marine Acoustics. And there's a bunch of specialized experts that will help us monitor and determine what impacts may occur from uh, marine noise. Okay, so let's talk about fisheries. Um, what we want to know is a, a variety of information um, to help us describe what potential impacts would be. And I've just sort of made a list of some of the aspects here um, that are important to us and that we're, we're continuing to seek information. We're not the only ones. Uh, this was a, is a recent paper that was published in Oceanography um, that listed all the different kinds of um, expected impacts from offshore wind and uh, expected scale of effects. So this is a good guide because what we want to do is collect information that can feed into the potential impacts for a cop. And I do want to call back uh, way in the beginning of our, our meeting today when I think it was Yvonne mentioned um, potential impacts for something like the Pacific halibut fishery, which is only open a couple of days um, a year. And so that clearly is a potential impact. And if we understand that that is potential, then we can review and put mitigations on our, our uh, conditions of approval on the construction and operations plan to reduce impact, hopefully to zero for that Pacific halibut fishery. And so that's why it's important for us to have a lot of input and feedback from people so that we can understand how to minimize impacts. Okay, I wanted to show you what we've been using sort of as a guideline to begin on, on what we want to look for. And so we just lo looked at available data on the port landing statistics. Uh, and I'm using the Morro Bay call area as an example. That was one of our first ones that we started um, designating for the call areas. And on the right, you see I have uh, these little red triangles and the filled ones like sablefish and thorny heads are ones that have a distribution um, that overlaps with the call area. And the open red uh, triangles are species that are in the groundfish fishery but are not expected to have impact. And basically, you know, we had hoped to use some of the fish block data, but as you saw from uh, Dr. Ruttenberg's presentation earlier, um, those data, even though they're required by law to be accurate, we found that they weren't very accurate. And so we're looking at other ways to begin to try to understand what information and needs we had and what kind of impacts we, we may have from a wind farm. And so here, just by looking at a simple depth overlap function, we find that sablefish and thorny heads are probably the most important species landed that we would want to get more information on. Now, this is species by species, but there is multiple um, fishing gears uh, to target these species. And we haven't obviously looked at that just yet. Frank did show some information that separates out, but we're aware of that and that's one one type of information we'd like to get more on. So this is Morro Bay and this is Port San Luis. And uh, there's a lot of species. They primarily have the near, for, near shore um, groundfish species that they harvest, but they do have a bit of sablefish landings here. But we can tell that probably the Morro Bay Harbor is going to experience potentially more impact than Port San Luis. And then, um, I just want to show you something additional with our, our depth, our very simple depth analysis that we're using to guide forward. Um, and we rely heavily on our NOAA colleagues on the information that they produce. And of course, uh, also we'll rely on the council information, especially the fishery management plans and all the stock assessments associated with that. But here, I just thought to show you, okay, there is overlap. Uh, with the ground fish fishery. And, and here's a figure from um, a recent report from NOAA Fisheries on the distribution of effort. It's not spatially located, but just showing where the trawl, now this is not fixed gear, but where the trawl fishery occurs. And you can see that the depth range of the call area of Morro Bay is deeper than the majority of the fishing effort. Not all of it, there is some overlap, but it does represent that um, there is quite a bit of avoidance of major impacts with the deeper um, call area. 
Okay, it's pelagic, migratory. And then uh, even though I, I use this as an example for swordfish, I do wanna say if we do not have any information on the distribution of fishing, we can use as a substitute species distribution modeling, which would be the maximum potential fishing grounds um, of a species. And if we don't have any information, we can always fall back on this kind of modeling, which would basically describe the maximum potential uh, fishing grounds. And uh, that would be something we'd use when we have very little information. Um, and I've just demonstrated this for swordfish, which, which we don't have very much information. And, and this again is from a, another paper produced by our NOAA colleagues and published in a peer reviewed journal. And it shows uh, where swordfish catch might be modeled on a lot of oceanographic parameters. Okay, I have gone over this uh, before in the previous presentation, but I uh, would like to say and emphasize again that we have determined just from our initial look that the Pacific groundfish fishery is going to be the one that has the most overlap with the call areas so far in California. And uh, we have a lot, so many different information needs. And one of the ways that we think that the council could probably really help us a lot is we, we'd really like to document the use of call areas by non-local fishers. And any way that you can help us on that would be, uh, would be very much appreciated. Then I haven't talked about recreational fishing very much, but I do wanna call out that um, in general, rec recreational fishing can be sometimes enhanced by offshore um, structures. We have found for groundfish from offshore oil and gas platforms there's probably very little bottom fishing, but surface fishing can occur uh, and that they tend to be very productive habitats. So it does function as an, an MPA for ground fishes and it may also function like that for offshore wind. Um, then also for the, at least for the only existing wind farm in the US, we have recent information that it actually generates a whole new tourist sector that many fish, former fishing charter captains have actually converted and uh, taking out a whole new group of uh, customers just to see the wind farm. Now the Block Island wind farm is close to shore. And so that might be more attractive for people to take a little boat ride to check it out. But right now we're not expecting a lot of impact to recreational fishing, but if this is incorrect, it would be great to get some information to correct our viewpoint. Okay, and I just want to mention that we have a lot more information out there that's available on our websites and uh, regarding space use conflicts, potential mitigation measures, uh, a lot more mapping that we've done in conjunction with our NOAA colleagues. Socioeconomic impacts is mainly for East Coast, but a lot of the same information that they've come up there with options could be appropriate for the West Coast. Uh, and that there's a whole bunch of information out there that we use to help describe potential impacts. Uh, calling out again uh, the Council and NOAA Fisheries, as well as our, our state uh, fishing agencies. They've also been uh, really important to our analyses. Then also I want to call out that we are looking at spatial closures. Uh, we had done this back in 2015. We're in the process of updating it because what we would like to do is understand what the existing fishing grounds are, what closures they're already experiencing, and what a renewable energy facility might add on to it. And we want to separate by gear. So that's an ongoing process. And that's how we um, expect to do our primary cumulative analysis effects. Then we have produced a couple of papers that uh, describe how port infrastructure might be modified with offshore renewable energy. And an area of future research is to build on existing information and to find out what synergies and what mitigation options might be available associated with port infrastructure to improve the uh, sustainability and, and adaptability of the fishing community, uh, both in California and off Oregon. And so we expect the Council NOAA Fisheries uh, to be very helpful with that in the future. Then finally, I just wanna highlight some places where we keep our data and maps. And we also have these handy summaries of the, all the renewable energy research we've uh, funded so far, and that can be found on our website. Uh, and then also we have for our entire BOEM program, our, the system where, where you can find uh, any of our reports and data 
which unless it's confidential information, all our research that uh, bone funds is available to the public, including the seafloor maps. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. So um, let's see that covers Bohm's uh, review of the ground fish fishery uh, from Frank, Kaylee, and Donna. Are there any questions, clarifying questions for uh, these folks? Anyone would like to ask? Yvonne, go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to, I had a sort of clarifying comment and then uh, and then a thought that I wanted to share with the larger group. One was, um, so I wanted to see, I think on the East Coast, we are mainly dealing with fixed turbines and out here, uh, floating wind turbines are under consideration. So uh, maybe we might wanna hear some about safety considerations. There was a question earlier from uh, about whether fishing near or around the installations would be possible. And that might be more of a safety concern with floating installations and with fixed. So some, uh, some thoughts on that. And then the other thing is, you know, we have these different spatial closures off the West Coast quite a lot and for different reasons. And something that the Fishery Management Council family is going to have to think about is, um, you know, would we favor, how would we feel about uh, wind turbine installation in an existing closed area? Is that then going to be, you know, if we've closed the area because we think the habitat is so important that it needs to be preserved from fishing effects, does it need to be preserved from the effects of wind installations? And, or is it a, you know, a temporary closure that we're, where we're hoping to reduce bycatch? So at any rate, I know this is running through the minds of many people on this call, but um, just something that as a council family, we're going to need to think about. Thank you, Yvonne. I also see a couple more hands up. In addition, I did see uh, some questions that came through the chat line. Um, Dan Waldeck had a couple of questions. And Steve, you have your hand up. I saw your question uh, in the chat. And Mike Conroy had a question in the chat, his hands up. And then Gretchen uh, had a, a comment, Gretchen Henshu uh, in the chat. Um, but Dan Waldeck, I would uh, encourage you to um, ask your question verbally. Go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, Gretchen, if you'd like to add something uh, verbally, that might be best for the record as well. And then I'm just going to go um, down the line with Steve, Mike Conroy, Dan. And then it looks like Whitney from WDFW also has her hand up. So Steve, we'll start with you, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm just concerned about the time frames that are used for some, some of the studies and analysis, and in particular, uh, the bottom trawl groundfish uh, information, uh, that if it doesn't include the 90s or even earlier, it would miss how important that fishery has been to the central coast. And it, it's not just a, a rear view mirror look at it, but it really also speaks to the future because, you know, there are entities uh, that are really working to re reinvigorate that fishery in that area. And, and you know, the loss of a, of a prime area would definitely be kind of a blow to that. Uh, both the Monterey Fisheries Trust and the city of Monterey have actually acquired groundfish uh, quota shares to uh, specifically try to keep that fishery in the area and to reinvigorate it. So, so again, I just hope that you look back far enough to be able to forecast what the future could be. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, moving on to Mike Conroy, unless uh, there's a, a comment from Bohm regarding Steve's comment. I just thank you for your comment. We will okay. keep that. All right, we'll move on to Mike Conroy. Go ahead, Mike. 
Yeah, thanks, Robin. And mm -hmm. this is not related to the question that I asked in the chat, but rather one I think was brought up by something Donna said. I think she was talking about Pacific Halibut and mentioned something about mitigation. So I think this opens the door to the question that I was figuring out where the heck I was going to uh, ask it. But Donna, you mentioned impact mitigation. I'm under the impression that at least for the East Coast, BOEM was working to ensure that impact and mitigation fees are required and properly calculated. I'm just wondering, is that something that's also being considered for the West Coast? And if so, who is BOEM working with on that? And that's my question, thanks. Yeah, I'll just give a few comments uh, overall about how we approach mitigation. In fact, um, basically all federal agencies and that there's something called a mitigation hierarchy where if at all possible, you wanna avoid an impact. And then if you can't avoid it, then you wanna minimize it. So for instance, using the Pacific halibut example, if the fishery is only open a couple of days a year, um, we would put perhaps as a condition of approval for a construction and operations plan, which we call COP, that uh, they would not interfere, You know, they wouldn't do a cable laying activities, let's say, um, during those few days. And so that way the um, impact to the Pacific halibut fisheries can be completely uh, um, avoided. So then we seek to minimize impacts by uh, various strategies. And then if we can't minimize it, then we, um, we look for compensation, which is not necessarily always financial. It can be like out of kind compensation. Like for instance, um, I'm going to say, even though this is not related to offshore wind, but example is uh, for a seagrass, which is a, a, a habitat area particular concern for ground fish. And NOAA Fisheries has a compensation policy that if you destroy seabeds, you must restore seagrass bed to the area or an in-kind restoration somewhere else. And so those are the kinds of strategies that we're looking at, um, that all federal agencies look at to mitigate. At this point, it's really difficult to figure out the particular strategy because we don't have a construction and operations plan. So we don't know what the impacts are going to be just yet. We're in a very early process in Oregon. Uh, we don't have any call areas and so forth. So to determine that approach is a little bit premature because we, we have a particular life cycle that we operate on. Um, all the information that we're collecting could be used similar to the East Coast, but we don't know and have not made a decision like that on the West Coast just yet. So that is, um, that's where we're at. Does anyone else from BOEM wanna add further information? Well, uh, you know, I'll say thank you, Donna. This is Rick Yard again. And um, I think probably most of you that are interested in this uh, mitigation question are already looking at the, types of mitigation that are in the mix for the Vineyard Wind Project, which is the recent project that was approved on the Atlantic. I think um, if you're interested in what things, uh, what topics of conversation will be in the mix when we finally get to a COP on the Pacific, I think that would be a good place to start to get an idea. Though Donna is absolutely right. It's, um, we're, we're, we're talking about different things right now because we're, we're way prior to that and we're thinking about leasing at the moment. This is Nessie, and, and, and to add that I think some of the negotiations are also happening between lessees and the fishing organization, so uh, which, you know, some of it will be outside of BOM's process, so I would just kind of follow those conversations, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Dan Waldeck. Go ahead, Dan. Thanks, Robin. And uh, I'll ask the questions I put in the chat, and I have a, a sort of a longer question that I'll, I'll see if I can work through. But what I proposed in the chat was was a, a question about updating the um, spatial and temporal mapping information, the data you're using for um, trawl effort on the, the West Coast. Uh, right now, it's I believe it stops in 2017. And, and as I mentioned in the chat, after the biological opinion, and, and for other reasons, as, as Gretchen mentioned, there, there have been areas that have been open. And so there, there have been 
significant changes in um, fishing effort, fishing areas since 2017. And it would be helpful to have an understanding of, of your um, plan for updating to make sure you have the most current information available. And then connected to that, that question about, about um, fishing areas, I asked a question also about uh, research survey areas and research survey transect lines and information that you have available to um, ensure you're, you're including consideration and mapping of, of, of those really important um, facets of, of the council's sustainable management and the research that they do. So I'll, that's, that question is on the aerial, spatial, temporal information for tracking fishing effort and research effort. Another question, um, and then I'll, 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 just, I'll, I'll go back to listen mode, and this is a, a bit more complex, so I'll kind of work through it as, as slowly as I can, but I guess it, it's, it's been noted that cumulative impact analyses will occur um, down the road, but can you speak to the data and the analyses that will be available to inform a, a better understanding of how a dynamic fishery, for example, like the whiting fishery, should be considered in offshore siting efforts? And, and I use dynamic in terms of spatial and temporal scales, regional and local importance, uh, multiple bycatch species that are avoided, and, and the economic scale of the fishery. And, and I guess the, the point in asking this is that it seems relatively easy to, to uh, you know, define and analyze the, the impacts to a localized fishery that will be affected by offshore wind sighted over a specific fishing area, but that's not really how the whiting fishery and much of the ground fish fishery operates. So, it, it's, so it's this question about what types of multivariate analysis and what types of data are available or will be available to inform those types of complex analyses? Uh, you know, I, so I mean, again, I think a starter list, you, you have to have direct revenue loss because of, of, of a fishing area is closed. You've got operational cost revenue losses from having to relocate away from an offshore wind site. You've got economic uh, effects from having to fish in an, high, an area of higher bycatch potentially. Uh, you also got political and regulatory impacts. If, if you're forcing a, a fishery to move from a clean area to an area where there's a, a higher likelihood of catching bycatch, there, there's political implications from having to fish in areas where other people don't want you fishing. And, and I think those need to be analyzed as well. And so, I mean, there's a, a lot of different facets that I think would need to be analyzed, as I said, in, in a multivariate analysis. And I've not really heard you talk about how that synthesis is going to happen, when it's going to happen, and what data is going to be used to inform it. So thanks. Okay, this is Don. I'll take a stab at it. I, 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 that was a whole series of questions, and I think I'm going to be able to answer all of them. But if I haven't, just uh, repeat the question after I'm done. So the first one was about uh, closures and how we're going to do that. Well, there's actually, um, Noah and a couple other places have actually been actually pretty good at describing some of these closures. And so we will get the, that information and start there. Then we're going through all the details of all the regulations, um, both you know, federal and state regulations to look at what spatial closures might occur. Like for instance, there might be something you can't um, trawl within, I'm, I'm making this number up, I don't know what exactly it is, but within a, um, 100 meters of a pier. So that would put like a hundred meter buffer around every pier that you couldn't trawl. And these are generally, sometimes they're often overlooked or missed in these kind of databases. And then we would, and this is the unique part, we would make a layer specific to different fishery sectors, right? Because right now, a lot of the information that's out there is just like everything um, at once on one layer. And that's not very useful analysis because what's going to happen is there will be different effects to different fisheries based on gear. And so that's what we're going for. And so we're looking at all the regulations first and the existing information that's been plotted. Uh, and then afterwards, we're also going to talk to uh, fishing stakeholders and get their input. Like for instance, someone mentioned earlier that there might be these sort of informal bycatch areas that fishing uh, fishers avoid. So that might be Kind of a de facto closure area that we would want to document. So that's the hierarchy. We're looking, some uh, websites have actually done a very thorough job and Noah's one of them, but there are others um, to document all the closures. 
then we're going to look at, at all the regulations at the state and federal level foreclosures, and then we're going to talk to the fishermen. And that's what we're, that's our process. If you have other suggestions, we'd be happy to hear it because this is an ongoing study that we're doing. Then um, we'll be updated as needed. Specifically, we're going to target those different NEPA events when we have to produce an analysis, but we'd like to keep them current because it's very useful. So that's the first question you had. The second question you had was about uh, research and surveys and so forth. Um, and have we considered that? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, for instance, a cow coffee survey, a line uh, that was one of the considerations that we received and was uh, taken in con consideration uh, in designing that. And we also are aware are these other fishery independent surveys and, and fishery dependent surveys that NOAA does to do their stock assessment. That has been an issue on the East Coast and uh, we expect that there will be discussions also um, at the time when we get a COP with NOAA fisheries to try to minimize that, uh, that effect. Since a lot of these wind farms will basically be de facto MPAs, you know, there's a lot of work that NOAA Fisheries has done already. And one in particular, I'm thinking of one that um, John Fields did. He's a stock assessment at Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And it was on how M MPAs would be used for uh, stock assessment. And that's a really good start and would be directly applicable to an offshore wind facility on how you would integrate that into a larger fishery management plan. Again, and I keep saying this, but it, it is important. It's hard for us to do that now because we're at the leasing stage. We don't know if there is even going to be a wind farm or what that would look like or how big or how deep or anything like that. So to give an answer to those questions right now is, is difficult, if not impossible, but it is on our radar and it's an important question. So, you know, thank you for uh, bringing that up. Then the next question is, how are you going to address these dynamic fisheries, say like the Pacific whiting fishery, which is got a lot of spatial variability, space and time. And, you know, the whiting is not the only fishery that is primarily pelagic. It's not bottom focused like other ground fishes. And it's similar to like albacore or swordfish and, and coastal pelagic species that their habitat, and in fact, their EFH is defined by oceanographic parameters and, and not at all spatially fixed. And so the way that you address this is through modeling exercises, right? What, what's going on? And uh, you can represent variability through various statistics, uh, coefficient, coefficient of variability or anomalies or a bunch of different factors that I'm sure no one wants to hear about at this particular time. But there are ways to look at variability and there are statistics that we can generate to describe that. And that would be the approach that we would use to understand that basically through modeling. I, I showed the slide before that species distribution modeling, the same kind of methodology can be used to model fishing activities. And that would be an option for us to use to address that issue. And then uh, the last question that you had, what about uh, multi-scale uh, impacts? Well, the answer to that would be that we would present our impact analysis at various scales. And we tend to do that just as a matter of fact in our NEPA analyses, we describe what the local impact, the regional impact could be. Then we could add on the statewide impact. We could also add the whole West Coast, California current system impact. And then for these really wide weight ranging species like albacore, we can even do a Pacific basin wide impact. So you, you don't have to come up with one answer, like 42 as an answer to everything. You could present your analyses at different scales because in some situations, the outcome might be reversed. There may be um, local enhancement of a certain fish because of the infrastructure, but at a regional scale, it might be off. And so we address the, those scale difficulties by presenting our analyses at different scales because stakeholders do have different interests and they want to see our analysis at different scales. And so we present it that way. Okay, so that's a long answer, but you had like four or five questions in there. So I think I got everything, but if I didn't, um, please repeat your question. And if any of my BOEM colleagues has further information to add, now's the time.
Well, I, just to say, I appreciate you taking a stab at a, at a, a very complex question. I, I, I put it into the chat, so it's there for posterity, and, and you guys can mull it over. Um, and I guess I, I just would say that, that um, and I think this is true for, for everyone who is on the call today, uh, speaking for um, my um, association and for the whiting fishery, you know, I think we are, are always available to, to I think, it would be most productive, I think, to to sit down or to have a you know a specific Zoom meeting with whiting fishery participants and and you know the the, the group of us could sort of work through these these types of questions. But I think you're right. It, it will take a very complex um, set of analyses and suites of of data to really you know gain a full understanding of the potential effects and and how to avoid those effects. So uh, thanks for that stab at it, and uh, I think we'll continue this conversation. Yeah, we'll appreciate that. And uh, we think that's a great idea. We look forward to speaking with you further. Okay, thank you for that conversation. Uh, Gretchen had her hand up, but she put it down. Gretchen, I didn't know if you wanted to address um, your comment. Um, thanks. I, I think it was well covered. Appreciate All right. it. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. And so I'll move on to Whitney Roberts, followed by Mike. Go ahead, Whitney. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Bo and folks, um, in addition to fishing areas, has there been consideration given for areas of transit? Um, because if uh, vessels are blocked off from traditional areas of transit, um, whether that's for the final development of a wind, wind farm or um, or what areas might be in conflict during um, development. Uh, has there been any data looked into or consideration for um, areas of transit and not just the, the physical areas that fish are, are caught? Hi, this is Frank. I can speak to that a bit. And yes, we're getting there. Um, it's, we've so far done the uh, um, places where folks are fishing, you know, data set, but we have the, uh, the other set of tracks that we, did, we will run through the same, uh, same process to get, it'll be everything. Where is transiting happening? Where, where are folks fishing? And if we find it necessary, after that, we can also just say, okay, go and delete all the fishing sites and let's just find the transiting and look at that. So we haven't gotten there yet. We're getting all the processes in place and, and it will come. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Frank. And uh, back to, or to you, Mike, go ahead. Uh, Excuse excuse me, me, Can I just... This yes. is not I have one more thing to answer that question. Just an example um, for transit areas and mitigation measures potential. We can learn something from, again, our conventional energy program. And for transit areas, because it's important for vessels going back and forth from harbors to the offshore platforms, that there were like a vessel corridor transit area was set up to minimize you know, impacts between vessels and um, the fishing pots to reduce you know, gear loss for that. So that's an example that we have done in the past. Transit is important. It's not just about fishing. We're talking about fishing today, but that's one of many factors that we're looking at. We've done that in the past and we tend to do that in the future. So I'm done. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask one more thing before we moved on. No problem. Thank you, Donna. All right, Mike, I think you have the floor. Go ahead. Okay. Um... I think Dan covered part of what I was going to mention about the direct and operational costs. I think there's one other one though too, is which often gets overlooked, and that's the evaluation of capital assets. And that can be vessels, can be processing plants, it can be uh, infrastructure that's you know utilized uh, for supporting fisheries, such as ice houses and stuff like that. But uh, those are, I don't know, in the 
tens of millions of dollars at least, probably over a hundred million dollars by now. And it, I, I have no idea how far extensive it is. But if you don't have enough income coming in from the fish, you know, the purchase of fish, and you don't have enough capacity to uh, or opportunity to catch the fish, your vessel mortgage and everything else, like plant mortgage, the rest of it is all up for possible, you know, uh, bankruptcy or just going out of business. And once that infrastructure is gone, it's very, very difficult to get back because waterfront real estate is, is pretty important or pretty expensive. So I think that has to be factored in. I've heard nothing about the shore side part of it uh, being looked at as far as mitigation goes. Perhaps it has. So that, I believe you need to bring that in too. There's also market impacts. What markets just don't stay around and wait for you to clean up and start producing fish again, they go out and get substitutes, usually imports in this case. And once those go away, at least for many species of fish that we do in ground fish, it's very difficult to get them back. So all those things I think need to be analyzed in the, in the final analysis there, or well, before the final analysis. Um, one thing I did want to mention, and I think this has been touched on a couple of times, but I'm going to perhaps uh, speak to a couple of things. And one is, I don't know how much you want to get out of this two-day meeting, but Dan Dan mentioned the idea of coming to his organization. I think that you do need to go to the organizations, and there's some really good ones out there, MTC, Dan's organization, West Coast Seafood Processors, and others, and, and start having some direct talks with them, because really they're the ones that should be vetting what it is you're mapping out. They, they represent, uh, you know, the people that will have the best idea of exactly what it is you're mapping out and how that's going to impact them in their livelihoods. So I, I've seen you where you've gone, and of course you're agency to agency, but I don't know at a uh, county commission meeting or whatever how many people get invited from the fisheries, but if you go to the org fishing organizations that exist, and like I said, there's some very well-structured ones out there, very knowledgeable people in them, you, you can get a lot more down to the information you need to hear. And that's the kind of outreach I think that's been missing so far. I do believe that what the council has done to start this ad hoc committee and to get involved is the absolutely the right thing to do. But in many respects, it's, it's a scoping exercise and you need to get the next step going also. And that's direct involvement with these fishing organizations and, and the people like Dan that have a base knowledge that you need to get to and get to other organizations that are collecting data also, such as C-State and see how your information compares to theirs. That's gonna take some time and it's gonna take some work and you're gonna to have to get into the communities to do that. But I'm sure that these organizations would be very receptive to your to meeting with you. But right now, we're, we're, I think we're just skimming over the top and not really getting down to the nitty gritty of where, you know, the people are that want to need to look at this information because they're the ones whose livelihoods are going to be affected. And they're hard to get because they're hardworking people and they're, they're you know, that not everybody can drop what they're doing and attend these webinars. The council is doing an excellent job here, I believe and making a really sincere effort to get involved. And we really appreciate that, but there is still one step to go there. So I'll leave it at that, thank you. Yeah, this is Donna. I wanna say thank you for your comments and I agree with everything you said. I think it's really important, uh, one, to look at, I, I, I put those comments that you said about the infrastructure included on those slides about port infrastructure. And that is really important and something that has not yet um, been addressed. We've looked at how ports might change with offshore wind development, but we think there's more work to do to how to interface 
preserve and even enhance infrastructure for fisheries. And this is probably one of the best mitigation options that the two in industries have to uh, enhance you know, offshore uh, marine activities just in general. Um, and we intend to build on some of the excellent work that NOAA Fisheries and things like Sea Grant have, have already done. One thing that comes in mind, there was a big um, uh, effort in Sea Grant, this is in California, and I think in Oregon too, to describe the fishing communities and what infrastructure needs that the community uh, has and what needs to be preserved and what could be added to enhance um, the sustainability and resilience of fishing communities. And that is certainly something that we recognize and intended to follow up. Again, like a broken record, it's like we have to kind of find out what might happen as far as a construction operations plan, but this is something uh, very important and definitely on our radar. And for things like just thinking of Morro Bay, um, you know, I've been around this coast for a long time and I, I know that that community suffered a decline in some of the fisheries in infrastructure when the 80s boom and ground fish went away. I mean, there was some, uh, a lot of decline in the supporting infrastructure and that didn't come back. And so this is definitely a consequence that has happened before and we wanna make sure that we can do whatever, everything we can to help preserve or even enhance the infrastructure. So thanks for that comment. And then we would agree, and, and that's part of our outreach, that we want to talk to the fishing community directly just to get a better understanding of what they want. And as far as infrastructure needs, it's not just the people that are fishing or the representatives, it's also the processors and things like that. Um, we would welcome any input and feedback that you guys might have to help us improve our process and to understand how to mitigate any potential impacts. Well, it's going to involve money for sure, so we know that much, but it also is commensurate with what, you know, what the impact is, is economically, but you have to look across the whole spectrum of investment and whatnot also, because it's not, and how long do they, you support incomes that have gone away if they do, um, but it, it's not just a one payout and done thing. So. I mean, maybe there is something you could do like to help development of markets or, you know, some support side through Sea uh, Grant or something else. But, and the same thing with NIMS. I mean, they're, I, I believe that they're short of people as they, on the West Coast anyway, to do the job that they're tasked to do now, let alone help, you know, uh, support all the wind energy that uh, development that's going on. So that's gonna be a ch challenge as well. And again, it takes resources to do that. Hopefully they're getting them, but uh, I do believe if all the money floating around to get this stuff going and just flowing around in general that, you know, it, it, if we get short changed in this as a fishing industry, it, it's, it's really pathetic. And uh, I, I think that should be part of a cost that's going to be borne by, well, ultimately, I guess, the consumer, if they're going to go this route to uh, want to get green energy. You just can't come in and wipe out, well, I guess you could, but wipe out an industry for that's here to keep our food supply secure and other things. And just, you know, it goes away and no, nobody pays any attention to it anymore. Uh, I don't think that's your intention, but I think also you must, you have to realize that it's going to take, I think, far more than what I've seen so far. And that's why I really would like to see more outreach going directly to these organizations, because I think you'll get moving a lot faster once you get that information from them. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any other hands up. We have about six more minutes before we uh, get to our 10 minute break. Um, there were some comments in the chat from the public. 
Um, I don't think we have time to go through them all and some of them were answered, but I can just read them out loud and then the BOEM folks can um, put them on their, their list and maybe we can answer them before the day is up. And so one of the questions was how well does BOEM understand the effects of subsea structures associated with the floating technology to marine habitat? And you all can capture these in the chat yourself if I read them too fast. Um, the next one is how might bottom contact gears interact with the cables connecting the projects to land? And the last question is, are there studies of disruption of fishery during the laying of the cables? And one question that was answered as far as the database for geographic locations, um, John DeVore went ahead and put in a link, thank you, John, to the FRAM data warehouse uh, to get some of that information. So um, we're, like I said, we're close to our break. Um, I'll let Bohm uh, go ahead and wrap up this ground fish uh, topic. Um, and then we'll go on break if um, everyone's ready. And Karin, I see your hand is up, please go ahead. Thanks Robin. I just wanna note that, um, you know, it seems like we have just a few minutes to wrap up ground fish today, but I wanna highlight that tomorrow's agenda has additional time both to summarize the discussion from today and then to dig into some of the questions and discussion more. And so anything that comes up between now and tomorrow is, is perfect grist for tomorrow's uh, portion of the agenda on this topic. And so I'm, I'm flagging that for people who have not been able to have a discussion uh, period uh, during today's part of the agenda. Talking to myself on mute. Thank you for the reminder, Karin. Uh, yeah, for each FMP, we'll have a little recap session um, first, first half of the day, so thank you. Okay, anything else before we uh, take a mid-afternoon break? Okay, uh, we'll... Um, adjourn for a little bit and come back at 2.30 for uh, highly migratory species. Thanks everyone.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. It's 2.30 and our next item on the agenda is highly migratory species. We have 60 minutes set aside for that. We have Kit Dahl of council staff to uh, give us an overview and uh, Frank and Donna from BOEM will um, give us some information on the data and studies and then we'll have a, a 30 minute discussion period. So um, Kit, if you're ready, I will stop screen share so that you can. Okay, there we go. Okay. You should see my slides. Am yes, I in luck? Okay, let's get yep. going. I'll try to zoom through this on our Zoom. Uh, so uh, highly mig migratory species, FMP, I'm mainly gonna talk about the fisheries. I thought I'd quickly kick off just a note on what the species are that are managed under the FMP. Essentially there's uh, five tuna species, Al North Pacific albacore and the four what are referred to as the tropical tuna species. Um, there are three shark species, two of which are um, commercially landed and uh, you know have some market value, plus uh, uh, blue shark, which uh, historically at least has been a, a sort of a bycatch species. Um, I, lately, I guess uh, there has been um, some landing of that species. And uh, there's a couple of billfish species, striped marlin and swordfish, and uh, then mahi mahi. And uh, I hope I haven't left anything out, but anyways, that gives you an idea of the kinds of species managed under the plan. So running through the um, running through the uh, fisheries, starting off with the uh, albacore fishery. This is the major fishery managed under the plan in terms of uh, participation and so on. Um, and the gear is uh, mostly troll gear. Well, there are uh, a component of the fleet that is uh, referred to as bait boat. Um, I plagiarized these somewhat lame, lame illustrations from a FAO publication you'll see throughout. Um, so troll as I think almost everybody on this uh, call knows is uh, entails uh, dragging some baited hooks through the water. Bait, bo bait boat is um, pull in line fishery. Uh, live bait is thrown into the water uh, to get the fish excited and then uh, pull in line to, to catch the fish. Uh, the fishery um, is, is fairly extensive from near shore, you know, depending on the, where, where the, uh, the albacore are and can go quite far offshore even outside the uh, e exclusive economic zone. Uh, effort is at least in the last uh, 20 years or more has tended to be concentrated off Oregon and Washington. Um, also just mentioned there is a treaty with Canada that allows uh, Canadian vessels, uh, a limited number of Canadian vessels to fish in US waters and likewise uh, US vessels are allowed to fish in the Canadian EEC. Uh, the season, uh, summer into the fall, July to October, and most of the, when most of the landings occur. Uh, and that north distribution reflected in the ports of landing, Westport, uh, Columbia River ports, so that's Iwaco and Astoria, Warrington, and Newport, Oregon. And then just some stats here, recent uh, five-year averages, uh, 490 vessels, uh, probably around Half of those are true specialists in the sense that most or all of their um, their catch is albacore, um, but then you have a big component of vessels that uh, uh, move between albacore and other fisheries, uh, salmon fisheries being a big uh, component of that because the gear is very similar. Uh, about a little bit under 10,000 tons, average annual landings, and a bit north of $30 million in ex-vessel revenue. Um, so next, and uh, really the rest of the fisheries are mainly, or I guess you could say exclusively 
uh, concentrated in Southern California and, and, and the Southern California Bight. That's the case for the drift gillnet fishery, uh, targeting swordfish and shark. Um, and uh, it used to be that it had a higher uh, component of the landings was a uh, common thresher shark, but as you can see by these stats now, uh, most of it is swordfish, 69% uh, recent average, uh, and common thresher shark a bit less than about one fifth, um, and the remaining few percents, adding those together doesn't add up to 100, uh, is a, a variety of species, marketable species. Uh, and uh, the season, um, September to January, uh, the fishery is uh, subject to numerous uh, time and area closures. Uh, the one that it, most people have heard about is the Pacific Leatherback Conservation Area uh, implemented to mitigate take of that ESA listed species. And um, it essentially closes uh, the EZ uh, from around Monterey or south of Monterey north and is in place from August 15th and November 15th, I believe. But there are other um, closures in the Southern California Bight. Uh, I couldn't uh, relate them all from memory, but um, uh, they are mainly around the Channel Islands and so on. Uh, there is a state-sponsored buyout program ongoing right now, uh, and uh, the, the eventual outcome, uh, barring uh, litigation outcomes, is would be the sunsetting at least of the state uh, limited entry permit for this fishery. Uh, there is the council uh, did uh, implement a federal permit. Uh, and uh, so that barring future council action would still um, be extant. So I guess uh, in, in some, there's maybe some ambiguity about whether the fishery will um, sunset or not because of these factors, but, but it may very well in a few years um, be gone. Uh, and uh, Again, indicating that Southern California distribution, main ports of landings, Morro Bay, and then the Santa Barbara area, LA, San, San Pedro Terminal Island, and San Diego. And then um, the stats, uh, 18 vessels, uh, 100, a little bit less than 200 tons landings, uh, 845,000 ex-vessel revenue uh, resulting on average. Um, you can see the illustration of the gear. It's just essentially a, uh, a gill net suspended in the water column. Uh, another mitigation measure does um, require that, that the, uh, the, the net be uh, uh, suspended a little bit deeper in the um, uh, water column to, to mitigate or prevent um, uh, interactions with uh, some kinds of uh, marine mammals. Um, the length of the net is limited to one mile. Okay, onward. Uh, the harpoon fishery for swordfish. Uh, again, Southern California bite. Uh, the season, pretty much it's uh, mostly in the summer. Landings peak in July. Uh, it, it relies on fairly calm, calm water, swordfish, uh, have a behavior of coming to the surface to bask, um, soak up the sun. And um, so uh, it's a matter of going out and spotting those um, swordfish and harpooning them. Um, and uh, landings are generally directed to a higher value market segment like restaurants and so on, because as you could imagine, it's a low volume fishery uh, with significant expenses. And looking at the stats, uh, 18 vessels a year uh, on average. Um, I maybe should mention all these stats. This is a, an average of the number of vessels each year. So the number of unique vessels is going to be something less than these numbers because uh, you know the same. A lot of the same vessels participate every year. Uh, 16 tons 
in landings per year, producing a little bit south of uh, 200 grand in ex vessel revenue. And then we have this, uh, can call an emerging fishery. It's a new gear type that's been developed over the last decade or so. It's uh, been, the council has been heavily engaged with this uh, fishery in terms of uh, uh, the current system of issuing exempted fishing permits to allow testing of the gear. Um, and the council developed a uh, program to authorize the gear, uh, which um, includes, uh, in, in addition to or authorizing the gear in the areas, uh, which is, uh, I probably should have mentioned in my bullet point here, the authorized areas, um, waters off, federal waters off Oregon and California. And um, so, uh, Aside from that, there is a limited entry program proposed for the Southern California Bite where the fishery to date has been concentrated. That would uh, uh, allow up to 300 limited entry permits. So that's a lot of permits, um, but they would be issued over, uh, 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 dribbled out, if you will, over uh, several years as depending on demand and so on. Um, and uh, as you can see in the il illustrations, there are two gear configurations that would be authorized. This, um, this sort of what we term the standard, which is a single vertical line. Um, this puts uh, the hook down below the thermocline uh, during the daytime targeting swordfish. Uh, that configuration is um, makes this uh, uh, low uh, interaction gear with um, other kinds of species, as you can see, flipper and uh, all those other marine mammals, sea turtles, and so on, species of concern um, that um, have are an issue for other gears that uh, hook, hook and line gears that target sword, swordfish near the surface. And then link gear is a, sort of a permutation of that intended for larger vessels and a little bit higher production that has these um, pieces of gear that space uh, hooks out on a horizontal line. Um, so, and then those uh, pieces are themselves linked together. Uh, the season, um, again, it's similar to other swordfish fisheries in terms of, um, fall and winter, although this uh, gear may be a little bit more effective during the summer months, but uh, looking at landings data, you can see it's mainly there August through uh, December, maybe into January. I uh, already mentioned that it mainly occurs in the Southern California Bight, and then some stats for this exempted fishing permit fishery that's been going on. There's on average per year, 15 vessels, uh, 77 tons of landings, pretty much all uh, swordfish, maybe 98%, something like that, swordfish with a few other um, occasional um, shortfin mako shark and some other things that are retained uh, that are marketable and a little bit less than 800,000 in ex vessel revenue per year. And then flipping back to um, authorized gears, the high seas longline fishery targeting swordfish and tuna. Uh, there's slightly different configuration of gear uh, for those um, to target those two species, but I don't need to really get into that, especially since this gear type is prohibited in the West Coast EEZ. So it's probably not that relevant in terms of offshore wind development, except for um, the fact that these vessels would be transiting the EEZ when they land their fish on the West Coast. And uh, most of the vessels permitting in this fishery are actually permitted under the uh, Western Pacific Fishery Management Council's Pelagics FEP, but uh, either seasonally land on the West Coast or there are vessels that are effectively home part ported on, on the West Coast that possess that permit. And uh, the relevance there is it, 
only with that permit can they target swordfish. Uh, in terms of landings, they're pretty well distributed around the year. Um, again, the swordfish component would be more seasonal, um, but, and by the same token, um, landings are higher in the winter months. Ports, again, all in California, San Francisco is one. Um, probably mostly those uh, uh, vessels um, targeting swordfish on the high seas and, and landing there. And then in uh, down in LA, San, San Pedro Terminal Island in San Diego. Uh, in terms of uh, the stats, there's uh, 18 vessels on average per year, about 1,300 tons in landings worth around uh, $7 million in exfil soil revenue. So in that regard, in terms of value, this is a relatively large fishery on the West Coast, but uh, in this context, maybe not very significant. Uh, finally, for the commercial fisheries, uh, the coastal persane fishery that targets uh, uh, tunas. These are the same vessels that uh, pr participate in the CPS fishery, mainly targeting sardine. They'll switch over uh, to these um, tuna species when they are available. Uh, and uh, this is really just, uh, again, in the Southern California Bayou, landings are at, uh, LA and San Diego, uh, seasonally from July to October. And uh, 11 vessels participate on average, 1500 tons of landings resulting in uh, a little bit less than $2 million in ex vessel revenue per year. Um, so just a quick summary or look back uh, in terms of participation by vessel counts across these fisheries. Here's a set of charts. Note that the vertical axis um, is not on the same scale for each of these um, uh, charts. They're, they're scaled to the range of values. So uh, you have to get used to that. Uh, I just note, you can see that the drift gill net fishery and the albacore fishery has shown some uh, significant declines, particularly the albacore fishery, a fairly uh, steady decline um, over this five-year period uh, from about 700, 800 vessels down to around 400 vessels. Uh, and that's uh, likely a result of, um, uh, well, catches have likewise declined. Uh, result, uh, of just the uh, less uh, the, the albacore being less available in, in in the Eastern Pacific and the U.S. West Coast EEZ. Um, those other fisheries, you can see, you could imagine claiming that there's a, an uptick in participation. These are all very small numbers, you know, in the 10 to 20 vessel range. So take take that. Uh, that trend with a grain of salt. Um, so that's uh, that's just an overview, a bit of, of sort of historical look back on participation. And then quickly finishing off with recreational fishing. So again, um, like the commercial fishery, Albacore is, is a coastwide recreational target, both uh, private and charter vessels. Um, and I'm guessing here a little bit, uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, you know, ranges from somewhat near shore uh, to maybe um, 30 miles offshore or something like that. I'm not super familiar um, uh, with the distribution of, of re the recreational fisheries, but, uh, you know, in terms of sort of feasibility for, for the vessel type and, and operations that probably is somewhat of a limit on the distance they would go offshore. You can see, um, so these charts are catch uh, because I would otherwise use effort angler days or whatever, but we don't have a consistent measure of effort across all three states. So um, we're unable to, to produce, um, produce those numbers uh, for all three states. So as a proxy, uh, these represent catch. 
and uh, you can see that uh, the bulk of uh, the fishery occurs in Washington and Oregon, and they between them account for a bit more than 80% of catch, and then California um, a, a bit less than one fifth of the catch. And uh, charter, uh, the charter fishery dominates in terms of catch, about four fifths of total catch. And then uh, finally, just looking in Southern California, mainly the Southern California bite again, like the other fisheries, there's a bit of a distinction between albacore and everything else. Um, again, private vessels and uh, charter vessels, um, they target a variety of species, but uh, as you can see here, it's mainly tunas. Uh, albacore, quite a long time now, it's not been very available in Southern California. So they're targeting other um, tuna species, Pacific bluefin, skipjack, yellowfin tuna. Um, and uh, also the, the vessels can fish in uh, Mexican waters um, upon obtaining a license. Some of the charter vessels um, go have these long range multi-day trips that go down quite far south in off of Baja in Mexico. And you can see in this chart um, that uh, the um, charter fishery off of Mexico accounts for a big portion of the catch. Uh, I should say that uh, the private recreational um, sector, which is the, the bottom two graphs, uh, the, the data, you know, there's some data reliable reliability issues. So there may be a an artifact artifact of underrepresentation here. Nonetheless, you can see um, it's in general somewhat smaller. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, it's in the sort of across these recent years in terms of catch somewhere in the neighborhood of ten thousand to thirty thousand fish versus the charter fishery, uh, which in US waters is uh, recording about 50,000 fish. And then in Mexico, uh, at least uh, in 2018, about three times that, there's perhaps some kind of trend going on there with um, a decline in, in uh, the catch in, in Mexican waters. So that, uh, that, that does it for me. And uh, I'll uh, turn off my screen here. Thanks, Kit. Are there any clarifying questions for Kit before we go to Bohm to uh, hear about their data and analysis? Okay, seeing no hands up, we'll go ahead and turn to, oop, I got one hand up. Go ahead, Steve, a clarifying question for Kit. Yes, Kit, thank you. Um, just wondering about swordfish in the call area off of Morro Bay. I saw that the uh, chart from a previous uh, presentation showed Morro Bay swordfish landings, uh, but did not indicate that it was um, gonna be impacted by the call area. Uh, does, does that ring true? And I asked this, you know, considering that that kind of fishery it's so you know sea surface temperature oriented that it really could move around quite a bit, and I've always understood that it that it was in that area, but but I could be wrong. So can you clarify that? Yeah, um, this is partly uh, a sort of recollection of some uh, charts in a recent um, paper uh, looking at VMS data. Uh, that was presented at the council. The fishery does tend to be concentrated in the Southern California Bayou, so south of Morro Bay. But um, there is, um, I think, fishing does occur. Certainly, swordfish are avail available further north. Uh, the the closure that Pacific Leatherback uh, Conservation Area um, has had a big impact on um, fishing effort farther north because that area is closed for uh, a time that is also a, a prime time for for swordfish fishing. So 
having said all of that, I would say, yes, there probably is some fishing effort and catch off of Morrow Bay, uh, but proportionately uh, smaller than, than what's going on in the Southern California Bight. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Kit. And we'll move on to, to Bohm for, I think it's Frank and Donna are gonna to speak to HMS. Yes, let me bring up my, my slide. I've just got one for this, so it won't take long. Yep, we got your screen. Okay, and here with the highly migratory species, you know, we I basically have this one slide. We don't show anything, we, you know, just a tiny bit there out of uh, San Francisco Bay, but this really gets to the rule of three, where we have to have three vessels in anything that we're showing. So it's um, it really limits what we can show. So in this case, we can see it uh, off the Oregon coast and. Southern Washington, and the, you know, so those are the um, the ones registered as uh, fishing for highly migratory, but also required to have VMS. And with that, I will hand it over to Donna. Okay, it's me again, and I'm going to skip all the front slides because I think we have a great deal of overlap with the same people. I don't want to put you through the earlier slides again, and I'm just going to go directly to the uh, impacts and information gaps. And if you remember correctly, there were two uh, areas called out that were uh, of particular notice for BOEM, and that is EMF, electromagnetic fields, and the artificial reef and fat effect. So actually, let me, you guys can hear me, correct? Sorry, oh, there we go. Yep, we got you. Okay, so a lot of BOEM studies already on EMF. And uh, this is the manual that describes all the sensitivity. Um, I want to call out that uh, for the large sharks and tunas, both of them, per, probably every single species in the HMS uh, fishery has some sensitivity to either electro or magnetic fields. Um, and we haven't done any future, uh, any specific research on that, but we may do so in the future. And I'm going to discuss that because that interacts with the, uh, the artificial reef or the fad effect, especially for our highly migratory species. And, and just to review, there's going to be, whether you have a wind or wave, a whole lot of infrastructure in the surface part of the water. And uh, just look on the right here, we see uh, an example of a wave energy conversion device. It looks remarkably similar as a, um, what, we, what people call a FAD, a fish aggregating device, which is uh, very common in uh, tuna fisheries around the world. I'm gonna skip, uh, skip the other reef parts because that's less important for the HMS species. But the fat effect we recognize a long time ago is potentially being important uh, for the tuna fisheries. And so we commissioned HG Harvey and Associates to do a review to look at uh, whether or not uh, hydrokinetic devices and um, uh, it's easy to transfer these results also to floating offshore wind turbines whether they might act as fads uh, for the tuna fisheries, because that could definitely affect the rates like the distribution of the species or the catch per unit effort. So H.G. Uh, Harvey determined that for albacore, there was no uh, evidence of the potential fad effect, but more information would be useful. 
Uh, but for yellowfin tuna, of which we do have some landings here uh, in the West Coast, especially in the Southern California Bay, um, there would be a moderate or maybe even a significant local impact uh, for the duration of the project, simply because fads, as I said before, are very important in, um, in the fishery. In fact, the state of Hawaii has its own program of fads that they deploy to create uh, fishing opportunities for its, um, for its citizens. So this is an area of future research for BOEM. And uh, should we go ahead with an additional study, we would probably also, and I'm getting back to the EMF part here, we'd probably also want to look on whether or not the intra-cabling array might affect the distribution of some of these large sharks in the HMS uh, fishery. And we thought about it, it hasn't been ripe yet to do the study, but if we go forth on that, we would probably want to uh, work, if they're willing, with a lot of the existing fishermen to determine whether or not uh, there might be an effect for either albacore or um, some of the other species. So this is an area that we recognize as a data gap. Um, and for this, the HDRV for albacore tuna, which tends to be more important here on the West Coast, it's their opinion that they're actually, that species may actually be rather unique and may not be attracting, attracted to those uh, that service infrastructure like the yellowfin tuna. Um, but if it did, now here are some of the Albacore trolling fleet logbook and these data are posted on the um, database and website so anyone can see, uh, can find that if they'd like. And so here are some of the, um, uh, offshore call areas off California and where the point densities of the trolling fleet exist. If there was an, a fad effect for the tuna, we would expect that it might draw species in towards and increase perhaps the catch per unit effort if there's fishing uh, capable inside of the wind farm. And so that's something that we're aware of, but we don't have a good answer yet, but we just wanna call out that that's something that we're thinking about. And then also for other species, um, and I mentioned this before, that a lot of this infrastructure is gonna create a de facto MPA uh, for species. For the drift gillnet fishery, it's certainly an MPA. There's no way that you can fish a drift gillnet inside a wind farm without entangling it on some of the infrastructure. However, should the deep set buoy gear become um, more than just an experimental fishery, and uh, used more commonly, it's certainly possible that that, that potentially could be used inside a, a wind farm. And so I've, uh, I've been keeping an eye on that fishery and uh, I've spoke with Chugi Sepulveda. Uh, he seems to be one of the major players uh, promoting that fishery uh, to keep an eye. And that's area of, of industry to industry collaboration that might be uh, fruitful once we get around to the situation where we have a construction operations plan, because there could be some design modifications to occur to enable that fishery uh, should the deep set buoy gear uh, become certified as, as a viable fishery. So I'm gonna skip some of this stuff because I've talked about it quite a lot already. And um, I do wanna talk about the highly migratory species. And I believe someone earlier said that uh, we said that swordfish didn't occur in the area. And I'm not sure if I heard that right, but I just want to correct that we actually do recognize this swordfish being an important uh, component um, off Morro Bay area. And the call area does overlap with the potential um, fishing grounds of swordfish. So, uh, and this was the example um, well, first of all, Port St. Louis doesn't have any highly migratory species. And I want to call out that, you know, um, albacore is probably, uh, I was surprised that albacore did not have a signal within the last 10 years of this area. And that, I know that that historically was very important in the Morro Bay. And that might just be a consequence of the warming sea temperatures, right? Because uh, Albacore are, uh, they do better in cooler water years rather than warmer. And it just may be a reflection of the shifting uh, sea surface temperatures that's occurring along the West Coast. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, again, this was the slide that I'd shown before. 
of uh, if we don't have very good information on the spatial distribution of, of the fishing um, activity, as Frank showed, um, the rule of three really kind of gets us in being able to display it. The fallback is that we can use species distribution modeling to identify potential fishing grounds. Uh, we can use that for current. And uh, since these species are probably very sensitive to changes associated with um, uh, ocean warming, we can use this kind of approach to predict uh, the future distribution change. It could be that instead of albacore, we might be getting more yellowfin in the future, um, landing off Morro Bay or more swordfish potential. So that's the approach we in intend to use to figure out those impacts. Um, I've kind of gone, oh yeah. And so uh, if in fact there is a fad effect and that fishing, like the trolling can occur in wood farm, we might expect that that would also have an effect for recreational uh, fishing and uh, create or change opportunities for fishing inside the wind farm. Um, and you've seen all this before and I don't have that much more to say that you haven't heard in the previous uh, um, information except you know here's where we have a lot of that uh, a lot of the data stored and um, we look forward to working with anyone who'd like to provide us with more information about how to characterize and mitigate any potential impacts to the uh, migratory species. And especially um, if we go forward with additional study, we would greatly appreciate using a collaborative approach to do this kind of fishery research with the fishing community, not just using their vessels to do the work, but you know, assisting in helping design the specific objectives and so forth. Uh, we've worked with the crab fishery to look at EMF and potential EMF impacts, and we found that they add quite a lot of value to the research uh, that we've done on that. So we would hope that that could be a potential future collaboration uh, between BOEM and the fishing industry. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Donna and Frank. Um, let's see, just a time check here. It's about seven minutes after three. So we have until uh, 3.30 to um, have an open discussion for the uh, HMS topic. Um, we'll go ahead and just ask those um, folks within the council advisory bodies or um, council members to go ahead and raise their hands and I'll take you all in order and um, hopefully we'll have a couple minutes at the end to uh, reach out to some of the other public comments there. So right now I have three hands up. I have Louis Zim, Gary Burke and Mike Conroy. We'll go ahead and start in that order. Go ahead, Louis Zim. Well, thank you very much and, and hello to you all. I've been listening to your comments with very much interest. And uh, way back when I was a albacore fisherman out of Port San Louis, and uh, that uh, that area that Donna has highlighted as an area of albacore is is, is very accurate. It's very broad. Uh, I do want to bring up the point that there was uh, I think the last time albacore was there, there was uh, some sort of buoy offshore of uh, Port San Louis and Morro Bay and the fishery was happening around that buoy. Whether it was an oceanographic effect or whether it was a, a fad is hard to say. I also will say that my experience when I was on the, uh, on the flip, the floating inst instrument platform, it aggregated big eye uh, as well. So uh, th I'm sure a lot of the other guys have uh, memory on that. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Uh, Gary Burke, go ahead. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we got you. Uh, I, I want to thank Bone for putting this on. This is one of their better presentations uh, directed towards the fisheries. And I'm in the drift net sword fishery, which it seems to me you have very little information. And the little bit you do have seems to only go back to 211. I suggest you got to go back at least 30 years. For a, lot, a number of reasons, you can, in fact, you could probably see a lot of the sets. I see a lot of the old places where we've set before, and I'm, I've set a lot up off of Morro Bay. It is a real highly productive area for swordfish and albacore. 
Albuquerque though, hasn't been around for at least 10 years. That's why you got to go back 15 or 20 because it'll, it'll, it's going to come back. It's just a matter of water and temperature. VMS has only been around and required for the boats in the last recent 10 years or whatever. So I don't think that's quite a good reason to, uh, I mean, it's not a good accurate of what's going on. The, um, uh, I think you need to, uh, uh, the observer coverage, I'll say another thing is, if you go back and look at the observer coverage over the years, the fleet kind of knows what everybody's doing. So if you see a, a boat that's fishing there, you know, you got 20% coverage, it's highly likely there's three or four around it catching swordfish in that same area. Uh, you can go back and look at, you know, fishing game logs. And unfortunately, that's put on by block numbers. A lot of guys will fish different areas and they will put a one block number when they've actually gone through four or five different areas uh, to fish. So that's, it's, you gotta, uh, another thing I'll say is like some of the other people reiterated, we, we gotta set a meeting up with the fisheries, especially the swordfish fleet. Probably February is a great date in March when they're not around, because right now they're fishing Albuquerque, a lot of them. And like you see on the list here, I think I'm the only guy fisherman in that business that's even here today. Um, uh, you know, the drift net fleet also, oh, I was going to say the landings too. A lot of times I'm out of Santa Barbara. I'll go fish the escarpment up there and, and I fished right where that closed zone is or the call areas. Uh, sometimes uh, I'll go back and land in Santa Barbara and I know guys that'll go, if they're working up towards Sur, will go up and unload on Monterey. So a lot of times what you see uh, getting unloaded, Morro Bay is uh, not not all that's being caught by any means. We also be in a drift net fishery. Uh, you know, we can drift ten or fifteen miles at night. So we got to start pulling. It takes four or five hours to pull your net, depending on complications. And so if we're drifting towards a call area, if they were to set up, we'd have to start pulling at least five miles away from when we came into that zone, so we don't tangle up. That adds another hundred square miles, you know, 20 times five of closed area to us. So there's a lot of things for us uh, that'll be impacted. And uh, I would uh, sincerely suggest we could set up something where I could get some of the uh, younger representatives. I'm kind of the older set, because uh, I'm sure they'd love to give you their information. So uh, thanks for the time. Let me speak. Yeah, this is Donna. All that information would be really useful to help inform our impact analyses, uh, as well as, you know, to the council keeping us informed about the drift gill net uh, status and, and whether that would go forward. And uh, I, I confess so that's a little bit confusing to me, but um, we will rely on the council to inform us on, on that process. But we do know that uh, that kind of information about how, like there's the footprint of the call area and then there might be the real footprint that exists to the fishery, right? If you have like a certain amount of area, additional buffer you have to put around the wind farm, that kind of information we would want to know and we'd want to feed that into our process where we are identifying all the spatial closures. And, and that information, we think we can only get by interviewing um, the specific uh, people that are on the water, right? The actual fishermen. And those kinds of data are, will be very important for us to be able to properly calculate a, an impact for those, uh, those fisheries. So thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, one other thing, I, the inshore stuff, closer to shore is really a big far shark fishery and has been in the past. So uh, anyway. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. We'll move to Mike Conroy and um, we may even have time to uh, get uh, Ken Bates comment in, <laughs> followed by Wayne Heikela. Okay, go ahead, Mike Conroy. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and our elder statesman, Gary, took many of the things that I was gonna say and uh, said them, but I fully agree with him that that five-year time frame, 2011 to 2016, really paints an incomplete picture. It encompasses the blob and the El Nino that we had. So I don't know that you're going to get much useful data and you need to go back further. 
I think Gary suggested 15 to 20 years. I think that's, uh, I, I think that's, that, that's a good start. Um, also, as Gary noted, the, the landings, uh, and I brought this up earlier, um, you know, there are often times when fish are landed further away from where they were caught. Um, you know, his, him recounting that he delivers his fish to Santa Barbara that he catches off there is a perfect example about that. Um, I also want to note that, you know, the albacore fleet, at least the, por the portion that I work with, the American Albacore Fishing Association, we reached out to Bone in, in, as early as 2018 after the call areas were announced, seeking to have those conversations. Um, I know that we would welcome that as much today as we would have back then. So, you know, we, we encourage you to reach out to the Alcor fleets myself and, and I'm sure WFOA has the same uh, perspective. Uh, with regard to HMS and impacts of EMF, um, it would seem logical that the closer proximity to those infrared cables that are not gonna be resting on the seafloor, but rather suspended between the turbines could have dif differing impacts on that. That's something that I think needs to be uh, more carefully considered. Um, with regard to identifying these turbines as fads. I fully agree with what Peter has to say in the chat about these are certainly not fads and we need to call them something else. Potentially wind turbines is a good thing to call them. Um, with regards to albacore, I, I think that while I question whether or not they would actually aggregate fish, I think that to the extent bait gathers up under these turbines, yes, albacore are gonna be remaining close proximity. Um, but given the functional and operational constraints of fishing around these turbines, it's functionally removed these fish from the fishery. So it'll make them uncatchable. I think that's something that needs to be understood. Um, extending the uh, conversation out to other tuna-like species, for example, yellowfin tuna, uh, as noted also in the, the chat, I believe, you know, fads are very helpful with regard to yellowfin tuna. And I think the same thing. There, there's no persaner that I know in Southern California, and I know all 18 of them that are on the IATC vessel register. There's not one of them that's going to deploy their seine net in and around a, a, a turbine. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Um, you know, as you noted, you know, we're not seeing albacore in the area off Morro Bay in recent years, probably because of the blob in El Nino. But if, assuming that ocean conditions are continuing to, to and, change and waters are going to warm, it's highly likely that in the not too distant future, there will be per se activities for bluefin and yellowfin that occur in those areas. And that needs to be accounted for as well. And that's I have, that's all I got on this. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, Mike, for those uh, comments. I would like to clarify a couple of things. One of them, uh, for fishing inside the wind farm for HMS species, clearly per seining is not a gear that could be used inside a wind farm. I was thinking more of the trolling fishery or potentially the deep set buoy gear. But per sains, no, that's not going to be a, uh, a possible. So I'd like to clarify that point. And then the other point about the terminology of the use of FAD, um, I think that's wonderful that you're offering to clarify the definition of that. Um, I, I would say that it's different terminologies for the fishermen versus a scientist, you know, black cod versus stable fish, Pacific hake versus Pacific whiting. Sometimes there's different terminology among sectors, and it's very useful to know the more restrictive terminology that fishermen tend to use uh, with the word of fad. Uh, I would also say that Generally, I like to use the word fad effect, which is not the same thing, meaning that it's a fish aggregating device. And that is meant to be very specific on the definition. And that is, it's not a productive feature, right? It's not like a reef that is, you know, securing solar energy and producing plants that the smaller uh, uh, copepods feed on and so forth. It's not a productive function. It is an aggregating function, which basically redistributes fish um, in their habitat and it concentrates them in a certain area, which enhances perhaps if there's appropriate access, uh, catch per unit effort, or if it's within a marine protected area, could reduce the catch per unit effort. And so when I say fat effect, I'm referring to the aggregating effect. But it's again, it's useful to know that uh, certain fishermen have a much more 
restrictive characterization of that terminology, and I'll keep that aware uh, in the future. So thank you. No, and thank you for that clarification. I think fat effect probably works. It's just in, in international management, the term fat has specific meaning and there's specific management actions that are required with that. So thanks for the clarification on that. Okay, we have two hands up and 10 more minutes. And I'm just gonna take them in order if that's okay. Uh, Ken Bates, a member of the public, I think we have time for your comment. If we keep it brief and save yes. room for Wayne right behind you, go ahead. Ken. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken Bates. My comments are directed towards the albacore fishery. I fish small scale uh, coastal pelagics. I fish anchovies and sardines from July to November in Humboldt Bay. I use Lampara roundhull gear, and a significant portion of my live bait business is for the albacore live bait fleet. I am the only bait hauler between San Francisco and the Columbia River. That's it. It's just me. Um, Generally speaking, you know, if we go ahead and we bait out a boat for a thousand thousand dollars worth of live bait on the boat and they go out and go fishing, these guys can yield between 20 and 25 tons of albacore off of that, that trip of live bait. If, if 20 boats come in and get bait from me, we're looking at about half a million dollars worth of frozen albacore. The rule of three basically dumps, throws out all of my data and the importance of my fishing efforts to the albacore fleet is completely lost. I've gone through this with uh, marine protected areas, you know, other, other different agencies where they're asking about what we're doing. And my question is, how will the agencies retrieve and list my data and the importance of it? Thank you. Uh, this is Don. I'll take a first stab at that. Uh, first of all, thanks for that information, Ken. This is exactly the kind of information that we're hoping to get from these kinds of conversations. And the rule of three, remember, that's really important when we have public facing meetings like this. Um, but we can look at the confidential data and include that in our own analyses um, and make it important and part of the decision making without actually having the public facing documents that specifically include that information. And we'll work with the fishery managers and other people to ensure that uh, these kinds of data will be used in decision making, but in such a way that doesn't um, reveal any kind of proprietary information to the public. And again, um, that's great that you made the comment. This is exactly the kind of information that we'd like to have when we gather this information, because this will help us inform our impact analysis. So we'll follow up with you at a later date to, to get more specifics. So thanks again for that. All right, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, um, Mike and uh, Gary, and to some extent, Ken covered everything <laughs> pretty well there, but uh, the biggest concern I hear from some of the guys about the, the, the wind farm layouts and whatever is the distance involved around them or transiting through them, their ability to transit through them safely. Not so much fish inside of them, but uh, if, uh, if, there, if there's a zone they have to go around and especially if there's a larger buffer zone at some point, the albacore boat only goes, you know, seven, eight, nine knots. So takes a while if you have to avoid the area to go all the way around. And I, I know guys have asked me and I said, I don't know. I don't really know. I know the uh, structures are pretty enormous. There's, I've looked at the ones up here where I live on the, on the mountaintop and I guess these ones in the ocean, they're gonna be twice as big. And I can't, I can't imagine I drive around them with the car. I can't imagine driving through there with a the boat with, uh, with more of them, but uh, that, that, that's what I heard. But uh, I, th I think you need to reach out more to the Albuquerque fleet and maybe it's our fault that we haven't been more involved. I know Mike has a lot there and Peter has, but uh, I think just keep us involved in, in some of this uh, information. And uh, I, I do agree on the fad conversation that these aren't fads, uh, specifically speaking, they're, they're structures and uh, they're like, uh, 
like something that needs to be called what they are. So I'm not, not a fish aggregating device, although I probably would do somewhat on that uh, given the circumstance. So that's all I had. So I just uh, want to keep in communication and keep the fleet informed going ahead here. Thanks. Okay, so I think Karen, Karen Brady is going to uh, wrap up HMS for us. Go ahead, Karen. <laughs> That's not why I rose. <laughs> oh, my come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually had a question, I, and maybe it's a, also a flag for tomorrow. But I feel like there's some discussion around, particularly with HMS, <clears throat> around uh, gear type and compatibility with devices uh, on the water. And so a couple of questions come up for me. Um, you know, one is, well, what types of gear truly might be compatible? And, and if there are gears that might be compatible, does that impact the spacing of wind devices, for example? And would that spacing be something, you know, how to, when would that work into the process? Uh, when would that be something that that we could uh, start to understand what those implications might be? Uh, and so that's it's kind of a rhetorical question for now. And and I'm sympathetic that that Boehm is planning for something that we don't know what it's going to look like um, in a lot of cases in terms of the project description and and project design. Um, but at least conceptually, I think that we might be able to talk a bit more about some of those issues uh, in the time we have tomorrow. And so I'm just teeing that up and seeing if there's some uh, interest in doing so. Hi, yes, this is Donna. I think that would be a great topic of discussion. Um, like, as you said, we don't have a project description of what we're analyzing. But if we hear from stakeholders on the kinds of things that they would find important, obviously spacing would be one. Maybe there are other aspects uh, that would be important. We can write those down to, um, to make note of when we have discussions with the industry to you know, discuss options and, and to be sure that they include the right kind of information in their construction, um, construction and operations plan so that we can have a thorough impact analysis. So yeah, I think that would be a great topic for tomorrow, Karen, so thanks. Okay, well, this is Robin and I'm handing the gavel back over to Kerry. He's back in the room. And so Kerry, I'll let you have your meeting back, but thank you everyone for letting me boss you around for a couple hours, it was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. I appreciate it, and I appreciate everyone's patience while I deal with doing commitments here. Um, so we are now on to, and I'm really glad that I flip-flopped those two agenda items, so thank you for that also. <laughs> um, so now we're on to coastal pelagic species. Um, I will give that overview. Again, it's um, sort of a broad brush overview of the fishery, the where, the what, and the kind of gear, the species, uh, that business. So I will share my screen here. And I think we should, you see that full screen now? Not full screen. Well, maybe I need to, oh yeah. Oh, I, okay, you saw it, but not. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, you need to find the little, the little of course, screen. It's covered by the menu bar. Here we go. There you go. How's that? Yeah. Looks good. Oh, and I have secret animations too, apparently. This should be mm -hmm. fun. <laughs> okay, um, this first slide is just an overview of everything. The species that are managed are the northern anchovy. There's two substocks, uh, the central subpopulation of northern anchovy and the northern. Um, the dividing line is roughly the Oregon, California border. Um, I've asked several people over the years and I've gotten different answers, you know, Cape Mendocino or uh, 
few other places up in Northern California, but generally speaking, the Oregon California uh, border seems to be a, a reasonable dividing line when you're uh, dividing the species. And uh, Pacific sardine, this is a Northern subpopulation. As uh, many of you know, there's a Southern subpopulation centered off of Mexico, which um, drifts up into uh, U.S. waters, uh, especially in the Southern California Bight, but sometimes farther north, and it's usually seasonal. Um, and uh, and then jack mackerel and Pacific mackerel and market squid. Um, we also have a couple of EC species, and we have a prohibited harvest species. Um, who can tell me the prohibited harvest species in the CPS FMP? Go ahead. No. <laughs> Oh, great. It's uh, krill. So several years ago, the um, council wanted to, uh, basically, it was a precursor to the um, forage fish, you know, uh, unmanaged forage fish um, ecosystem initiative. So uh, krill is listed uh, in the FMP, but um, as prohibited. The gear is uh, all persanes or some uh, variation thereof, drum sanes and lampara nets. Oops. Yeah. Uh, the fishing year for uh, mackerel and sardine is July through June. Um, and for monitored stocks, it's January uh, through December, the calendar year. The economic impacts are variable. It's um, uh, squid is by far the most valuable fishery uh, uh, or um, stock in this fishery. And so that's sort of the number one target when it's around. It's usually off California, but it also trips up to the uh, Northwest sometimes. And then sardines also, when they're abundant, it's a, it's a, it's a good value species, high volume and decent value species. Um, and then the research side, um, this just hits on a little bit of it. Obviously none of the um, you know, lab work or genetics work, and a lot of that goes on as well. Um, but uh, we depend mostly on the NOAA acoustic trawl methodology and there's some, um, um, uh, industry cooperative research um, uh, along with that, the, uh, it uses this uh, echo EK60 or EK80 echo sounder and uh, in some cases they will mount those on industry vessels. I think there's a picture of one of them later in the slideshow. Um, then there's, there's been aerial survey work for some time. Uh, there was a lot of aerial survey work done in the Northwest and in California when um, in the sort of early years of the, of the 2000s, up to maybe, you know, 2010, 2012, when sardines were super abundant before they slid back. Um, and, and now um, there's still aerial survey work. Uh, CBFW works with um, California wet fish producers and uh, private fishing vessels to, um, to support the uh, um, aerial survey work. Um, and I mentioned, uh, yeah, okay. Oh, right. And the fishery is, um, it's coastwide, especially when sardines are abundant. Anchovies are now quite abundant as well. Um, but right now, uh, the fishery is concentrated in California. They're pretty low um, harvest, you know, allowable harvest levels right now. And, um, and it's happening in Central and Southern California for the most part, at least as far as the direct. So here's some of the gear. Um, first thing, lampara, lampara nets. Um, there's day and night fishing that happens, sort of depending on where you are and what stock or what species you're targeting. Um, squid are often fished using light boats at night. And, um, and then uh, there's often nighttime uh, uh, regular, you know, fin fish, CPS fishing off of California, but um, it uh, often tends to be daytime fishing in the Northwest when the sardines are up there. So there's a few pictures uh, of gear. And here's uh, Ken Bates uh, with his Lampara net um, in Humboldt Bay. Thanks for letting me use the photo, Ken. Um, so the, the, as I said, the fishery takes place up and down the coast. There's really it's divided generally into three main areas, um, Southern California, um, uh, including Ventura and South Santa Barbara, roughly the you know, California bite, Southern California bite, and then Central California, and then the Oregon Washington fishery. And if you look at the stock assessments, that's uh, how it's divided up. 
Um, uh, I will also give credit to uh, Josh for uh, lending me a bunch of his slides and data. So I appreciate that, Josh. Um, and this is one of them. There's six main ports, um, maybe 10 to 15 processors. It varies somewhat. And, um, you know, there's uh, there's some processing capacity, or there may be some processing capacity at, you know, more than six ports, but they're sort of the primary ones. Uh, and if you ask me to name them, I'll uh, make someone else do that. Um, and the phishing occurs generally near the ports. Um, CPS are not very hardy species. There's no, like, um, you know, onboard freezer capacity. There's no motherships or anything like that. They can, um, you know, bulk freeze. Um, and so you have to, if you're going to fish for CPS, especially for anchovy, you got to be, you know, within a day or so of, of a port. Um, don't quote me on that, but, you know, you can't do these long range um, trips with CPS stock. A little bit about the research. There's the Lisa Marie, which is one of the um, cooperative research vessels uh, that cooperates with the NOAA Acoustic Trawl Survey. Um, here's uh, one of the NOAA vessels in the background. I don't know which one that is. I was trying to figure it out, but I can't tell from here. Um, might be the Shimada or the Lasker. I'm just not sure. Probably one of them. Um, and then here's the sail drone. Uh, I know some of you are familiar with the sail drone work uh, that's been done. I think. The, South, the Southwest Center has um, uh, worked on that quite a bit, and they've had some success and some mixed success. Um, but these are kind of a, a neat technology. They mount the echo sounders to these sail drones and basically program them to um, to do transects uh, up the coast, out, up, in, up, out, and um, you know, make, well, they collect data. Um, and there's a picture of some schools of uh, CPS down in the near shore. There's a picture of the CDF and W aerial survey air airplane. Um, and then over on the right is the picture of uh, the transects, um, the sampling plan for the NOAA, the NOAA acoustic trawl survey. Um, in good years, when things are going well and um, we either have permission or, you know, the the research fleet uh, has permission to go into Mexico. It can extend all the way down to, um, uh, is that Magdalena Bay, I think? Um, and um, and then all the way up to Vancouver Island. So that's the, um, you know, the BC to BC survey and uh, provides obviously good quality information uh, when you can extend all the way there. Some years it's, uh, it doesn't go into Canada or Mexico. So for economic impact, I'm not going to provide numbers here, um, but I'll just give a sort of a, a, a narrative um, explanation. Um, as I mentioned, squid is the most valuable CPS fishery. In um, good years, when they uh, catch their uh, yearly quota of 118,000, I think that's short tons, um, it can have an ex vessel value of uh, 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 pushing $80 million. And so that's a good economic impact for um, coastal ports, coastal communities. Um, yeah, my bullets here are in reverse order. Um, so I'm just going to, oops. Um, and when sardines are abundant, as I mentioned before, they're uh, quite desirable as well. And when they're abundant, they're abundant up and down the coast. Um, and there are uh, several. Uh, you know, coastal ports that are quite reliant on CPS landing. So even though, like right now, there's not a ton of CPS fishing happening, um, and um, but but these these processing plants, these ports, these coastal communities, uh, the economic benefits that they provide to these small um, communities up and down the coast is very important, um, small or large communities. And that this mentions. Uh, um, all California, but obviously you know, fish landings in you know Newport and Grace Harbor and places in between. Um, and then right now, most of the fishing is uh, for sardine is in the SoCal Bight, and it's for the live bait fishery. So that's that's pretty much all that's happening right now. There's a little bit of you know small scale, a little bit of um, you know incidental, but um, providing live sardines, which are the preferred bait 
for the sport fish fishery in central and southern California is extremely important to uh, the sport fleet. Um, and it's important to the uh, live bait haulers uh, so that they can, you know, keep in the business, keep their doors opening, and at least keep operating um, even in times of uh, lower sunken abundance. Uh, and I think I've seen some um, numbers um, with respect to the economic impact of the, uh, you know, the offshore sport fishery, you know, for tuna and uh, those, um, uh, those types of species. HMS species in the 1.2 or 1.3 billion dollar range. So, um, so a small amount of sardines being landed these days is providing the life bait that supports a very valuable industry uh, for California. And there's also some life bait fishing up north, but it's not as much. So that's it. I will take questions. Here's some cute. Uh, pictures of old sardine cans. And then I was trying to figure out what this sign means. And all I could come up with is it means always yield to squids. So if someone has other ideas. Welcome. All right, so let's open it up here. I'm going to look. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. We're not looking for hands. Uh, but I will take, uh, you know, technical or clarifying questions at this time. Do raise your hand for that, <clears throat> and then we'll turn to Boehm um, to do their part, and then we'll uh, open it up for discussion. So are there any sort of clarifying or technical questions for me? Okay, then um, let's see who's taking the lead on this one. It is, that was Frank and Donna. So, why don't you guys go ahead? I'll make sure that you can share your screen here. Yep, you should be able to. And I will uh, stop sharing. There you go. Okay, and like the last one, this will be brief. Because, you know, the fact is the, the new data set we're talking about, it's, you know, it's VMS, which is a really based around the ground fish. But th this gets a little bit to a, you know, let me make this bigger. The comment we heard earlier of, of, there's not a lot of folks fishing for these things and this rule of three really gets you. And so getting to um, both that comment from earlier and Donna's is, yes, we can still look at the, the data we have and we just can't show it. And in this case, this is showing you here, and this is my little world of a, the computer mapping world, of in any box we had, there was never more than two vessels. So once we put the rule of three to the coastal pelagics in this data set, we come up with nothing. So in this case, in the VMS, there's uh, nothing I can show you. So we'll have to look at it in other ways. And this is, again, places where we'll be looking for the um, the council to help us with, okay, here's a place where you can get some good data on this and things like that so we can build a better data set. And on that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over again to Donna. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I'm glad this is the last one because it is the fishery which we have um, uh, the least information to go on, but we are going to discuss it and, you know, ask for help going forward. Um, as Frank said, we don't have um, good data that we can present uh, publicly, but we do have other data. But one source of data that we'd like to look at our logbook data, if they're available, if they're not um, worked up in a fashion that can be presented, uh, we should just discuss, discuss further how that would be. And so the kinds of things you know we're interested in is where the fishing occurs and are there certain hotspots. We know that the EFH um, that is defined uh, in the CPS fishery is based on like HMS and um, 
uh, uh, like the HMS fishery, it's based on oceanographic parameters. And so the fish move where the water masses move. And so that's important for us in determining. And the name of the fishery, the coastal pelagic um, species, and the limitations that the dis you know the distance that a, um, a fishing vessel will capture fish in relation to port, all of that would be very useful to us. And we and hopefully we can get some cooperation from the council and the fishers uh, and the state agencies uh, for looking at the logbook data and mapping that out and to look at what potential impacts we might have um, for that. And then we're also aware of that, you know, they're, the coastal pelagic species are famous for their boom bust and how sensitive they are for um, uh, being fantastic years and down cycle years. And when we're looking at some of the data, you know, especially up north, we just barely got a signal from the Pacific sardine fishery because as you guys know, uh, there was a boom. And then what was it about 2015 when, um, that was kind of signaled the, the era when that fishery ended. But we can look at um, you know, projections using species modeling in the future. But before I talk about that, I do want to mention a couple of things uh, related to the infrastructure. And in this case, I want to talk about the squid fishery because market squid's pretty important, um, probably the number one fishery in the state of California. And the way fishing occurs, my um, understanding is that it occurs generally over the squid spawning grounds, but you know, squid occur far, farther offshore. And also they are attracted to light. So I do want to mention, even though we focus on the structure, the absolute structure as being what is attractive to fish like potentially albacore and others, and certainly ground fish, these structures will have lights at night for safety reasons. And it's unknown whether or not that would be attracting squid and concentrating squid inside the wind farm. And so we recognize we don't have any data uh, of that. It's, it would be hard right now to test that, but that's something that's on our radar and what we recognize as a potential impacting factor on that CPS. Okay, so... Um, like I said, then this is for HMS, but uh, the logbook data would actually be very, be very useful to us um, to, to look at the offshore distribution of fishing. And then I want to, we're just using Morro Bay as an example um, for CPS, there we go. The only species that kind of came up as a notable that is 1% or more of the total landing is market squid. Um, the uh, most other species are, occur farther south uh, in the Southern California Bight or the um, Pacific Sardine are farther north. And so we didn't get the big signal here in just our initial look, uh, look at the data. However, all the information that you just provided about uh, catches for the sport fish community and, and bait and so forth. All of that is really difficult to detect in the landings data or even in the logbook data. So we're going to have to rely on um, that information that the council and the stakeholders provide to help us inform our impact assessment. I think the Wet Fish Producers Association, I've known Diane Plesner Steele for decades now, and I'm not sure if she's on the, the phone here, but certainly that's on our list as far as um, a key contact for us to follow up on getting this information. And um, then I'll point this out. This is a slide I've been using to, to say that we can use the uh, species distribution modeling to at least get approximate area of the distribution of the uh, coastal pelagic species so we can um, understand potential outcomes from where our, our permitted structure, our committed, permitted activities might, might be. And that also, I'm gonna use uh, this closures, oops, cast it. This closures information. All the gear that is used for CPS fisheries um, the per and stuff, none of that would be um, 
very useful inside um, a wind farm, right? We, we expect that it'll be a 100% exclusion for the fisheries. So the important data for us to find out is how much of the coastal pelagic fishing actually occurs in the offshore environment. We don't have good data right now, but we think it would be possible if we look at the logbook data or any other sorts of data sets that you might have uh, that could provide us for, uh, with some information. And uh, that's about it. Take some questions. Okay, um, thank you, Donna. I appreciate that. There's one hand up. First, I'm going to jump in. Um, I. I, I did mention that it, the, a lot of the fishing needs to be near ports, um, but especially in times of lower abundance, like now, um, I think that most of the uh, sardine and anchovy fishing um, is all in state waters. Uh, um, I guess there's more squid fishing that happens um, in federal waters, as Donna mentioned, but, um, but I do know then when, say, sardines are in abundance that, um, they're spread quite far out. So they might be 20 or 40 miles offshore or way more. Um, yeah. But you know, 20 or 40 miles is, when, is within um, uh, a day trip for fishing or you know, an overnight trip. So anyway, I think that's obviously something that BOEM is, uh, and we all are going to have to um, struggle with uh, a little bit in characterizing you know, the, the fishing. Um, it's a little hard with CPS, because at least in um, California, uh, they're um, they're based on ten by ten mile blocks, and so you know it, the resolution isn't enough to capture whether it's within three miles of the shore or not. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. And now I will um, turn to the hands raised. Uh, Mike Okineski, you were first, and then we'll go to Greg Kryptakowski and Louis Zinn. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I what I'm going to speak to is mostly the Northwest section. I have uh, done squid down in California for a couple of years, three or four years, but um, I managed our sardine operations for Pacific Seafoods back in the day. <laughs> and what I think we have you have to do number one, I believe, is get with the states. Uh, Washington has their own permitting system. Oregon has theirs. The sardines, as I recall, in up to Point Reyes, or I don't, I can't remember where it is. The cutoff line is, but uh, is a federal managed fishery, as I recall. The squid fishery in California is a state fishery, and we do get some squid, or have been getting some squid, the last couple of years in Oregon as well. Not huge volumes, but nonetheless, they're quite valuable. So, um, the one thing about the sardines in the last cycle where they came into the Northwest and went, moved into Canada and even Alaska, they were, uh, they came at a time when the whiting fishery was more of a normal fishery. It's been a, at record high levels for quota the last four years or five years. And they helped fill a big gap in the plants. Um, and we, quite a few of those plants made major investments in the refrigeration. <clears throat> so they were important also to the Northwest. And but traditionally, uh, I know Diane quite well, we've had this discussion about California sardines, but uh, it, it is an important uh, part of their overall menu or repertoire they have for, you know, keeping their fisheries alive. And there's still quite a bit of debate about how many sardines there are in California presently, but we won't get into that. But nonetheless, I think it, it still, even though you might not be showing any data, there's data there or has been data produced by the states. Uh, Greg is certainly going to probably speak to it better than I, but uh, we have been tri-national, I think every year, uh, sardine form, and the states have presented uh, their data. And so there is a record of it, even if it went to, uh, if you, you talk to Dale Sweetnam at the uh, Southwest Center, uh, or 
uh, Josh Lindsay or Greg, they could all probably point you in the right direction to where to gather that data, but you're going to have to go back a few years. And that's all I have to say, though, is that uh, for now, they seem to be in the decline cycle. But then when they go, uh, they expand fairly rapidly. And it's been this boom bust thing for, I guess, they know it goes back to at least 400 AD. So before there was any fishing. So I'll leave it at that and uh, let uh, Greg get in there. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, Greg Krzykowski, you're next. Yeah, uh, thanks for the great presentation, Donna and Frank. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're aware that there is um, uh, logbook data out there. Um, certainly, you know, there are state require, required logbooks for CPS fishing. Um, we do have a number of uh, sardine reports uh, that are available on the web, um, and I can point you to where you can find those that do provide uh, some information as to the location of uh, uh, fishery activity um, over the years um, during the last uh, uh, cycle, at least off Oregon. Um, and I think that uh, there's also logbooks required in uh, both, I believe, for the federal fishery and also for um, you know, uh, boats that are fishing in other states, um, certainly for market squid. Um, I did see in one of your slides, Donna, I think it was the one that uh, uh, you identified market squid as being the only um, fishery that came up. It looked like that data was just for 2020 and 2021 or something um, to that effect. And uh, again, you're going to have to look at a much longer sort of time frame for CPS fisheries. And uh, um, they, they do, uh, you know, even with the logbook data, I know that there's a little bit of movement back and forth in different locations as to where the fishers are fishing. And the fishers themselves are going to be able to provide you with um, a lot of uh, insights into how things change uh, year to year. And uh, I'm sure that uh, there are some that will be very uh, um, helpful to you um, uh, in, that, uh, in that way. And I think that's all I've got for right now. Uh, yeah, this is Donna. Thanks for that. Um, the data that I showed off Morro Bay was for the most recent 10 years. I think it was from 2010 to 2019, uh, averaged into one value. And I converted the, the landing value to 20, 2021 um, uh, values, you know, accounted for inflation. But it was only 10 years, and certainly um, there's a long and important cultural history of coastal pelagics, and especially for sardine and the history along the West Coast. So, as I said, those data were, are just kind of a guideline to kind of investigate like where we are and where do we need more information. And one thing I do want to mention um, that it will be important, as I mentioned before, to communicate to the fishing industry to find out some more of the subtleties. But it's also going to be important. This is the one fishery where the discussions with the producers and the plants that process um, the you know, millions of pounds of fish that are landed or squid um, and to understand the infrastructure needs. I think of, um, of all the fisheries, probably the CPS fishery is probably most, sens most sensitive to infrastructure uh, aspects. And so that, understanding of how the producers and, and fishing um, uh, vessels, the infrastructure that they rely on and that needs to be preserved for longevity. Because even though it might be a down cycle, there might be certain kinds of in infrastructure needs that need to be preserved across you know, the dry cycles, the down cycles, so that when the fish come back, you, know, you can fire it up again without any kind of issues. Um, those data we can't, that kind of information we can't get from landing receipts or whatever. We need to have uh, interviews 
with the um, fishing community, community itself. And that's what we intend to do. So we appreciate any kind of feedback that you have. Thanks, Donna. That's, that, that explains how I saw that 2021 uh, sort of thing there. I, I didn't realize that you had uh, moved 10 years, but, but again, you know, going back a little further would be good. I did post a link to the uh, uh, Oregon sardine reports that are uh, available on our uh, webpage. Um, so you can look at those um, and uh, those data are, um, we do have those. Great, thanks a lot for giving that. Thank you, Donna, thank you, Greg. Uh, let's go to Louis Zim and then Mike Okoneski. Thank you, Kerry, and, and hello again, Donna. Uh, as you may remember, uh, I, I ran research boats at SIO for many years. And uh, Cal Coffee, of course, is one of the most important uh, uh, studies we ran. We also did the coots uh, with the Cal Coffee, where we were actually sucking up plankton and counting eggs and such like that. Um, I'm not particularly worried about your effect on the coastal one-day fishery. What I'm more uh, worried about is the effect on the surveys. Uh, we have been involved, uh, Diane, and, and many of us have been involved in trying to account for the amount of biomass that's along the coast uh, because the, uh, the surveys that are being done on the big white ships usually take into account the biomass that's offshore. If, uh, if a large area is excluded from the survey, the question of course is how would that affect the actual uh, stock assessment? So that's just something to, to keep thinking about. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks for bringing that up. That's something also on our radar um, and that we intend to work with NOAA Fisheries a lot. Um, I'm aware of you know, the new kind of acoustic surveys that um, everyone's been using to assess that and how, you know, there doesn't seem like there would be, um, there needs to be some work, but it's possible that we could, you know, minimize the interference of that. Um, we don't know right now, but that's something on our radar. And we know that one of the call areas is just touching the very northern part of the grid, the call coffee surveys. And uh, we've already received feedback on, on how to prevent any you know, interference from that long-term data set. You know, Call Coffee is one of the jewels in the world for long-term data sets. And we wouldn't want to do anything to um, really compromise that. So thank you for the feedback. Thank you. The Cal Coffee was the thing that all of us crew dreaded because it was day after day after day of punching holes in the in the in the water, but uh, I can see in the long run that it's really helped everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you, Louie and Donna. Uh, let's go to Mike Okoneski and then the other Mike, Mike Conroy. Yeah, just real quickly, uh, what Carrie said about fishing offshore <clears throat> is uh, true, at least in the Northwest. They, sometimes we're running 20, 30 miles out to sea, if not more. I think 60 is the highest I ever heard of them going offshore, but it, it does happen and, and it's not consistent, but at certain times they, that's where the fish are. And uh, as far as what you quoted there on the infrastructure importance, I think I'm gonna use that in any future testimony I do. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, anyone wanna follow up on Mike's comment? Okay, um, I think we lost a hand, but maybe not. There's a new one up though, Yvonne Derenier, go ahead. Oh, hey. I'm sorry, it was Mike Conroy. Um, oh, pardon me, go ahead, Mike. Thanks, um, just a quick question. Um, given that a number of the saners that part in Southern California that participate in the CPS fisheries also participate in the HMS fisheries. Uh, and if, and I know some of those have high seas permits, which requires them to have VMS. Um, now, granted, most of them probably utilize a long term exemption from operating that, that, that VMS. But let's say, just for the sake of argument, that there becomes a time when they fish outside 200 miles. Is there something built into the process wherein, if, if you have a, 
track line for a vessel that participates in both HMS and CPS that you would dig down deeper trying to determine which fishery was participating in at a given time? Yeah, I can answer to that. Uh, yeah, if it's going beyond 200, you know, we'll, in our data set, we'll lose it. And we'll, you know, they, they call in and declare their, you know, the declaration code before each fishing trip. So we do have some parts of our data set where we can see the same vessel that on one trip, it's fishing in one declaration code and in another trip, it's fishing in another. So we, we, we can see that, but yeah, we definitely don't get out beyond 200. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yvonne, go ahead. Um, so actually Mike's question and comment just added another question for me, but I was thinking, it sounds like you have, uh, that Boehm has sort of figured out that the Groundfish VMS database is not going to be a good source for learning things about where CPS fisheries are operating. And um, from Mike's question, I, I don't know, so um, if somebody else does, please speak up. If the highly migratory species fisheries VMS data is housed separately from the groundfish VMS data, that would be something to, to wonder about. And then I had a question for Donna about, um, I didn't understand why it was you thought that um, infrastructure changes would particularly affect the CPS fisheries versus other fisheries. Thanks. Yes, uh, perhaps I wasn't very clear. It's been a long day and I'm sort of running out of energy. So I apologize if I wasn't very clear. Uh, I was pointing out that um, for an offshore wind farm, there's gonna be a lot of marine infrastructure, which is the thing that most people focus on but I wanted to point out that there'll also be some lighting associated with the wind farm for safety reasons. We generally try to minimize that because of potential seabird effects, but there'll be lights offshore. So I'm pointing out that I know that uh, fishing vessels use lights to attract squid. I don't know if a large offshore wind farm would also function um, to attract squid into the farm if it's lighted. And that's the only thing I'm just pointing out that's a potential impact that we're aware of, but we don't have any answers just yet. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I think I was just confused. Thank you, Yvonne and Donna. Uh, anyone else? I don't see any hands up. Uh, we have almost 25 minutes left. so. I think it's safe to say that if there's members of the public who didn't get to uh, speak their piece before, um, I'd say now is an opportunity to do that. And let's see, I wanna go back to my notes. Oh, there we go. Um, is Carrie Pomeroy still on? Carrie, you're there. You had a question a long time ago, and I didn't let you ask it because we were up against the clock. Um, so if you would like to ask that now, I guess about CPS or anything from today, go ahead. Ah, uh, thanks. Um, well, thank you. This has been uh, really interesting and useful to listen to. I guess I have, uh, I think a, a, my original question was or point was, was addressed, but I'll bring up something that sort of follows on what Yvonne just said. And um, that is that, you know, thinking about the housing of different data sets and so on, but the appreciation also, and I think Mike Conroy may have mentioned this, the appreciation that while we're looking at fisheries or while you're looking at fisheries in, in this sort of fishery management plan unit by fishery management plan unit, in the course of the conversation here, fishery participants on the water and then the shoreside support system is typically involved in more than one fishery. And so um, understanding particular fishery activities is really important. The spatial dimensions of those, the footprint, um, the temporal dynamics, the whole, the whole nine yards. 
um, but also understanding how they interact with one another, both in terms of interactions on the water uh, and shore side, but also the fact that people participating in these fisheries may participate in multiple fisheries. And so the implications of the different scenarios, let's say for offshore wind, um, will play out differently for folks and their participation in those diverse fisheries altogether will be what, what is affected um, and also what affects the efforts to develop offshore wind. So I hope that made sense. Uh, as Donna just said, it's a long day, whether you're listening or speaking. But anyway, that was the one thought that I wanted to share out. Thank you. Yeah, this is Donna. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, there's this one paper, I believe the last name was Fuller, Fuller et al. And of course, our colleagues at NOAA Fisheries uh, were the primary authors of that. And they documented um, using the landing tickets and the overlap and so forth. It was a, an outstanding study and demonstrated some of the connections yeah. and how it varied among ports. And I just thought it was a fabulous paper. And so I 100% I agree. This kind of information is important. Uh, I didn't discuss it. I thought about throwing uh, an example figure into the slide, but I was only really supposed to to have 10 minutes and I frequently went over my time limit in describing the information that we had. And that is you know, generated by NOAA Fisheries and not BOEM. But how we would use that data is, so say for instance, in that paper, they use DTS for Dover Sole, Thorny Heads and Stable Fish as sort of um, a sector or uh, mediator, I think sometimes they call it. Um, if that's the most impacted, would that cause um, uh, a closely connected fishery, say, uh, you know, the, um, I don't, I can't remember it in front of me, but to say that a lot of them were closely connected to Dungeness crab, mm -hmm. would that cause more fishing activity to then um, spill over into the Dungeness crab fishery or, or whatever fishery is closely connected or, or something like that. I think maybe, um, like I said, I don't have in front of me, but I think maybe like a pink shrimp trawl might have been a closer connection, especially up in the Humboldt area. Mm -hmm. Kind of yeah. thing, those are kind of the subtle things that are, are would be important as the life cycle process continues, right? Again, yeah, and just- We're and just at the leasing stage. We don't even know what fisheries are gonna be primarily affected, but certainly that kind of spillover and you know, with more entrance into other fisheries, you know, cause fishing grounds to be congested and things like that. All be very important aspects to look at for impact analyses. Yeah, absolutely. And I bet the other the other framing of that though is understanding. And there's been some discussion of portfolio fisheries, right? And um, which is a quirky term, but but using it, you know, the 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 person who or the the operation or the group of people who are engaged in a particular mix of fisheries will experience this and be affected by this, not just in terms of the spillover on the water, but in terms of thinking about um, the social and economic impact assessment, that um, those configurations are helpful to understand in thinking about the nature of impacts, the potential for change, the potential for adaptation, et cetera. Um, so appreciating the point about the on the water spillover, also thinking about the socioeconomic impact assessment. There are things about, there's thinking about individual and cumulative impacts and there are different ways or different dimensions of thinking about cumulative impacts. So, but anyway, but thank you, I appreciate that. And, and yeah, by all means, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Carrie. And unmute. Um, Greg Kritzkowski, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Donna. I wanted to dig in a little bit more about the uh, uh, habitat modeling um, sort of aspect that you mentioned. Um, another way of getting at, uh, you know, where fisheries may occur. Um, and uh, 
just wanted to see if you could provide us with uh, some information as to where things stand with that. Uh, I did have, uh, I, I know you guys are, are working with uh, folks in Oregon, um, you know, that are working on that Aura wind map and that sort of stuff. And I know there's good coordination going on there. Um, and I did get a chance to look a little bit at some of the CPS uh, info that they are hoping to incorporate there, and, and some of that appears to be uh, modeling-based stuff that was appears to be based more on tuna and their prey, which included, you know, two of the CPS uh, species. Um, maybe, uh, can you talk a little bit more about where you guys are at with the uh, modeling stuff and uh, that and, and what direction that's going and the level of uh, documentation that's going to be available for that? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, depending on what species we're looking at, it's in various stage, stages of uh, uh, products. And, you know, BOEM is a small agency, so all this kind of work is always done in conjunction with partners. And um, NOAA, Fish NOAA Fisheries is one, but also uh, NCOOS is in a different section of NOAA. I can't remember the, um, the acronym, but they are like a team of super duper GIS modeling specialists. And they've done a lot of this work of habitat suitability modeling and also species distribution modeling. And we've relied on them quite a lot to make predictive maps. And a lot of this has been focused in the Pacific groundfish fishery, as well as identifying, you know, like for instance, where deep sea corals and other kind of benthic habitat modeling. We have a number of studies that are listed in our little brochures about some of the, uh, like the cross shelf modeling, which was very important in offshore Oregon. So I would say that we're fairly advanced in Pacific ground fish in certain areas. For coastal pelagic species, we don't have anything handy aside from, you know, maybe some things that I don't know. We have not directed, uh, that's not been the highest priority because our initial look at the data shows that we probably won't have that much impact on the CPS species, but we could be wrong. And, um, you know, if that is of great concern to the fishery, we could, you know, raise that in our priority listing. Then for the HMS species, um, we haven't done anything ourselves, but I just want to note that our, our colleagues in NOAA Fisheries have done a lot of really good work on that. And uh, they're very generous with their, their results. And, you know, they've just, I think it was 2020 or 2021, a really nice paper I believe Frawley came out with it to look at some really interesting social ecological systems about how the different size in the albacore fishing vessels, smaller versus larger vessels, adopted different strategies to uh, adjust to oceanographic conditions. And that kind of information is just really valuable in understanding um, what, what happens. And, and, and I, I don't have in front of me, but if I, my memory uh, serves me right, like the smaller albacore vessels adopted a more uh, localized, closer to, to the shore strategy where the bigger vessels went farther offshore. And those kinds of subtle and nuanced analyses will be very useful for um, our impact analysis. So there, so just to recap, Pacific groundfish, I think we're pretty far, far along. HMS, we haven't really taken the lead on that. We've relied on um, some really outstanding analyses by NOAA Fisheries. And for CPS, I would say not much at all. And we think that probably our higher priority might be to look at the logbook data first. And if we find those not to be suitable, we would, might go to that distribution modeling. But we're certainly open to any kind of feedback that you uh, might want to provide us. You know, we, we're not fixed on this. If there's a big urgency uh, to develop that further, we would like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you very much for the uh, insight into where you guys are. And I, I realize there's got to be a lot of partners here to get things done. So thank you. 
for the questions and the reply, Donna. Um, let me see if there's one more question. I know I'm sorry, you probably all want to get out of here, but um, let me see if one of these questions jumps out at me that we could easily address. Um, yeah, no, I think these warrant a little bit of discussion. So uh, I have copied all the uh, questions in, from the chat into a document that I'll share, share with the rest of the principals right after this meeting is over. Um, and, uh, you know, we some of these have been addressed, obviously, as we went along through the day. Um, but I want to make sure that these are um, we memorialized somehow and um, not lost in the shuffle. So um, we, for those that haven't already been addressed, uh, hopefully we'll get to address them tomorrow. And um, there should be a little time at the end of the day tomorrow to um, pick up any that are remaining. Um, so I guess that brings us to the end of our day. Uh, I want to thank uh, Nessie and Frank and Doug and Rick and Donna um, for all of your uh, presentations and uh, participating in the discussion. That was very good, um, really enlightening, and I hope that we all feel more educated now. Um, and uh, thanks to Kearns and West um, for taking the notes. Uh, I look forward to seeing. Thank you very much. Um, and for everyone participating, we had good attendance. We were, it wasn't quite as high as I thought it might be, but that's okay. But we did have over 100 um, at a few, time, a few points throughout the day. Uh, so that is really good. Um, so I appreciate everyone. Um, Peter, I'll get to you and well, I'll get to you now. Go ahead, Peter. You got a comment? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? I guess yeah, you can. can you. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, to just come at the last minute uh, like this, but I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. Uh, and I have done that now. Donna, uh, from Bowen, I wanted to thank you very much for all the information that you provided. Um, and I, I had a quick question, it may not be for you, um, but I thought I, I heard you say at one point that, um, and, and given the fact that there's been uh, a, a government task force with Bowen, uh, in California entities since 2017, and here we are in 2021. I, I thought you said at one point that the process uh, off the coast of Oregon seemed to be um, much better developed uh, than what has been occurring off the coast of California. And I, I wondered if you had any uh, specific suggestions for how California uh, could catch up with BOEM and, and what BOEM's doing? Thank you. Yes, this is Donna. Well, thank you very much uh, for that comment. And to everyone, there are probably a lot of people dropping off, but I, I do want to, before you go, I really appreciate everyone's time and all the feedback uh, that we receive. It's very valuable to us and uh, we definitely appreciate it. And we look forward to hopefully you guys showing up tomorrow. And then in regard to your specific question, I'm not sure if I phrased it that way uh, about more developed off Oregon. I, I think I said, and this is what I more meant to say is when we were looking at the process, California has a much lower area, I think like six percent of federal waters, that compared to uh, Oregon. So um, there was a lot more constraint and options for us to look at off California. And my other colleagues at Bone may want to provide feedback, but since you called out my name, I wanted to be clear. And so in Oregon, I think that there is uh, much more latitude. You know, you wouldn't have only six percent of waters offshore Oregon being technically feasible. It's probably a lot higher percentage. I don't have that offhand right now. And that would be more Frank's area to calculate that. And so the process that's ongoing with Oregon now, which my 
colleague Whitney is leading up and doing a fantastic job. Uh, that's where we would really want to get a lot more information on the spatial distribution of fishing, because if there is more latitude, more technical capability of waters, then, you know, fishing is one very important aspect, but it's not the only aspect that we use in determining lease areas. Now's the time for your data uh, contributions so that they can be considered when we're looking at deciding, you know, what would be appropriate call areas. And I think that's what I meant to say. Um, uh, if I misspoke, I apologize. But if you have further questions or if anyone else from BOEM would like to chime in, um, please feel free to do so. Um, this is Nessie and I'll chime in a little bit. Um, I think we're also in a different process for both. Um, you know, in, in California, we, you know, and, and of course we also would want to learn um, as we go forward, right? Um, we did California first, we're learning. And so we're hoping that we're, we're doing better in Oregon. Um, California uh, has, you know, we're in a call area stage. So we've already identified, um, so it's a different process that uh, we're focused more on particular areas already in, in California. Um, and together with the state, um, we have actually, I mean, we've reached out to folks in the past. We don't have the same level of information back then. We didn't have VMS, now we have VMS. And so future outreach will, we'll, you know, we'll share where we are. And, and I think I'm, I'm hoping you guys, you can see that, that you know, even the data we shared today are all still preliminary. Um, we're sharing as we have them. We're, we've identified some of the gaps that, you know, we have. Um, we are acknowledging that. And, you know, I think going forward, um, you know, we're just hoping to continue the conversation so that we can try and fill in those gaps um, uh, going forward, both in, in California and in Oregon. Uh, the state is very much engaged in um, wanting to engage also with the fishing industry. You know, in all of this, we try to, to have our just so we don't um, wear you guys all out, you know, try to have coordinated efforts with the state um, when we do reach out to the fishing groups. Um, and so, you know, we try to do that in California. Um, we're, we're attempting to do that in Oregon as well um, going forward. So I just wanted to um, say that. Thanks, Nessie. Hey, on the topic, Mike, I see your hand up. Um, Nessie, I want to ask you, uh, you shared a lot of uh, great informative slides today, and uh, the whole team did. Um, and you mentioned that those are drafts. So I'm assuming that those are not intended for publication or duplication or distribution. I, am I correct in saying that? And then, yeah, uh, I think we're, we're okay with sharing the slides that we shared today. Um, I mean, the, you know, obviously the analysis continues, right, going forward. But I think what we shared today were, um, you know, we're open to sharing the slides. I think. Oh, great. Well, I know there's a lot of interest. I heard one or two comments about it, and then I got several chats and emails. So there is interest. So uh, let's talk, um, you know, tomorrow or next week and um, see if, uh, see how you would like to, you know, how we can help you make those available. Sounds good. Great. Okay, Mike Okaneski. Frequent flyer miles are racking up today, Mike. <laughs> yeah, there's one. Uh, lingering question that uh, I didn't address earlier, but uh, we're all in a pretty good mood here as we wind down. I guess I'll go back to it. The term decision makers would be involved in this, I guess, if there is a dispute or a conflict of information or viewpoints, I guess, about fishing grounds versus something that was suitable for the offshore wind energy project or projects. And I'm just wondering, that's a pretty nebulous term. Uh, can you inform me any more or ask any more about uh, who these decision makers are, what level they sit at, and which agency they sit in? I mean, ultimately, um, the you know the department, the um, Department of Interior is the bureau. It, the bureau belongs in the Department of Interior. I think that um, decisions we make going forward, obviously, you know, go up uh, the um, the decision chain. So ultimately, you know, the Secretary of Interior makes the final decision. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is just really to inform that decision going forward um, in terms of you know what what we know, um, the analysis that. Um, you know, we we will at that time when the decisions forthcoming have done, 
um, but ultimately the Secretary of Interior. Okay, and is there a prescribed process as to what that might look like as far as decision making? I mean, you'd follow any uh, outline or guidelines or just whatever the Department of Interior operates by normally, or how does that work? Would there be influence from, say, the Department of Commerce if they had a differing viewpoint? Or I mean, that work? yeah, the process is, I mean, the decision making and the whole process is open, right? So, I mean, we'll take comments, not only from the public, but from agencies as well. Um, you know, the regulations require that we balance several factors in making any decision related to leasing. Um, there's no, I think Rick mentioned that there's no real bright line, like quantitatively to, to, to direct that decision process. But I think it's, it's a matter of um, balancing all the factors um, that affect, you know, that would interact with offshore wind um, before any decisions are, are made. And I, I don't know if others have more to say than I. Well, if you do run across some <laughs> something in a textbook somewhere, or, uh, rules or how they run their business, or I guess not business, but the government, I'd be more than real curious to know more about it. And I'm sure a lot of other people would be too. Because when you say decision makers, it just somebody behind the door of it, you know. So identifying that process and the uh, I, I think it's valuable for us anyway. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I think in the regulations, there's some guidance. Um, so we'll um, try to link that up somehow uh, in terms of the various factors that are taken into consideration. I, yeah, this is Rick. I, I'm not sure I can add a lot to the, to the answer um, that Nessie gave. I, I will offer that in the, during the NEPA process, the documents that are produced, especially with the EIS, always lay out the decision-making process and describe in some way who is making the decision and what they are faced with, you know, the, the, the sort of choices they're faced with and what they're looking at. Um, so the, the reason it's hard to answer right now is because we're, so we're not there yet, but uh, we have examples. I don't mean to make you do the research on your own. We could dig this up for you and send it out. I, I don't know if, we could do that in, but um, like the Vineyard Wind EIS, which I mentioned earlier, would have a small section on that to kind of explain in these cases about offshore wind, how, how decisions are made on leasing and then on construction operations approval. Um, maybe, I don't know, it's getting later today and I, I'm thinking maybe we can revisit this question tomorrow and I'll think about a way to, to get some information out to that, you. That, sound, that sounds really good and that's really we appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Know, well, that takes us right up to the wire. So um, actually past the wire. Um, so we will wrap this up. Uh, I want to mention a couple of things that uh, I, think I started mentioning before. Um, we will um, we'll, uh, take the raw notes that Kearns and West developed and uh, in our own notes that we've been taking. Uh, and look at the chats and all that stuff. And we'll have uh, brief summaries for each of these sections of today's agenda for each FMC. Um, those will be, again, pretty short overview. And then, um, you know, we've had, a, we've had a chance to do a bit of a deep dive today. Um, I, I, I would encourage everybody who's on here, you know, to the extent that you can, to uh, be prepared to um, discuss, you know, specific data sets or um, concerns you have uh, deeper than you know what we've already um, addressed today um, and um, okay. oh and what I see happening here I think I mentioned this earlier is that the, the Council of Marine Planning Committee will um, take this uh, the results of this meeting up at their first meeting which will be sometime late August or early September uh, and then they will likely write up their own report and uh, recommendations for the council to consider. So that's kind of the near term um, target for where we're going with this. Um, I, 
Yeah, I don't think you need to necessarily come, you know, with actual, you know, data sets, but um, but to the extent that you can, um, you know, your brain works overnight and that you identify some new information um, that would be helpful to put on Bones radar screen, that would be helpful too. Um, and then just the last thing, we didn't really need any um, prompt questions today, but um, you know, we did have a few in our back pocket if, uh, you know, if we needed to. And um, so just think, continue thinking about you know, where are the data gaps? Where can we get the data sets? Um, do these data accurately re represent your fishery? Uh, and if not, then what is, you know, where does Bone go to get uh, a more accurate representation? And that might be a longer data set or, you know, a different or a better data set or a state data set or data portal. Um, so, you know, be prepared to have those conversations. Think about, you know, in, in each of your fisheries, what, what would a least impact scenario look like? Um, you know, BOEM will be moving forward with this planning process with the call areas and then wind energy areas. And then at some point, um, they'll take um, applications for wind farms. And so, you know, I think now and over the next you know, couple of years um, is the time when you all can, um, bring to the table and bring to BOEM um, information that is representative of your, constitu your constituents, um, especially those who are on advisory bodies uh, for the council. You know, you, you all occupy a slot. You're representing harvesters or, um, um, you know, or processors um, or at-large industry or the conservation um, seat in several of these advisory subcommittees. So um, think about those things. Think about those questions. Um, come tomorrow, uh, refreshed, and um, and I think that's it. Nessie, I will let you uh, finish up if you have anything to say here. Can't hear you. No, I, I, I think everyone's really tired. I just want to thank everyone for staying on. Um, Thank you, Carrie and, and uh, Robin for facilitating. And I'm just excited about taking the conversation to the next level and we'll continue tomorrow. In the meantime, I hope everyone has a, a good evening um, and uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow or talk to everyone tomorrow. Great, thank you, Nessie. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. Great, thanks. Um, for everyone who's still there, I will be uh, staying on the line here <clears throat> to talk about some logistics uh, with a couple of our principals. So if you're not one of the principals, I invite you to um, leave the meeting and I can help you with that if you want. Hey, Rick, I'll bet a lot of these people are not near their uh, computer right now. So how about we have a phone call? I don't know who all wants to chat about logistics for tomorrow from the phone side. Is it just you or, well, you had something else you want to talk about too. Is Rick still here? Ah, Rick wanted me to stay on. Okay, well, Rick, email me um, or Nessie or whoever. Uh, maybe we can pick this up later. Uh, now I'll just end the meeting. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.